Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Indigenous Knowledge Institute's uh, inaugural World Indigenous Peoples Day Symposium. My name's Associate Professor Michael Sean Fletcher. I'm a Wiradjuri man, and I'm talking to you today from the lands of the Boonwurrung. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the land on which I'm standing, Boonwurrung land, and pay respects to Boonwurrung elders, past, present, and all of the Aboriginal elders on all the communities where you may be today. Um, today is a special day on the calendar for Indigenous peoples across the world. And it's, as I've mentioned, it's Indigenous, it's the International Day of, of World Indigenous Peoples, a day first announced in 1994 by the United Nations, designed to raise awareness and protection of the rights of the world's Indigenous peoples and recognise the achievements and contributions that Indigenous people make to improve world issues such as social equity and environmental uh, problems. There are nearly 500 million Indigenous people living across 90 countries across the world, making up just over 6% of the global population. And our people, Indigenous peoples, are the holders of a vast diversity of unique cultures, traditions, languages and knowledge systems that have been developed in place over very long periods of time and in many cases hold the key to a successful future in those places. But today we aim to celebrate and acknowledge a range of different uh, people, an amazing lineup really, and we're very, very lucky and I feel very fortunate and humbled to be able to introduce all of the people that are talking today across a range of topics from social change to indigeneity in Indonesia, language and learning in Timor, cultural astronomy, law, art, agriculture, music, and a range of other topics, really reflecting the diversity of Indigenous worldviews and the diversity of our knowledge systems. I have a few housekeeping things to go through. We will aim to have breaks at 10.30 till 11, and then an hour from 12.30 till 1.30, and then another half an hour break from 3 till 3.30. I'll try and keep, I'll run a tight ship with speakers so that we have time for questions, and I'll be alerting speakers of the time remaining in their session so that we hopefully have enough time for feedback and questions. Please, if you have any questions, uh, put them in the Q&A section of the webinar and they'll be put through to me and I can put them through to the various speakers. I'd also like to acknowledge, even though we haven't been able to, to do so in person today, unfortunately, this is the world we live in right now, the Melbourne Connect, who really very... Um, <clears throat> graciously donated their location for us today to hold the in-person event. And we also had a series of uh, caterers and other things that we um, were unable to, to have because of the COVID pandemic. As I said, we have an amazing lineup of, of people. We are expecting, I hope, to have Uncle Ringo Terrick to give us a welcome to country. Uncle Ringo has been held up uh, and we will see whether in the interests of time we can uh, wait for Ringo to come and, and give us a, a proper welcome. Otherwise, I, I truly hope that my acknowledgement uh, at least goes part the way of, of recognising that we're all today on the unceded lands of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander or wherever you are in the world, Indigenous peoples. Um, the Indigenous Knowledge Institute was a, has been going for about a year now. It is an institute across faculty, institute at the University of Melbourne, designed to promote and develop research into Indigenous knowledge uh, and also develop curriculum, education curriculum in Indigenous knowledges. We are headed by Professor Aaron Korn, uh, an ethnomusicologist and a person with, a, with deep connections to a number of Indigenous groups across Australia. 
uh, myself as Director of Research uh, Capability, and we're ably supported by Brittany Carter and Kirsten Clark, who uh, I must thank very deeply for organising this amazing event today. So I'm going to introduce our first speakers for today. Um, and we may be able to um, go back to Ringo at a later time when he arrives, Uncle Ringo from the Wurundjeri, who we were hoping would give us a welcome to country. So our first speakers today, I'm really honoured to present Auntie Geraldine Atkinson and Marcus Stewart from the First Peoples Assembly. The First Peoples Assembly of Victoria is a voice for Aboriginal communities across the state, representing them in the next phase of the treaty process. So we're really uh, honoured to have both Auntie Geraldine and Marcus presenting us to us today. Auntie Geraldine Atkinson is a proud Bannerang and Wiradjuri woman from, and, and the co-chair of the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria. For over 40 years, Geraldine has been instrumental in driving government policy and reform in Aboriginal education. From starting in the field as an Aboriginal teacher's aide in 1976, Geraldine moved forward to become the president of the Victoria's, Victorian Aboriginal Education Association, a role she has held since 1999. Marcus Stewart is a Nira Ilumbulluk man of the Tunarung Nation and co-chair of the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria with Auntie Geraldine. Prior to being elected to the Assembly, Marcus was the Chief Executive Officer for the Federation of Victorian Traditional Owners Corporations, a position to which he was appointed in 2017. During his time at the Federation, he oversaw that peak body's call to state government to pledge $63.4 million towards a treaty readiness package, which would ensure traditional owner groups could prepare for treaty engagement and negotiation processes. So I'll hand over to Auntie Geraldine and Marcus, if I can, acknowledging that we are running at the moment 10 minutes behind schedule. So I'll um, call, get you guys will receive a message when you're just before your 30 minutes is up, and then we'll hopefully have some time for questions. So thank you very much, guys. Okay, thank you very much, um, Ross, for the introduction. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners on the country where I'm uh, situated today, which is Bangarang country in northeast Victoria. I want to acknowledge uh, the people of the Kulin Nations, uh, the traditional owners of uh, the lands of the University of Melbourne campuses. I want to pay my respects to their elders and all elders throughout Victoria whose generations of struggle and sacrifice has brought us to the point we are today. I believe it's critically important to remember all those hard-won battles and the activism of those leaders that have come before me. Activism is a constant exercise of energy. It ensures that our collective rights of self-determination are respected, and it's important that we realise the baton is being passed on from generation to generation. We need to, to be both ready to seize opportunities that come our way and be willing to push and sustain momentum to create our own opportunities. I just want to say to you guys, thanks very much uh, from the, to the Indigenous Knowledge Institute for inviting Marcus and myself today uh, to be with you at the University of Melbourne, although we are connected through technology. And I too want to acknowledge the esteemed the esteemed uh, panels of people that you are speaking, you have speaking today. As you said, Ross, this day is today, the International Day of the World's Indigenous People. It's, it's, it's that, a day to celebrate, a day to stand strong, a day to smile, and a day to reflect. It's a day to be proud of our communities and our hard work and to share our pride with others. As you said, my name is Geraldine Atkinson and I am an Aboriginal woman, a very proud Aboriginal woman. As you said, I'm, I'm at Bangarang and Wiradjuri and I work, along, work alongside Marcus Stewart, um, 
who is also co-chair of First Peoples Assembly of Victoria. You mentioned my education in background. Uh, it's been a lifelong journey. Uh, it was about driving education reforms in Aboriginal education in Victoria. I've worked for over more than 40 years in that space. So you're up from early childhood to secondary to TAFE to university. So there's not a part of the education system in this state that I haven't dipped my toe into and worked towards reforming. I am the proud president of the Victorian National Education Association Incorporated. I am passionate about making sure that education systems and classrooms respect culture, strength and differences that do, that do not misinterpret, misinterpret our young Aboriginal children, but instead lift them up to be full and to the whole potential, embodying the, ensuring they embody their culture, that they can speak their own languages and that they can certainly pursue their own dreams. I know there are many Indigenous people here today in this room and there are even more watching through this live stream event. My culture, as is many around the world, we like to provide a cultural introduction. I think it helps to centre and place people within our communities. I said earlier, my ancestors come from the northeast part of what is now Victoria, so close to the banks of the Murray River and even closer to the Goulburn River, where it is often hot and where sometimes it can be very dry. My people, the Bangarang people, are called the people of the tall trees. My parents instilled in me the importance of going out and getting an education. My parents wanted this for me and all of their 14 children to have that education without losing their Aboriginal identity. Today, I think about the lives of my, my, my siblings and the trajectories that we each have. For me, treaty, just like education, is an absolutely fundamental structural reform that is critical for our people to exit the poverty cycle and flourish. My culture is beautiful and a rich one that I want all Victorians to be able to share in because what we have to acknowledge is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture is the oldest living culture in the world. I want to just say that treaty isn't just a destination, it's a journey that we walk on together. And I sincerely hope that you all will walk with us. Thanks, um, thanks, Arnie, Jerry. Um, I'd like to extend, um, I guess, my uh, privilege to be here as well and say it's great to be here. Uh, as Arnie, Jerry said, and I was introduced earlier, my name is Marcus Stewart. I'm a Nira Ilum Bullock man of the Tanarung Nation, Central Victoria. And as is our custom, I too want to acknowledge country and in our language uh, say, Wawagi Woiwarang, Luik Nagoganga Guk, Wawagi Yamagu, Parabuk Nungojin. I acknowledge their country, their ancestors, their elders, and their people. Um, my people are from the low and high grounds of central Victoria uh, or low and high country. Uh, we've travelled throughout the Alpine regions uh, through the summer. Uh, people would be familiar with Mount Buller and Mount Stirling, often known for skiing and snowboarding, uh, known to us as ceremonial grounds, but also places we travelled in summer um, to uh, feed on the bogon moth, which is part of our, our stories and also a high source of uh, protein. Um, Annie Jerry mentioned the Goulburn, uh, Goulburn uh, River, which is known to us as the Wildering, uh, our lifeblood. Um, and part of our significant river systems that connected uh, our country through Seymour to Wildon to Mansfield up into uh, our high country. So um, I just want to say that all traditional owner groups are different, uh, but we're all connected by common threads, historical, uh, country, obligations to land, families, our kinship systems, um, and that's something that's important that we pass on to our children. I was privileged enough to be elected um, to the reserve seat by my nation, the Tanarong Land and Waters Council, uh, back, it feels like a lifetime ago before, uh, before COVID. Uh, and I'm also wanted to um, be elected co-chair of the First Peoples Assembly. My passion is Aboriginal decision-making being solely in Aboriginal hands, the true sense of self-determination and Aboriginal issues being dealt by Aboriginal people uh, and traditional owners are best place to be making those decisions. And that's why we see the treaty journey is critical here in Victoria. 
but I'll hand back to you, Ani Jerry. Thank you, Marcus. As you heard, Marcus and I talked, and, but we wanted to start our speech talking about the principles and values at stake. So the recognition of rights and embarking on a greater journey of understanding and listening. And this is about justice. It's about understanding the true history of what happened in this place, what happened in the Northwest and what happened in the Northeast where I live and where my family live. What happened through the Umarella Wars and what happened in the places, in the place that today most people call Melbourne. What we're about is inclusion, not exclusion, respect, not racism, better education, deeper conversations, celebrations of difference and a space and of power for Aboriginal people to, to, to determine their own decisions, their own structures, their own futures and their own successes. And many of these principles are captured in the international human rights law, in restorative justice theory. The principles can also be expressed in other terms too. You say, when we say sorry, sorry means you don't do it again. Give back what is yours, tell the truth. The first Peoples of Assembly of Victoria, which I'm co-chair, was established as a self-determining body. Through our structure, which is made up of traditional owners of country in Victoria, we are dedicated to the process of genuine self-determination. We are negotiating with the state government of Victoria, a framework for, for and a pathway to treaties in this state. It's a monumental responsibility, of course, but something to which we will give everything we've got because justice is long overdue. Today, on the International Day of World Indigenous People, we want to share with you what Aboriginal communities in Victoria are working towards. We want to invite your interest and your input into the process with us. It's truly the biggest opportunity here and now that our communities have ever seen for generations. So the First Peoples of Assembly of Victoria, it's a representative political organisation and we represent Aboriginal people on the journey to treaties. The, currently, the Assembly is currently made up of 31 members that are all traditional owners who were chosen by their communities. We are totally independent from government election, uh, from, from government. Um, we were democratically, we were in a democratically elected voice and the model for the Assembly reflects the world that we live in today. It's strong, it's practical, most importantly, it doesn't leave anyone behind. The 31 members of our assembly were chosen through an historic vote. So uh, in 2019, around about September and October, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged 16 years and over turned out to vote for who they wanted to represent them in this phase of the treaty process. Those elections were, were conducted across five regions to make sure that the results were not, not dominated by the large metropolitan population. And our electoral is exactly that, it's ours. It was made by Aboriginal people for Aboriginal people. And the members with whom Marcus and I work are diverse like the communities that they represent and are accountable to. They bring their lived experiences. There are young women and there are young men on this assembly working hard and balancing a lot. And of course, there are elders on the assembly as well. The assembly is the first body of its kind in Australia and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, with strong connections to the Victorian community can get a stay. The assembly is working hard to lay groundwork for treaties. That's our mandate. We must work in partnership with the state government of Victoria to do this. And we're progressing the three key streams of work. So one is a statewide treaty, solidifying political power through that process. The other is nation building and local rights through localised traditional owner treaties and economic self-determination. Now, each of these streams requires a constant process of engaging with Aboriginal and traditional owner communities and refining think and thinking our positions. Treaty negotiations themselves are still a few years off. So the Assembly in its current form is not, a nego is not, negotiating, not negotiating treaties. 
but we are responsible for laying important foundations for the treaty process and listening to the community's priorities, aspirations, and ensuring that we get their feedback. The Assembly is community's voice in, the treaty, in this treaty process, and we are accountable to community. With community's guidance, the Assembly has agreed to pursue a statewide treaty for statewide matters and traditional owner treaties for local matters. Today, in broad terms, we are pleased to share with you the broad outline of what this could potentially look like. So with the statewide treaty, so working with government, Aboriginal communities could seek to establish a statewide representative body, a future form of the Assembly perhaps, which exercises self-determination in a range of ways, but also with force of the law. The future body could make decisions, including in administering laws on issues that impact our lives and the lives of our, of our community, provide advice and input into the Victorian Parliament and the Victorian public sector, hold reserve seats in Parliament perhaps, a statewide treaty could cover the whole state. We have more work to do to engage with communities about what this is going to look like. But we know that this is the umbrella agreement that would cement Aboriginal self-governance for Aboriginal peoples of Victoria. On the other hand, what we've decided is about having traditional owner treaties, which will provide opportunities for traditional owners in, on their countries to exercise self-determination in the ways that they want. They could cover rights in areas such as land, waters, language, the local education, cultural heritage management, localised assets and wealth. Each traditional owner group needs flexibility to pursue their own priorities. Each traditional owner group needs to be able to consider and move through the treaty process at their own pace. I'll hand over to you, Marcus. No, thanks, no. Aunt Jerry. Um, I guess in Olympic terms, I've got the last leg of the relay and I'm up against Ross timing me out. So I'll try and get through this uh, as quick as I can. Um, so to design um, these processes that Art and I have been talking about, we need the input and collective thinking of our people, but we also need the guidance and cultural stewardship of our elders. And so through a lot of the work from the from assembly members, the assembly has recently established an interim elders voice that will embed self-determination of our elders in our pathway towards treaty. Elders are our wisdom holders, they're our guidance, and they understand what our communities need. Elders have also fought for justice for our peoples for decades. And the elders voice of the assembly ensures this activism, this resilience, will continue to guide us. The Elders Voice will provide meaningful, meaningful cultural advice and oversight guidance to the Assembly Chamber. It will uphold the four pillars, respect, connectedness, knowledge base, and law, law of our land and our country. We are currently consulting with Elders across the state, obviously made harder by this uh, pandemic, of course. And, and obviously we're needing to protect our elders because they're vulnerable to such this virus, um, COVID-19. On how our elders themselves want, I guess our consultations are based on what our elders themselves want the elders voice to look like and to operate and how they want meetings and membership criteria designed. The consultation with elders is being driven by two formidable elders in their own right, the co-chairs of the interim elders voice working on this are Arnie Charmaine Clark and Uncle Andrew Gardner. The Elders Voice to assist the Assembly in its work is a critical piece to the puzzle the community have always emphasised and we've heard throughout this treaty journey. And as we make great strides to guarantee the role of our Elders in our work, we also make great strides, strides in, the area, uh, in other areas as well. In 2020, which also feels like a lifetime ago, the Assembly called for a truth and justice process. What was made clear to us from our community that without truth, there can't be treaty. This built on generations of activism from community that have demanded a truth telling process. The Assembly negotiated with the state government on this. We co-authored the terms of reference, we held the pen, 
never done before in this country. We secured a landmark commitment in this country to form the mandate of the truth-telling process that were based on consultations. Our community were the ones who drove this and designed this. And now we have um, a term to reference or a, a letters painted uh, or a mandate is often referred to internationally um, with the strength of, or the powers I should say, of a Royal Commission. This is an absolute testament to the collective strength of the Assembly, our members and our communities that they represent. A tangible demonstration that unity is power and as a democratically elected voice, what you can achieve. Our ancestors never saw treaties. Instead, they saw repeated systemic attacks to destroy our culture, practices, language, law, and displace our communities. They, and I guess I'm proud, um, again, of the collective work and leadership of the Assembly. As our members, we've got to face the difficult conversations. We've got to bring everything we hear together, together and make tough decisions on how we move forward. Uh, we've got to implement the wishes of our community and make sure we deliver uh, on what they've entrusted us and elected us to deliver. And what we've heard repeatedly, as I said earlier, that without truth, there can't be treaty. So part of our negotiation with government in this process, we secured that process, the now your Justice Commission, um, it's being established to reveal documents of human rights violations that have occurred here in Victoria. There have been roughly 40 truth and justice processes around the world, um, most famous being the one held in South Africa, um, but none of them have the breadth and depth of what we've seen here in Victoria. We currently have the eyes of the world on us because how wide this goes, 233 years of colonisation, how we can look at the past, but also the present is actually something significant. The truth telling process through the Europe Justice Commission will tell the truth. It will make the visible or the invisible, I should say, visible and tell the true side of history, which is critical for this country and critical for this state in particular. Our peoples have continued to suffer intergenerational trauma, you know, through child, uh, children being removed, the rates are well, we've got the highest rates here in Victoria, which um, which are absolutely unacceptable. We know the criminal justice system, the overrepresentation, the overpolicing, the cycles of offending, uh, and also the victims of crime. I think um, access to wealth, education, and meaningful work is too often uh, blocked for our people. Governments and corporations have profited off natural resources, off our country, the poverty, the poverty cycle that has been easily cemented by this. But for the last 253 years of colonisation, dispossession and oppression, this now needs to change. This truth-telling process will clearly link together these abuses, abuses of colonisation, the systemic racism and discrimination, intergenerational trauma, the contemporary experiences, one thing I want to be very clear on, though, is education is this country's best pathway to employment. Then our community's overrepresentation in the child protection is fast becoming the biggest pathway into the justice system, and something needs to be done. It's failed us for 230 years. It'll fail us today. It's going to fail us tomorrow. That's why treaty is critical with truth telling to reform these systems and structures that continually disproportionately impact our people. The Europe Justice Commission now has been formally established two months ago. Europe means truth in the language of the Wamba Wamba Nation, which is spoken in the northwest of Victoria. The Europe Justice Commission is an independent, is independent both of the state government and the assembly. The commission is expected to make detailed recommendations to change laws, policy, education for the better. Um, but also play a pivotal role in informing treaties into the future. The Europe Justice Commission will also run parallel to the treaty process um, and it will deliver an interim report uh, around July next year, roughly, that will run for three years. 
but it's also that opportunity, as I said earlier, to tell the true side of history. Now, before I speak about how everyone can help and particularly for our community members who are tuning in, how you can get involved, I do wanna shine a spotlight on the human rights law and the critical role it's playing in our communities. We are all here today at an event, of course, because on this day in 1982, the First Nations Working Group on Indigenous Populations met as part of a subcommittee on the promotion and protection of human rights. Years later, in 2017, after much dedication by Indigenous communities around the globe, the United Nations, uh, the United, the, sorry, the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted as a resolution of the United Nations General Assembly. Now our rights are internal, they're undeniable, they're unforgettable. But because of human rights law doctrine and fundamental documents like the United Nations declarations uh, on Indigenous people or the UNDRIP as we know it, they're enshrined. And this document is used by Indigenous community members to talk about everything from the Enbridge Line 3 pipeline in um, uh, and, and, and the risk of actually mucking this up um, in the Shave country and waters, uh, to the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, to the custodianship and protections of the Birrung Ma here in Victoria, in Melbourne in particular. Communities in Rotorua, um, for example, working hard to legislate the principles of the UNDRIP at the moment. Indigenous communities all, uh, are unique and spread across this world. We know that um, in, at one point in time before colonization took its major effect across the world that indigenous communities across this world cared for more than 70 percent of the biodiversity of this world there are priorities often remarkably similar um, but our self-government which is what's critical under the under is a key tool for us the constant use and interaction with and reference to the under by our communities makes it a living document that we collectively uphold and we'll expect others, including governments and public service, to respect and uphold this also. After all, the Assembly is easily understood as Article 3 and 4 of the UNDRIP put into practice. Now, how do we go about creating a treaty is incredibly important. The assembly is a function of self-determination and political representation. The assembly is working hard to lay the groundwork and frameworks for treaty making in the state of Victoria. This is our mandate. This is what our community have elected and entrusted us to do. But we need to work in partnership with the state government in order to do this. We will negotiate with them and we understand fundamentally that they're a state government. They're at point in time that we need to unpack 233 years of what has been built against us. We call on all people living in Victoria, here and now, people who are not Indigenous, people who are from Victoria and were born here, people who, are, who, um, who call Victoria now or newly call Victoria now their home, and Indigenous people and Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people who are from other nations around this country that live in Victoria. Treaty isn't about guilt, it isn't about division. Like Arne said, this is about creating a pathway together and leaving a better and fairer place for those who are yet to come. Please take up responsibility to inform yourselves about the treaty process. Every Victorian has a responsibility to get involved, walk with us and stand with us on this journey because it'll create a better Victoria for all of us. Whether you live on Aboriginal land or whether you're a traditional owner from country in this great state. There have been many broken promises by governments, politicians, corporations over the year. We can give you countless examples over history. We look at the Jukun Gorge uh, in Western Australia, which was nothing short of heartbreaking and appalling. But we don't need to look too far to see the destruction of cultural heritage that happens here in Victoria, it happens. And we need new systems that honour collective decision making and the unique, indeniable position of traditional owner rights holders who hold inherent rights over country. Treaty will not happen unless people make it happen. Both traditional owners, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Victoria, but our non-Indigenous allies as well. 
for all Aboriginal community members watching at home, I have one single first step you can do to help us get there. Enroll to vote with the First Peoples Assembly at our next elections. With every single voice and every single vote, we get stronger. Unity is power. That's your opportunity to shape this journey to create a better Victoria. The stronger we are, no one can deny what we and how we underpin inherent rights of traditional owners and we create a better system for Aboriginal people. You can go to the Assembly's website at firstpeoplesvic.org and click on the red enrol button to get involved and make sure you stay up to date with everything that's happening here in the treaty process. That's my call out to community members who are tuned in listening here today. For everyone else, back the representative body of First Nations people in this state. We will need your support more and more into the future as we make treaty a reality and self-government as it should be a fact of life for our people. Please sign up and receive our newsletter and follow the work online or on our social medias, whether it be Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. I just want to say um, today's symposium program or in closing, the symposium program is going to be amazing. Reading the areas of specialisation of all the presenters and panellists shows the breadth and depth of Indigenous talent, creativity, discipline, determination, but, but excellent, more importantly, excellence. Too often Indigenous people are sold short, well not today. Everyone can amplify those voices. Everyone can defer to traditional owners on traditional owner business. You have a choice to do that. Everyone can pause and think about who needs and who warrants that platform. Everyone can inform themselves about the treaty process because it is the way we will bring more and more Australians together with genuine connections, increased awareness, underpinning of rights, Treaty will be how this can be delivered. I wish you a very happy and proud International Day of World's Indigenous People. It's been an absolute privilege to, uh, to, to talk today. Uh, it's been, again, um, our pleasure, I should say, um, you know, to, to keynote with Arnie Jerry and talk to you about the treaty process. And hopefully you now know more about Aboriginal peoples across Victoria, traditional owners across Victoria and our nations, shaping their own future with their own processes. Thank you again for the opportunity and stay deadly. Thanks so much, guys. It's uh, really powerful and, you know, it's just so moving to have this uh, initiative, A, being driven and then being driven by by people like yourselves, it's um, it's a really groundbreaking initiative. So I'm really impressed, and it, it it sort of reminds me. Well, it speaks straight to the theme of this year's uh, uh, Indigenous uh, International Indigenous World Peoples World Day. Well, got it wrong, but it's leaving no one behind. Indigenous peoples and the call for a new social contract. And I guess really, what is being attempted here and what has actually been done is the making of a of the social contract that was denied us in the beginning so i think um this is just really amazing and great stuff that we're we're seeing going on here i've got a couple of questions the first from the q a is on the treaty and agreement and what is understood in relation to the commonwealth we know that it's a victorian initiative if you guys one of you or both of you could talk to um, potential plans to expand this nationwide um, as it's an important stage of, of reparation and justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and I guess the next step you would hope would be a nationwide um, push. Do you, have you had any thoughts on, on the timing of that or the reality of that or, or the capacity of that? Yeah, I'm happy to uh, jump in unless you want to, um, aren't. I think um, no, you go, Marcus. it comes down to one fundamental uh, issue that we face of why there is no progress on this federally and while, while nothing's being done and we just look at the treatment of the Uluru Statement of how that become a political football, it's the lack of leadership at a federal level. It's the denial of um, inherent rights of traditional owners across this nation. 
So once we see a leadership or stronger leadership from this federal government um, and basically um, a lack of pretending of our rights existing, then we can reach peace at a national level. But until then, we're not going to wait for the lack of leadership at a federal level. We're going to go ahead and we're going to deliver what our ancestors and elders have long cried for and called for, what they marched the streets for, and that's to deliver a better future for our people and improve the lives of Aboriginal people. That's why we're going about treaty in Victoria. Yeah, great. That's, uh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a convert. <laughs> um, the other thought I had, the, the other real strength to this process is, is how democratic it is and how you listen to communities' voices and especially the elders. I just wondered your comment, and I, I am totally on board, that if we have one of, if not the leading um, treaty process globally. Can you talk us through some of the other models that you've looked at and some strengths and weaknesses that have sort of guided uh, your thinking and the way that you've gone about the treaty process in Victoria? Yes. We've looked at, oh, okay. Well, well what we did was we, we, did, we did, did our research and looked at, you know, sort of internationally what was occurring in, in, within the treaty process. Uh, we actually visited um, Canada uh, and the United States, we had, we've had uh, meetings we have, because we haven't been able to travel with uh, international guests, particularly those from the, the, the Sami um, and from New Zealand. Uh, so we've looked at all of all of uh, all the models that, 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 that how they've created treaties within their country. And what we what we decided is that you know we've been fortunate because we were we're able to probably look at what you know sort of what was the best and what was the worst of their processes and what we want to, what we want to achieve is looking at how we can ensure that we have a treaty process here in Victoria that's going to be democratic that it's going to be inclusive and that it's going to ensure that Victorian Aboriginal people, traditional owners, as well as those that lived here all their lives from other nations, have uh, better outcomes in all of those things that Marcus outlined earlier. Yeah, great. Thank you. There's another question on the, on the Q&A. Can you just unpack a little bit more? You may mention Marcus, so it doesn't matter, Marcus or Annie Geraldine about the link to the, well, the relevant to the Uluru Statement of the Heart. Um, how interlinked are they? Have you drawn on, on that statement? Um, what is, is there any relationship between the way that you're going about your business and, and that really important statement? I think, um, obviously, the processes are, are separate in what we're doing. And, um, you know, you look at, I think the parallels you draw from the Uluru process and the Victorian process is the extensive and significant amount of consultation that was done in building these processes. They were built from our grassroots community up. They're a representation and reflected of our grassroots, grassroots activism and advocacy in delivering these processes. And as I said earlier, it's a shame um, of how the federal government and parliament dealt with the uh, Uluru Statement a, a few years back. Uh, it's a simple ask, uh, voice, treaty, truth. We're doing a little bit different down here. Uh, we're doing it uh, as, as way of sequence. We're doing it how our community have, have asked and uh, how they've wanted it to be done. Um, but uh, me personally, big believer and strong believer in the Uluru process. And I hope to see that one day um, that commitment be fulfilled. Yeah, great. Thanks, thanks, Marcus. Um, and I think we're almost out of questions in the Q and A. One, one that I was thinking of, and I hadn't quite understood, but it's a logical link now between the um, the Truth Commission and the First Peoples Assembly. Are you able to sort of talk me through? I'm interested in when that became an idea. How receptive? 
the government was to undertaking this. And I know that you've mentioned that they've taken it on with Augusto, or at least it seems so, and are doing a thorough job now. But how did that um, go down? And what was how did the evolution of the the treaty, pro the truth telling process, uh, go ahead? It was something that it was a resolution that came from one of our early chamber meetings, which was all about uh, First Peoples Assembly members getting together. And uh, the resolution was that we would ask for a truth, a, a truth telling process here. Uh, so we then went to uh, obviously the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, who that we were, were uh, communicating with in relation to the treaty process. And she took it to cabinet. They agreed. It was, and that's and that's the process that happened. So it was it was um, it, it was agreed to readily, uh, and we're very proud of the fact that we were able to negotiate that process with the state government, and that they have taken on board and wanted and and had an agreement that it will that it will be established. Now we now have the commission. It's in place, and it's going to go out and do. Uh, consultations with our community in relation to truth and process here in Victoria. Two things are uh, that's worth emphasising because that sort of shapes up everything that's heard. But you ask government's commitment, and while I won't comment on that because I've got my own opinion, of governments. Um, but what I will say is that there's been a there's been a precedent set on how royal commissions now are set up for the first time in history. We co-authored the mandate, we held the pen for what now has the powers of a royal commission. Uh, first time in history that's been done by an active representative group. And two, one of the concerns we had is that the commissioners of the Europe Justice Commission becoming a captain's call or picking, you know, people picking their mates or politicians picking their mates. So this government's credit, they not only empowered us or well i guess they didn't empower us because we're pretty loud about how we wanted to go about designing these terms of reference um, but work with us on designing or co-authoring these terms of reference we set up an independent selection panel to select these commissioners it was open to everyone internationally to apply to become a commissioner for the europe, europe justice commission they could apply and it'd go through a shortlisting process and then a public process. So we would offer public comments on those who had applied and then we'd make an independent selection panel, would make a recommendation to the Premier, um, then with a recommendation onto the Governor of who those commissioners would be under the letters patent. So we elected two representatives to sit on the selection panel. It was a membership of four. We had the International Centre for Transitional Justice who could appoint one person and also the state government could appoint one person. So never been done before. And if you look at international best practice, this is right up there. Yeah, so it's the first step towards any of this is, is talking about the truth and acknowledging what's happened in the past and, and acknowledging how we can move forward. You need that foundation of truth and honesty to move forward in any of, of these uh, endeavours. So it's a really amazing. Uh, we've got time to squeeze in one last question. And before I, I thank you for, you know, really honest and frank and powerful um, narrative of how the, the Assembly and the, the Truth Telling Commission has unfolded and, and progressed. So you did mention that there's a state framework and then local negotiations depending uh, on individual groups. Be able to just unpack in what ways local Indigenous protocols shape the structures of the assembly. And I, I assume it's, it's that two tier thing you say, but if you just unpack that a little for us, um, that would be great. Hey, Marcus. Are you on me too? Thanks for that. Um, so I'm assuming your question is around how um, communities inform the, uh, the process and treaty, but then maybe how negotiations will roll out. Um, so I'll tackle them and if I'm, if I'm wrong, let me, and if that's not your question, let me know. But ultimately, um, we're a democratically elected body. Anything we bring to our chamber when we reside has to be informed through consultations. It's our constitutional requirement that everything that comes to a vote via a resolution has to be consulted on 
by the people who have elected us and entrusted us on this journey. There's no shortcuts around that. Um, and then what we have decided and through extensive consultation is there has to be a hybrid model, a statewide treaty and, um, and traditional owner treaties through uh, nation-based um, negotiations or however traditional owner groups decide to politically represent and organise themselves. Uh, that's some of the work we still have to go through. Um, so ultimately, we're responsible for setting up the framework, which are the ground rules and how that will all sort of take shape. Also, uh, a self-determination fund, which is how it'll be funded independently. So the politics are taken out of it from a government point of view and the budget processes as well. We don't want to be subject, we don't want this process to be subject to budget bids or political goodwill. It should be part of our state's furniture and just roll and happen. So we hope through traditional owner treaties, we see sovereign to sovereign negotiations in the not too distant future. And also we have to look at what a statewide treaty will look like. We're not responsible for negotiating that, but we have to look at how that'll take shape and how that'll be delivered in the aspiration and shape and design of what our community want. Because it's their voice, it's their process, and they will be the ones who basically inform us what this looks like. Uh, that was the, the right spot on the answer and interpreting the question, Marcus. Thank you. So I'd like to thank you both uh, so much for your keynote and the thoughtful uh, answering of the questions. I couldn't have thought of a better way to, to start off today's symposium, given the theme, but also given the remarkable uh, process that you guys are, are leading for us in the, in the community. So thank you very much. It's a shame we're not face-to-face because -face I imagine A, you would, would get a really rousing uh, round of applause. And also um, we all miss the opportunity to, to engage with you in person and, and pick your brains. But thank you very, very much for presenting and for taking us on this journey. I really appreciate it. And on behalf of everyone watching. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we'll move on to the next item in the schedule. And as I said, we're running 10 minutes behind, whether we make that up or not um, seem, remains to be seen. But the next session, I'm really excited. And you know, another one that I lament that we're not face to face, but it's gonna be great anyway, um, are the Jury Jury Dancers, or Wurundjeri All Female Dance Group. Um, I'd like to introduce Stacey Piper from Jury Jury, um, who will take over and I'll let you um, experience this wonderful, wonderful thing. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, just to, my daughter's on her Zoom in the background. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Ben. We're competing here. The ladle, oh, I'll wait till she's finished. Sorry. When I be seven... My turn, Fenner. Beladun Yang Wangat, Nadanik Stacey, Wadanjeri Willamik, Wadanjeri Balakut, Mundanai Murup Galada Binadang, Mundanai Liwik Bulok Nugalik, Mundanai Willambik, Ba Bubups, Ba Kidup. So, in our language, the language of the Wurundjeri people, the Boy Wurrung language, I just acknowledge country, I acknowledge my Liwik, my ancestors. I acknowledge the Binadang, the Yarra River, which flows very nearby where I am and hopefully where many of you are. Um, I acknowledged the Willambic, which is our home country, a place we all call home. I acknowledged the Bububs, my daughter and the children, our future, all your children. And I acknowledge the Kidup, our friends, um, the audience who are watching today. I acknowledge all of you and where you're tuning in from. Uh, thank you for uh, holding space for the Jiri Jiris this morning. So um, I'm joined with my beautiful cousin, Mandy Nicholson, and she's uh, going to introduce the Woman Jikan Yarga, which is our Welcome to Country Dance. I was like, why did I not get out of you? There we go. So I'll pass on to Mandy. <laughs> What I'm gonna do, 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 what
Hi guys, um, I was just about to come on and my computer just started screaming and squealing at me and turned off. So hopefully you can hear me and see me. So yeah, you can hear and see me. Oh, phew, <laughs> so I was running around trying to fix it. Um, but what we're here to demonstrate through that dance that you just saw, um, I can see a little Fenner, hello Fenner, <laughs> um, is a little bit of Wadanjeti culture, and that is all about being strong, staunch, and proud of who we are and, and proud to represent our culture. So it's something that we as Wadanjeti women have had to grasp a hold of because we didn't have any reference to women's dancing uh, or to women's paint up, women's dance attire, but we did have one connection to some ceremony. So. What we've had to do uh, for the Jitty Jitty Dance Group is start from scratch. So what I decided to do, someone said to me years ago, you know, you can't wait around for people to teach you because they may not be able, they may not have that knowledge to give you. So just go out and do it and, and grab a hold of whatever you can grab and, and hit the ground running basically. So that's what I had to do in terms of women's dance. So I started off with um, working in a language center, uh, VACL for six years. And I started there in 2011. And it really enabled me to grasp onto grammar, um, structure of words and how to pronounce the words and put them together so we could put them into songs. And in 2013, we started Jitty Jitty Dance Group. So Jitty Jitty means the willy wagtail. And it started off with um, a few songs that probably, um, I don't know, may not be heard ever again <laughs> on purpose, but the ones that we've worked on have really grown in strength and power and the women and the girls that dance have really, uh, they've been a force to reckon with because they have gained so much strength and pride and cultural confidence from being part of this dance group. And what we do is not just dance, we have reclaimed or reawakened uh, a murum turukuruk ceremony, so a coming of age ceremony. And this is something that we started um, with Ani Dai and Ani Irene back in 2015. And we've put maybe, maybe about 25 or 30, even higher now, um, young girls through this ceremony and they get a dance belt. So that's why when you see us dance, some have emu feather skirts and some have possum skin belts. So the ones that have the possum skin belts are the ones that have gone through ceremony. I went through that ceremony in 2015 and the aunties went through together as well. So I was lucky enough to go through that ceremony with my daughters. So it's never too late. And it's something that we will continue to do every year. We didn't get to do it last year. And last year, was it last year before COVID? Uh, that was the biggest one that we've ever had. So really, really lucky that we can um, reclaim that ceremony. So we haven't got much time to go. So what we thought we would do is to teach one of our dancers. And this dance is called our Bik Nyarga or our country dance. And it's about the different layers of country. So I'll quickly Michael, just- Michael, you need to put me on the screen when she says we're ready to go. Yep. Uh, so what we do in this dance is we honour Wadangeri country. Then we honour Bunjil, the creator, the wedge tail eagle that lives up in the stars. Then we honour Wudawudubik, the sky country, where Bundrel and Wa, the wedgetail eagle, and the raven watch us and guide us. Then we've got the Murnmutbik, which is the wind country. And that actually is something that carries our voice, carries our language, carries the smoke from our welcoming fires. Then we've got the Bik Dewey, which is the on country. Oh no, we missed one. We've got water country. Water country is Banyubik, and that's what we use to keep us alive and, and everything around us alive, but also forms part of all the different layers. Then we've got Bik Dewey, the on country, where we dance and where we walk and do our ceremonies and live our cultural life and our day-to-day -day life. Then we've got the Bik Dewey, uh, Bik Ut, 
is the below country or inside country where we dig the ground to get our ochre. So we've only got about six minutes to go. So what maybe we'll do is, because it does take quite a bit of time to teach this dance. Well, if people are watching, I'll try to go that little bit slower and just try to copy Stacey because it's a really graceful dance and it's really slow moving. And maybe we'll do it that way so we can get the whole song in there. And those at home uh, can have a go at following Stacey. So are we ready to go? Ready to go, Mandy, Stacey? Mandy, just to chime in, you've actually got, uh, we're running 10 late, so you've got about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So don't stress. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, that's better. Then I can explain each part. So what I'll do, Stacey, I know you're on mute, is I'll do um, the verse, then um, explain what the dance moves are, and then another verse and explain um, what the dance moves you just did, if that's all right. So um, the first one being uh, about Waranjeri country. Waranjeri, Waranjeri, al narapu, 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 narapu. So, so sorry, Stacey. So, so that's basically the um, first part of that song. And that you can see Stacy with the gum leaves. So our symbolic gesture of cleansing is using those gum leaves. So what the words in that part of the song were, um, we are on, it's Wurundjeri country. So Narapo is the country of the Wurundjeri people. So that's that first bit. Um, for the second bit, um, the words, are, as you'll notice through the song, it's two lines that are the same. One's a bit slower and the, the second one's a bit faster. but as the dance goes on, the moves change. So you'll see Stace was just about to do the double leaves for the second faster bit of that first, I suppose you call it verse. <laughs> um, so the, I won't stop again. I'll just do the both lines for the second bit, Stace, so you can, we can just do the whole bit and then we'll go on to the next one and the next one. So the next one, I'll count you in, Stace, because it's tricky to break it up. So I'll go one, two, three. So this one is um, Darangolk. So this is where Bunjil lives up in the stars. One, two, three. So for that one, you can see Stacy started on the ground to represent Bundral creating from the earth. And then oh, I've lose, I lose track of where we are when we break up the dance, but there's a part where Stacy's doing this and that is basically honoring Bundrel up in the stars. Yeah. And there's another move where she's tying up her belts, her belt. And that represents, it's also thanking Bundrel for giving us our culture and um, women's culture, uh, especially with our dance belts. So then the next verse is about this guy and this is where Bunjil and Wa watch us from up in the stars and you watch Bunjil up on the thermals. And that's where they are in their physical form. So their spiritual form is up in the stars. Their physical form is in the sky. One, two, three. Woro 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 be kunjuang, kunjuang, nga 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 nga. So you can see there, Stacey's doing the moves for flying, um, for bundle, for wa, but we're not doing the full on bundle as such. We're doing one little flick of our arms to represent him because that's a male um, entity. So um, we don't do the bundle dance as such. So that's, um, yeah, watching from the sky. Then the next one is Murnmutvik or the wind country. And this is where our voice is very powerful. And there's, we're swinging our leaves around in the wind, but we're also swinging them around our mouth. And when I'm singing wolo, wolo means voice. So this is all about, about being loud and proud. One, two, three. Mon mot, mon mot be kuronga, wuronga, molo, 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 molo. Mon mot, mon mot be kuronga, wuronga, molo, 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 molo. 
So I think that's probably one of my favorite moves where we're swinging the leaves around our mouth because it's a really strong symbol that is a universal symbol, I suppose, is the power of our voice. So the next one is uh, Banyabik, water country. And this is something that, like I said earlier, keeps us alive. It forms most, you know, 70% of our body, but it's also in the different layers. So we've got it in the ground, we've got it in rivers, we've got it in oceans, we've got it in even like tiny little things like mist and dew, and also up in the, the um, stars as water vapor. So it's something that without water, nothing can survive. So this is probably one of the most important layers. So Banyabik, water country. <clears throat> one, two, three. Ban, Banyabik, Yumarala, Yumarala, Morenda, 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 Morenda. Ban, Banyabik, Yumarala, Yumarala, Morenda, 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 Morenda. So for these moves, you can see Stacy is gathering the water and it's all about, um, you know, moving forward into the future, looking after your family. She's gathering it and then she's taking it home to her family. And that's what the arms like that represent. So it's it's about, yeah, sharing water with your, not just yourself being selfish, taking it all for yourself, but it's about sharing with others. So the next layer is the big Dewey or the on country. <laughs> oh, Sorry, that was my time. <laughs> so the next one is the Big Dewey, the on country. So on country is where we live our double life. We've got our cultural life. We've got our day-to-day -day life where we have to go to work and pay our bills. And it's a really, it's a tight balancing act because something, especially now with COVID happening, it's something that even like, it's hard being away from work, colleagues and stuff, Personally, I love lockdown, not for all the bad reasons, but because I can get a lot of things done. I can do a lot of research. I'm doing my thesis and all that at the moment. But even when you're in lockdown, you feel isolated. So, and that I'm talking about your general day-to-day -day life, you feel isolated. But also our cultural side is very isolated because we can't go out on country. We can't gather. We can't go and camp out on country. We can't do our ceremonies. So we missed last year, for example. So We've got a double whammy there where we're isolated in both directions. So it's something that we really, if we can plan ahead, like, you know, we had a lot of things planned and, and everything, but, you know, snap lockdowns happen, you know, instantly. So we really need to stay connected with mob. Uh, and if this is the only way that we can do it in the meantime, then that's what we have to do because we need to uh, take care of our, our mental health as well as, um, health and well-being of those around us and our elders as well so this one's the big dewey the on country and like i said this is something where we are living those lives but also dancing and doing our ceremonies when we can when when covid's gone um which i hope will be soon yeah so one two three Big, big to me, yam balak, yam balak, narga, 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 narga. Big, big to me, yam balak, yam balak, narga, 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 narga. So this one is about uh, giving back to Mother Earth as well. So the move that Stacey's doing like that is from our heart and our soul, our chest. We're giving back to country. And it's also about being uh, proud and loud and proud, always loud and proud. That's my catchphrase, I reckon, uh, about dancing on country. So the word for dance is ngarta. So walking and dancing on country. So that one is. So the last layer is the below country. And this is the big ut. So this is where we dig into the ground to get ochre. And the words to this verse are about digging into the ground but also getting the three different types of ochre. We've got white, brown, and red. So noro noro is red, um, yarambel is white, and um, I'll have to sing it to remember the other one. <laughs> so uh, this is about decorating our bodies for dance and ceremony because ochre is really important for that, but it's also really important for trade. And it's also important for mourning as well. So when people pass away, we put white ochre right across our forehead to honour them 
when they've passed. So we wear that like on um, sorry day or survival day and things like that. So ochre is something that's probably maybe not highlighted enough. Uh, and it's something that we observe the animals as well. Like when we paint up, we put white stripes on our face to represent the, the little willy wagtail. So the last verse of this one is the big ut or the below country. One, two, three. Yay! So that was a pretty long song. And to tell you the truth, that was a pretty short version of explaining it as well because uh, when we create these songs, what I have to do is start from scratch. I'll write a little bit of English of the words that I would love to put in it. And the trickiest part, I don't know if I do it backwards, but I do, I, I sort of flip and change all the time. Sometimes I have the beat ready to go and I really love the beat and then I make the song to the beat. But then other times I'll have the song and I have to add the beat to it. So the first way of doing it's a little bit easier because the way that I was I taught myself was uh, translating nursery rhymes because I'd already had a set beat and then making the language fit it. So that really helped me uh, be able to, yeah, swap and change things around and manipulate uh, uh, tunes and beat. One problem I do have is melody, like, some of my songs sound really similar and a lot of the words are really similar. So sometimes I will just have a mental block and go, oh, what was that word there? Or what was that word there? Because they are very similar and they have a lot of similar word endings and things like that. So I suppose the whole message behind all of that is even with nothing, you can start something and you can create something very powerful. And every single one of the young girls and babies and women that dance with Jitty Jitty, the Willy Wagtail dance group, all have this different essence about them or different look about them when they're dancing. They get in the zone. I get in the zone. I'm, I'm a master of putting that poker face on if I do mess up because the dancers are up there knowing that they've been through a very ancient ceremony and they're representing their ancestors and they're performing and talking and singing for them because they can't speak anymore. So we speak for them, they speak through us. And when we sing in language and stacy has been really stepping up and I love singing with Stace because she self-taught as well. She, lis she listened, she observed, and we just sing together because it's something that you can't learn from reading it. You have to listen over and over and over. And she's probably sick of me, Mandy's voice in the ears. <laughs> um, because. Even Kaya, my daughter, who's not here, she snuck off to Darwin just before lockdown, so lucky her. She just copied what she was listening to. The little girls that sing, they just copy. And it's something that if they don't feel like dancing that day, they'll get up and they'll sing in language. And when all three of the older ones, they're 10 now, when they first started, they were seven, eight years old, and they, they sang to one microphone. One wanted to be louder than the other, like little birds. And... You can't stop them because that's what it's all about, teaching those young ones to be proud and being loud. There's a proud and loud again. But they're at school and they're able to come back at those kids that don't understand and that will give them racial abuse, but they don't really realise when they're really little, the kids, that it, it is racially abusing another child. But they've got comebacks to all of those different things that will come their way. They'll be bombarded for the, their whole life like I was but now they know how to come back at it with knowledge, with cultural confidence, because that's something that I didn't have when I was younger. I was a very, very shy young girl that would not stand up to anyone. Um, but culture has given, given me that strength and given me that foundation. And all of those around me, I can see it emanating. Like Kaya, my daughter, keeps saying the ripple effect. And it's so true. It just takes one person to, to get up and move and start something and people will follow. There will be people that are on the outer that like won't support or um, yeah, whatever, or not interested. They may come around later in the future, but the ones, the core bunch 
of people will always be together surging forward for the better good of our community and our children. And the three staunch beautiful women, me, <laughs> of course, Stacy and Sue Ann, us three, look out. You can't stop us. We've got all these beautiful different knowledge sets and we have beautiful daughters and it's something that I, I can't explain too well in words because it's, it's brought us so much closer, this, this stuff that we do. And we're related by blood, but it isn't just that. We're related by culture. That culture will keep us going forever. And again, I say, if you feel discouraged, there's no one around, there's no elders teaching, there's nothing happening, find a book with your language in it. Read it, even though you don't know how to read the linguistic terminology, it might be over your head. Start with two words, one word, and you're reclaiming, you're, you're reawakening your language. So I'm not sure about time. I don't know if Stace, you wanted to add something as well, or I was just having a look at the time, and I think we've done really well. <laughs> we had, yeah, yeah. So we had the extra time, so um, we've hit that mark. But I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us, and thank you, Mandy, for sharing so generously as always. And um, yeah, um, you know, the kids teach it to the kids if you start waking up your language or when you start waking up your language. I mean, Fenna, my daughter, and even the younger girls in the jury group, they sing in the shower. <laughs> you can hear them singing in the bath. And, yeah, it's just it's really sweet. So, and Mandy, I think I remember you put your language list on the back of the Jilawa door. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah so no excuse no but um, I, there's little things you can do just to keep it going and yeah I just was really proud to be here with Mandy and sharing with you all today yeah same, same. <laughs> thank you so much guys uh yeah talk about proud like uh you know my heart is swelling with pride after seeing that and, and especially after the the previous talk on treaty it's just really amazing and I'm almost speechless. So thank you very much. That was uh, beautiful and enriching and thanks for sharing so openly, Mandy. Uh, you'll be uh, hopefully seeing my kids soon. I'll get them along to, to learn <laughs> learn off you guys. And uh, I'd just like to plug that um, the Jury Jury Dancers are also going to feature in a film uh, called Baban Durang uh, that'll feature in Emu Sky Exhibition, which is celebrating Aboriginal knowledge on country, which will be opening very soon in the old quad at the University of Melbourne. And there's some things already being set up for there if you're on campus once we're released. Go wander past there and have a look at the setup for Emu Sky, which will be released shortly. So thanks again. And we're pretty tight on 10 minutes behind schedule, but that's fine. We'll make it up through the day, I hope, or 10 minutes doesn't put, it out, put us out too long. So we'll break for morning tea. And we'll reconvene at 11.10, if we can, please. I want to give everyone ample chance to have a bit of a break because it's a long day rather than shorten the break. So please, we'll reconvene at 11.10 um, and we'll hear from Professor Elizabeth McKinley. So thank you so much for, for Auntie Geraldine, Marcus, Mandy and Stacey. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone to the Indigenous Knowledge Institute's inaugural International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples Symposium, in which the theme this year is Leaving No One Behind, Indigenous Peoples and the Call for a New Social Contract. So far, we've already heard from the co-chairs of the Victoria's First Peoples Assembly <clears throat> on the treaty process and truth-telling commission and about how knowledge transfer and knowledge production and knowledge communication is performed through the Jury Jury Dancers or Wurundjeri Dance Group. So I'm really honoured to present our next speaker, uh, Professor Elizabeth McKinley. Liz is both Executive Director of the Atlantic Fellows for Social Equity and Professor of Indigenous Education at the University of Melbourne. She's known for her work exploring the interaction between science, education and Indigenous culture. She has a strong research and publication record in the field of <clears throat> sociology of education, Indigenous science education, Indigenous curriculum 
and the capacity of mainstream education systems to meet the complex challenges of, inform of transforming educational outcomes for Indigenous and other students from un underserved communities. I'm proud, uh, really honoured to, to hand over to you, Liz, for your talk on Indigenous-led social change. Thank you. Thanks, Michael, Sean. Great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I just want to uh, firstly um, make some acknowledgements to country today, uh, but to the people as well, obviously, in my own language, if I can. Um, e na mana, e na reo, e na rangatira ma, te na koto, te na koto, te na koto katoa. So that's uh, in Māori, in te reo Māori, Māori language. I just wanted to acknowledge the standing of the people here today, their language and their chiefs. And I acknowledge you all in uh, saying tēnā koutou. Greetings to everybody. I also want to acknowledge all the Indigenous lands in which uh, everybody is coming from today. Myself, I'm coming from uh, Warandri lands uh, here in Melbourne. And so we also acknowledge the others, um, the other indigenous peoples from around here and around, uh, sorry, from where you are actually located today. Uh, my talk today is really on social uh, change, social equity. Uh, I'm going, coming to you to talk to you about a program that we run. But before I do that, I think uh, our experiences in the last 18 months um, have been, um, uh, I just want to highlight some of the issues that are happening because of uh, COVID-19 has really, the pandemic has exposed and exacerbated uh, many existing inequalities uh, that exist, disproportionately affecting populations, of course, uh, from all over the world that have been suffering from poverty, uh, discrimination, illness, and financial instability, and not least of all, Indigenous peoples. Unfortunately, the consequences uh, for Indigenous peoples has been somewhat dire, as tribes have stripped, uh, been stripped of their old people. If any of you have been following uh, the news reports, particularly overseas, not all Indigenous groups are as uh, fortunate as those that have been living here in Australia and in New Zealand. Uh, but by, by, uh, with the old people dying in these Indigenous communities, they are really the tribe's cultural knowledge holders. They're also the language, um, language people. And it, because the um, disease has run rife and come across, uh, sorry, and it gone across many of the tribes that haven't been protected, um, they've, they've died and the finality of it all has been sudden. And I just think, unfortunately, that um, there have been many tribes across the world that are in dire uh, straits at the moment around um, maintaining their knowledge and their language. Um, as uh, Michael Sean has talked to us, he's already told us about what we're celebrating here today and the United Nations Indigenous Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples, International Day, sorry, of the World's Indigenous Peoples. The whole purpose of this is to help educate um, on the issues that, concern, that are of concern to Indigenous peoples to mobilize uh, political will, if you like, and the resources to address the global problems and to celebrate and reinforce our achievements across the world. I just want today to talk to you about something that we are doing here at the University of Melbourne. And this is the program that we've got up running around the Atlantic Fellows uh, for Social Equity. This program um, is is a program that is Indigenous-led social change. That is our vision, if you like, that is uh, the guidance, the star that guides us. We have substantive leadership uh, that is um, in charge of this program, if you like, including myself as the Indigenous, as the Executive Director. But we have a board uh, that has four out of five people on it that are Indigenous. We have um, a number of po, we call them po, it's a Māori word, uh, meaning pillar, if you like, pillar of the house, the uh, pillar that holds up 
the house, if you like. So we have a number of po that are all Indigenous from across New Zealand and Australia. You'll see some um, photos there. Some of you may well know uh, these people and who these people are. We have a leadership uh, that includes both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island uh, people, as well as Māori and Pacific Island. Um, and we also have partnerships uh, with New Zealand. So the program is an Indigenous-led program that covers uh, Australia and New Zealand, and we eventually wish to go to the Pacific um, Island nations. We are, of course, committed uh, to Indigenous peoples, and the course is open to um, Indigenous uh, students, what we call mid-career Indigenous students uh, or fellows, uh, to apply. Uh, so these are people who've had some experience at social change or have been doing social change. Most Indigenous people have been doing social change, in actual fact, working in their communities. So it's open to uh, Indigenous fellows. We also take in some non-Indigenous uh, people uh, as part of the program as well. So it's basically open to everybody. But we are committed to Indigenous people. The non-Indigenous people we take on have to have had a track record with Indigenous fears and working with Indigenous uh, groups and communities. Um, I guess the aims of our, or the values that we hold, if you like, that we uh, have, we aim to create a community and fellowship, apart from being in, uh, committed to Indigenous peoples, we aim to create community and fellowship, that is ideas of connection, collaboration and learning. We're also developing a very strong and I would say courageous and bold program, which I'll talk a little bit about at, um, very soon. We seek to impact and influence, obviously, um, as, as we can, and we are looking to build partnerships and uh, networks across the world, as I will show you. I think uh, in terms of uh, the Indigenous-led uh, social change, these are some of the values. When you work across countries, um, while the uh, values for particular communities might differ slightly, we think we have a set of values here that, uh, that are basically uh, reflect uh, Indigenous communities across the places in which we are working. So, um, so these six values are basically what it is that we, uh, we, we work with. We basically have uh, two parts to our fellowship. Uh, we have a, a very strong uh, foundation year. It is a 12 month uh, program where that foundation year where the students are asked or the fellows are asked to do a lot of work. But what they do after that is they graduate into what we call a lifelong senior fellowship. And that is because we are connected across the world to other programs. We are a program uh, that is well resourced, um, not by necessarily by the University of Melbourne, although they are allowing, uh, they are hosting us, but we are well funded by an American philanthropic program called Atlantic Philanthropies, which is where the name comes from. So let me just talk a little bit about our foundation year and what uh, we actually do. Uh, the foundation year actually consists of a year long study, if you like. So when you actually apply to get into the program, we actually ask you to do a number of things, not only give us a CV, but also to give us a social change idea. In other words, what are you committed to and what are you working on? So we ask the, the fellows um, or the applicants uh, to the program to put up the program or the project, if you like, the social change project, which they would like to do. And um, I have to admit that we do have a lot, of, um, a lot of fellows who are working on a wide range of programs or projects. So, um, one of the things that we do require them to do is to go through a study program in the Masters um, of Social Change Leadership, as you can see on your screen. Um, and if that's a little bit too heavy for um, some of the fellows, then we ask them to do the Graduate Certificate of Social Change Leadership. The whole idea about doing a, um, a qualification is to provide a very firm uh, platform, if you like, a platform for which uh, they can learn about 
other programs, other ways that Indigenous peoples um, uh, uh, attack or, if you like, um, work on their own social projects, the things that others are doing. So, for example, we uh, last week just came through, you know, just came through a, an Indigenous leadership module, which is a whole week of change. And we learned a lot about uh, programs, other Indigenous groups and how they're operating in leadership, particularly around governance uh, across Canada, the US, Australia and New Zealand by having speakers that came in from all those programs, uh, all those countries talking about uh, the work that's going on in each of those countries. So the students or the fellows get, ex um, get exposed to a lot of other programs that are running. Um, we do have some fellows, I think we've got one this year that's doing the graduate certificate. It is a heavy program, can I say, um, for the fellows. It's a program that uh, requires a lot of study. You require a lot of support uh, from your employer uh, if you're working. Some of our fellows are working full time and they are doing a um, full time masters at the same time. That requires, that's a very heavy workload and that requires real commitment. So we do ask for the fellows to be committed in that way, but to also have the support of their employers um, as well as their families that they need. So we currently have 18 fellows on the program. We have um, six Māori uh, fellows, eight Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, fellows, and four non-Indigenous fellows from across uh, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, next year, we're hoping to have about 22. Um, can I say that um, while we are, uh, have great expectations uh, for the fellows who are doing this work, uh, we do give them a lot of support as well. So it's not just an ordinary degree. It is a degree that um, is specifically designed for the Atlantic program. No other students are allowed to enroll in it. So it's specifically designed for the fellows who get into the program. We offer them help uh, financially. Uh, we also offer them a lot of education help and we offer them uh, personal support as well. And I have to say that, um, that we've learned a lot over the last 18 months with the fellows that have come in. Uh, and sometimes uh, many, uh, or a number of them, single traders, sole traders, if you like, have lost their income. So being able to do this has been great and um, the fellows have uh, very much appreciated it. So there are uh, sorts of fees. Um, we offer the sorts of fees, for example, fee-free uh, master's degree, uh, stipend for participating. Once you actually get in, you get automatically get some stipend money. Uh, and then there is a further stipend money depending on need. Uh, we offer people uh, tutoring, obviously, study groups are run all the time. Uh, we have, a, obviously, the students are enrolled as, um, at the University of Melbourne, and they also get uh, a lot of, so they have access to university resources. But I think on top of that, and something that has been um, proven to be of use uh, in the last year or so, uh, some of the personal supports that we have managed to give uh, these students. Uh, particularly around um, things like mentoring and mental health services, um, and also peer support. So it is um, a program uh, that is well resourced, as you can see um, in that way. The lifelong fellowship, once the, once the fellows get through this, this year, um, they actually then graduate into a global network. So uh, we are associated with uh, six other programs. There are seven of us altogether. So there are Atlantic Fellows for Racial Equity. We have a number of programs that address health equity. We have others that address uh, social and economic equity. For example, we have one that addresses brain health. So there are lots and lots of programs. Three of them are in the United States. Uh, one is in Thailand. One is in the UK, one is in South Africa, and then we have our program in Australia here down in Melbourne. We also um, have an umbrella network, if you like, called the Atlantic uh, Institute, 
which is based at Rhodes House at the University of Oxford uh, in the UK. And it is, uh, at the moment, headed up. Their executive director is a senior fellow from our program, uh, uh, Evie O'Brien. Uh, she has, she's a New Zealand Māori uh, and has uh, graduated out of our program. So we're very fortunate and very proud to have uh, Evie heading up uh, the Institute with oversight over the seven programs. They graduate into a, a network. The program is funded for 20 years, I have to say. There's no programs that get funded for that long. So we are very, very fortunate to, say, to have uh, the funding that will last us at least 20 years. There are, as I said, seven hubs around the world. There's something like four and a half thousand fellows, and it is a, truly a global network. Even though we're a regional program that is across Australia and New Zealand, um, the program, uh, the, the graduation into the network is actually a global network. We are the only program that focuses in on Indigenous issues, that we are committed to Indigenous peoples. So uh, we expect our fellows to be able to take uh, a leadership role uh, once they graduate into that uh, network, that big uh, lifelong network as we go in. Here's some pictures of the fellows that we have um, that have gone through the program and the ones at the bottom are some of the ones that are in the program uh, now. Um, they are all uh, great, um, great fellows and great students, I have to say. Um, and I'm sure uh, if you know any of those people that you would be able to ask them um, about the program itself. I do have to say though, at the moment, our, our website has gone down over the weekend. If anybody's very interested in learning a bit more about the program, because I've only just skimmed across the top. Um, if you uh, use this um, email address, it will go to one of our um, one of our staff members who will be able to give you a link behind the um, be behind the website to be able to get you to access the ap application process. So um, I just leave it at that. I know it sounds like it's a wee bit of a uh, a sell, um, but I wanted to really uh, highlight uh, some positive work that's happening um, out of the um, out of well, University of Melbourne here in association with the University of Auckland in New Zealand, um, and a positive, uh, if you like, solution uh, to some of the issues that we're facing at the moment. And it, it sort of gives me a lot of hope, I have to say, with a lot of these younger fellows, younger than me anyway, um, younger fellows to, um, as they are, as they're going through. So I'll hand it back to you, uh, Michael, Michael Sean. Have I gone over time? <laughs> no, no, that's fine, Liz. That's fine. We're, we're right to the end. There's a couple of questions. That, what a fantastic program. And, and the fact that it's got the longevity of support that it has is, is really, really amazing and, um, and such a promising program to produce a lot of high-quality Indigenous fellows that will hopefully make a social change, and I'm sure they are already and will continue to do so. So there's a quick question here. If you could just yeah. um, briefly... Uh, and I, I don't see it as a sell at all. I think it's important we get this out there and get as many quality people in. So, so thank you very much. Um, are the applicants' social change projects purely theoretical or is there a practical component to the program? No, they are practical. Um, most of them are actually practical. They are actually doing um, something in terms of a um, sort of akin to a development project, maybe, or a uh, research project. We do have to be careful with that for a little bit. There is money to support the projects as well, I have to say, um, Michael Sean. Yeah. So, no, they're practical as well. You could do a the theoretical one if you wanted to. Perfect. That's, uh, that's great. Thanks, Liz. And we're, we're out of time there. But if, as uh, Liz has mentioned, if you want any more information, go contact that email and hopefully the website will be back up and running. And yeah. thanks a Within lot. Within another day or so. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks a lot for that, Liz. I really, really appreciate it. Okay. So moving on to the next part of our program, we have Dr. Kirsty Sword Guzmau, Order of Australia. <clears throat> who was educated at the University of Melbourne and Monash University. For two, two decades, Kirsty worked for Timor-Leste to realise its right to self-determination and 
after the nation became independent in 2002, has contributed to the rebuilding of the country through her women's organisation, the Alola Foundation, and a range of education-related initiatives. As the chair of Timor Leste's 17, well, sorry, as the chair of Timor Leste's first national commission for UNESCO, she advocated for a greater role for Timor Leste's 17 indigenous languages in the education system and a more prominent role for Indigenous knowledge systems in national development. And I'm really excited to, to hear what Kirsty has to say um, on the topic of language, learning and identity in Timor-Leste. Thank you, Kirsty. I'll mute. Thanks so much for that lovely welcome. Good morning, uh, bon dia, everybody. Um, importantly, on this day, may I begin by acknowledging the Indigenous owners of the land on which we meet today and pay respects to their elders. Um, to honour them, and because I'm going to talk quite a bit about the importance of language and identity today, I'd like to begin by quoting from the findings of the 2011 New South Wales Inquiry into Language Learning in Indigenous Communities, which states, language connects us with our ancestors. It stores our history and knowledge, progressed over thousands of years, and ties us to our country and to each other. Language use expresses our way of being and of seeing the world. Now, I have a little um, PowerPoint presentation. I'll just um, share that with you now. So I'm delighted to have been asked to speak to you on this special day, which celebrates and calls attention to the importance of Indigenous knowledge systems for the understandings of our world and natural environment that they hold and for the rich stories of human civilization that they tell. I'm gonna to talk to you today about a passion of mine. Well, actually a couple of passions. One uh, of the little half island nation of Timor-Leste, which I'm privileged to call my second homeland. And the other that of language, specifically indigenous languages and the important that they role, the important role that they play in all human societies, but particularly in post-colonial and multilingual settings. I'm going to talk to you about our efforts in Timor Leste to run a mother tongue-based multilingual education pilot program in three municipalities of Timor Leste and some of the practical and intensely political obstacles that we have faced along the way. But first, by way of an introduction to me and the above mentioned um, passions, uh, here is a bit of my background. So I'm a teacher by training. I did my arts degree and a dip ed at Melbourne Uni in the 1980s. And it was during my undergraduate studies that I came to know a number of East Timorese students and the plight of their homeland. Hearing their own tales of persecution and the horrors of the Indonesian occupation of the territory, my conscience as an Australian was pricked. As a student of languages, specifically Indonesian and Italian, I started translating reports of human rights violations and helped my friends to disseminate these widely. My journey to full-time and devoted advocate of independence for Timor-Leste was fast-tracked by the experience of working in 1991 as a member of a film crew which captured the Santa Cruz massacre on film. By the following year, I had moved to Jakarta and joined forces with the increasingly bold pro-democracy movement um, within the country. Fast forward to 2002 and the newly independent Timor-Leste who was grappling with rebuilding a shattered nation after the violence of 1999. It was also establishing all the key institutions of state from scratch and making vitally important decisions on issues such as systems of government, currency and choice of official language. The country's leaders opted for Portuguese, the language of the former, former colonial power, alongside Tetum, the lingua franca amongst some 
17 local Indigenous languages. Whilst both Portuguese and Tetum enjoyed the same status within the new state and Article 13 of the Constitution of the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste declares the nation's commitment to promoting and developing Tetum and the country's other native languages, Portuguese was favoured as the language of instruction within the school system. Tetum, which had hitherto being principally a spoken language amongst most Timorese, was not deemed to be well suited to the transmission of knowledge and science. There was only one small but important complicating factor with this policy decision, and that was that only about 25% of the population spoke Portuguese with any degree of fluency, and amongst teachers, standards of proficiency were sorely lacking. It's perhaps not surprising, therefore, that in 2009, when the World Bank conducted its first early grade reading assessment, 70% of grade two students could not read a single line of text in either Portuguese or Tetum. And in fact, disturbing numbers of students continued to spend um, three to four years at primary school without learning to read or write. So back in 2009, I had just been sworn in as the chair of the newly minted Timor-Leste National Commission for UNESCO. I'd done a lot of reading about UNESCO's work at promoting and supporting mother tongue-based multilingual education programs around the world. And I could see their importance and relevance for Timor. Not only were there advantages for children's learning, but also Conferring status on Indigenous languages by making them languages of the classroom contributes to their preservation. Census data reveals that year upon year, more Timorese are opting to speak and teach their children Tetum over their first language. As I mentioned earlier, this first language could be one of roughly 17 local languages of which the majority are Austronesian and a handful are Papuan in origin. Each one is distinct and unique and encodes a vast array of traditional knowledge in the form of insights into the ways of the spirit world, the uses of plants for traditional medicine, care for and preservation of the land and waterways, and much else. Um, Dr. Lisa Palmer's book, Island Encounters, which we will be launching shortly, offers a glimpse into the richness and importance of this traditional knowledge for the identity and well-being of the Timorese people on the land. When a language becomes extinct, and at least one of those 17 Timorese languages is no longer spoken, a community's grasp on that precious traditional knowledge becomes tenuous. To come back to my work for the Timor-Leste National Commission for UNESCO, so as a teacher, it concerned me a great deal that kids were not able to understand their teachers in the classroom and that teachers were struggling to teach effective, effectively given their requirement that they teach the curriculum in Portuguese. As a lover of languages, it was troubling to me that Timor-Leste's um, Indigenous languages were becoming extinct and that nobody in positions of power in the country seemed to care very much. Because it seemed counterintuitive, nobody believed me and my colleagues at the National Commission when we said that kids would learn Tetum and Portuguese better if they had a chance to acquire their initial literacy in their mother tongue. So we decided to establish a mother tongue based multilingual education pilot program in 12 pre primary and primary schools in three of Timor Leste's 13 municipalities. As a precursor to this work, we ran workshops in Dili and in the three pilot municipalities to raise awareness of the importance of Timor-Leste's Indigenous languages in and of themselves, but also as a means of helping kids to achieve success at school. Perhaps because an election was looming and my then husband and Prime Minister, Shanana Guzman, had thrown his weight behind the mother tongue program, I found myself verbally and almost physically assaulted at one such workshop by a group of agitated protesters who claimed that promoting Timor-Leste's mother tongues was divisive and an attempt to drag Timor-Leste's education system backwards. We were forced to abandon the workshop. 
If it had gone ahead, we would have had a chance to address precisely these concerns and remind those present that the determination to defend Timor-Leste's unique cultural and linguistic identity was what had won the people their national independence at great human cost. Regardless of these early setbacks, the Mother Tongue pilot program went ahead with overwhelming support from the school communities involved. We were also fortunate to have the technical advice and inputs of Professor Jolo Bianco, former Professor of Language and Literacy Education at the Melbourne Uni Graduate School of Education, who assisted us with drafting a national uh, language in education policy for Timor Leste. An evaluation of the pilot program conducted in 2016 showed that grade two students in the mother tongue schools are learning to read far more rapidly than children attending the Portuguese uh, reference schools, which are staffed by teachers from Portugal and enjoy facilities and resources far superior to regular public schools. In fact, in tests of reading ability, grade two students in the mother tongue schools were performing 25 percentage points better than children in the Portuguese schools. And in other subject areas too, including mathematics and even um, Portuguese language, the kids in the mother tongue program were excelling. Anecdotally too, and very importantly, we know that the parents and families of children in the pilot schools are taking a much more active interest in their children's learning than ever before. In spite of the significant initial outlay required for the development of standard orthographies and simple learning materials for hitherto largely oral languages, the mother tongue program in Timor-Leste is far less costly and significantly more effective than other educational models. Most importantly, it's ensuring that no child is left behind in the classroom. And of course, inclusion and negotiation of new, more equitable social contracts are the focus of this year's International Day of the World's Indigenous People. A large body of evidence, including the findings from mother tongue based multilingual and bilingual pilot programs from around the world, including Australia, stress the importance of use of a child's first, lang first language for literacy and early learning not only for better educational outcomes, but for the well-being, sense of belonging and social connectedness of the child. Sadly, 40% of the global population does not access education in a language they understand. And a large number of those would of course be indigenous people. Unfortunately, two politicians and government bureaucrats, perhaps because in most places around the world they are from social elites and members of the dominant ethno-linguistic group in society, are content to be guided in their policy decisions by ill-informed and often chauvinistic public opinion. This has certainly been the case in Timor-Leste, where government support for the pilot program has recently been cut back and calls from minority language communities to join the program have been rejected. I know that in Indigenous communities in Australia also, attempts to promote the teaching of Aboriginal languages in the school system have been at the whim of the revolving door of federal and state politicians. Next year sees the beginning of the decade of Indigenous languages. I hope that the momentum for change and growing recognition of the importance of Indigenous languages for sustainable development will gain pace over that period here in Australia, in Timor-Leste and indeed around the globe. Thank you so much for listening to me today and um, I'm very happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kirsty. That was really, really informative, and it's um, really glad we could bring, despite the restrictions on it that the world's facing right now, bring an international perspective because our, the institute and the plights of Indigenous people are a global, um, a global thing, not just idiosyncratic to Australia. So, for me, this this really just 
reinforces the importance of the theme this year, which is um, the omission, if you like, of Indigenous peoples around the world from the implicit social contract that society is based upon. Uh, and in this way, it's manifest in the way that you've elucidated in terms of essentially excluding um, people from education and learning because of their inability to understand and the, the, the unwillingness of the dominant societies to communicate in languages that they can understand. Can you elucidate some of, I don't want to make this too negative and we'll move into some more positive questions, but elucidate some of the, the issues that have arisen from this exclusion, if you like, from, from the knowledge systems or the, the education system. In other areas, it results in, in inability to access fair wages and, and economic opportunity. And are they the sort of outcomes that, that have occurred and continue to occur in Timor Leste because of this situation? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, you know, it's been referred to a number of times this morning already how, you know, education offers pathways into, um, you know, power um, positions um, within uh, government systems and also um, economic power. And, you know, what, what we see is that um, minority language communities um, in Timor-Leste, particularly in the more remote parts um, of the country where um, less Tetum and Portuguese are spoken, that, um, you know, kids are not, not succeeding. They already have tremendous pressures on them um, from their parents who are in all likelihood subsistence farmers. And um, so when those children after two years are not learning to read and write, their parents... Um, you know, question whether or not the time that they're spending in the classroom is actually time well spent, and whether or not they wouldn't be better actually helping on on the on the farm out in the fields. Um, so those kids who are already um, disadvantaged become then further further disadvantaged, and then you know um, that then 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 spirals and. Um, uh, you know, increases the inequities um, that exist within within society, and of course, you know those um, urban dwelling populations, um, political elites have, in all likelihood, actually attended um, uh, school in one of the dominant languages, either Tetum or Portuguese. So they're more likely to get um, get the jobs. Um, jobs in civil service, particularly, require a certain level of proficiency in both Tetum and Portuguese. So automatically those, those rural minority language um, communities are, are, are disadvantaged in terms of um, getting a seat at, at the table, you know, whether that's um, in a business setting or, you know, in a governance setting at the, at the national level. Yeah, there's so many parallels everywhere. That's one of the, the, the forms of control, isn't it? Um, so I might try for one more quick question. I guess um, we've got a few here, but I'll, I'll choose this one. So the language progression plan, <clears throat> does it, is it connected, the one in Timor-Leste, 20 other Portuguese colonies and their, their rate of progress in educating Indigenous people, for example, Brazilian Indigenous people? Um. I'm not aware of any similar programs in Brazil, and I'm not sure whether the language progression plan um, in the in Timor Leste would would match what they're doing there. Um, but certainly, when we developed that that transition plan, we had the advice of um, a number of international uh, experts, including Professor Joe Lobianco, who was drawing on. Um, his experience of working with um, huge numbers of minority language communities around the region, you know, the Pacific region, um, but also all around the world, including some um, African and uh, South American countries. So it, it, I mean, it is tailored to Timor's um, specific circumstances. Of course, you know, it's very complex because you have, you know, kids not having to learn one uh, 
foreign, if you like, language or a non-home language, but they're having to learn um, Tetum, Portuguese, and then at secondary level, English. So um, ideally, they would actually be able to transition a little bit longer to the second language, but because of the requirement that they also learn um, Portuguese before they enter high school, um, the transition happens um, probably a little bit earlier than what would be recommended um, internationally. All right, thank you. Thanks for answering that question. Um, you're going to be involved in, in this next session anyway, so thank you very much for taking us on the journey that you're, you've embarked upon and continue to embark upon. And please let us know at the Institute and the University if there's any way that we can um, assist you in your, your efforts of um, getting Indigenous languages in Timor-Leste um, properly involved in curriculum and, and education. So thank you very much. Um, I'll Thanks. move on to the next talk, which is a book launch for the amazing uh, Associate Professor Lisa Palmer from the School of Geography at the University of Melbourne. It's also focused on Timor-Leste. Um, I will introduce Professor Marcia Langton on Order of Australia, who will in turn introduce Lisa and Lisa and Kirsty will discuss the book. So Marcia is an Aboriginal woman of Iman descent. She's an anthropologist and a geographer with a strong research track record on Aboriginal alcohol use and harms family violence, Aboriginal land tenure, management of environments and native title, and aspects of Aboriginal culture, art, performance, and the shift to modernity. Professor Langton has held the Foundation Chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne since the year 2000, and was appointed Associate Provost in 2017. Professor Langton is a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, a Fellow of Trinity College, Melbourne, and an honorary fellow of Emmanuel College at the University of Queensland. Marcia is a, is a really powerful figure in, in Aboriginal society and the university. And I'm really uh, proud to, to hand over to Marcia for this next session. Thanks, Marcia. Thank you, Michael. Michael Sean. Obrigada, Barak, Dr. Kirsty Sword Guzmau. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to introduce again Dr. Kirsty Sword Guzmau and Associate Professor Lisa Palmer um, for a very special launch of Lisa's latest book, Ireland Encounters Timor Leste from the Outside. So you've heard a little about Dr. Kirsty Sword Guzmau. AO from Michael uh, and her significant role uh, through the National Commission for UNESCO and advocacy for 17 of the Indigenous languages of Timor Leste um, and uh, for the Indigenous knowledge systems embedded in them. I found a beautiful photograph of Kirsty with her sons, Alex, Kay Olok, and Daniel. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I want to uh, say yakai, hey, you, uh, in one of the languages I learned as a child. Good to see you, especially on this uh, very special day, World Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, <clears throat> so I'll hand over to you, Kirsty, uh, before I then introduce Lisa. Thank you so much, um, Marcia. I feel very honoured to have been asked by Lisa to launch, launch her book and uh, very honoured to, to share uh, this virtual stage with, with you. Um, so for the past few months, I've had the great pleasure of working alongside Lisa on developing her amazing digital archive of Timorese culture and ecology. Um, the archive contains a vast array of photos, films, audio tracks and documents which collectively tell the story of how the Timorese people relate to their world, including the spirit realm of their ancestors, to their natural environment and to one another. 
So like Lisa, I am a Team Marie's by marriage and passion. However, unlike her, my experience of the country and its people has earned me only a very superficial understanding of the profound place of traditional belief systems and practices in the lives of ordinary Timorese people. Um, having been swept up in the modernising agenda of the development industry through my work as founder and chair of the Alola Foundation, I've only, I guess, um, skirted the edges of Indigenous Timorese culture and its role in shaping its people's world view. Um, and that, in spite of having worked, as you have just heard, um, quite hard over the past decade or so to see a greater space accorded to Timor's many local languages in the education system. Um, so in spite of that, working with Lisa on her archive has filled many gaps in my knowledge of what makes Timor and its people tick. I've um, lived in Timor Leste for 15 years and I was married over that time to Shanana Guzman, someone who Lisa describes in her book as embodying the paradoxes of darkness and light, tradition and modernity. Nevertheless, reading Island Encounters has given me deeper understandings of the complexity of these paradoxes and the importance and difficulty of ensuring that Indigenous knowledge systems are integrated successfully into programs of national development. Lisa's book is written with great humility and deep respect for the people she encounters on her journey from the outside in. I wish that I had been able to read Lisa's book as I embarked on my own life-changing island encounters um, exactly 30 years ago this year, but better late than never. So if, like me, you are curious to delve more deeply into the heart and soul of Timor-Leste, its psyche and its spirit world, then I recommend Lisa's new book to you um, thoroughly. Thank you very much. Obrigada, Barak. So it is my very great pleasure then to introduce Associate Professor Lisa Palmer of the School of Geography to say a little about her book, uh, Obrigada, Barak. Lisa. Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nation, peoples of the Kulin Nation on whose land I live and work. And just to say, I was so inspired uh, this morning to hear a little bit more about the Victorian treaty process from the representatives of the First Nations Assembly. And of course, to hear uh, and dance with the beautiful Jiri Jiri dancers. Thank you so much to Kirsty for your generous launch and those kind words. And thank you so much, Marcia, who, as many of you will know, was my doctoral supervisor in the Northern Territory University many years ago uh, for uh, chairing this launch. Thank you as well to Michael, Aaron, Brittany and the Indigenous Knowledge Institute for organising to launch the book here today. It's a great honour. Uh, to be doing so. And I acknowledge all the Indigenous people from around the world and everyone here at this event today. So as Kirsty and Marcia intimated, Island Encounters is part up anthropology and geography, part memoir and part reportage, a narrative of Timor shaped by a journey from the outside in. It incorporates my 20 years or so of experience and involvement with Timor Leste and more particularly the months I spent traveling with my young family from west to east in 2018. So while I've written other books and articles about Timor Leste, I wrote this book to reach a general rather than specifically academic audience. It's a book that shuttles back and forth from past to present, interweaving these experiences with stories and hopes for the future. So East Timor has a, heart, has a place in the hearts of many Australians, and we've heard a bit about that from Kirsty. Those lucky enough to travel there return captivated by its people, their lands and their resilient spirit. In an island encounters, I wanted to share my insights of two decades of experience with the country, shining a light on the richly woven tapestry of Timorese lives and landscapes. So with, a, with an eye to the country's complex history and politics, 
The book traces paths redolent in longing and learning, belonging and bewilderment, courage and conviction to tell of an island divided by colonialism and conflict, but also, of course, of joy and ongoing connection. I hope that I've done justice to these encounters and that those that will read it will enjoy and learn something from the journey. Um, you'll see in a, in a moment that the book is also downloadable uh, for free from a new press. And it's, I'd just like to say here that it's a book that's had a long gestation and there are a great many people to thank and acknowledge. And I won't be able to do that all here today. But I would like to extend my deepest thanks to my extended family, friends and colleagues from across the island of Timor. As Kirsty said, my husband is a man from Timor Leste, and of course to my own family in Australia. I've been privileged to be welcomed into their lives and to learn and benefit from the qualities that they have shared, inclusivity, warmth, joy in the company of others and enthusiasm for extending out an exceedingly endless network of family, friendships and stories. I'd also like to thank a few people who are online here today at this event. And my deepest thank you to Dr. Baltazar Kehi and his family from the dispersed kingdom of Lokyu, whose lands and stories feature in the first part of the book and whose lands and stories are divided by that colonial border between Portuguese and Dutch Timor. Thank you as well to Professor Marcia Langton, who is my doctoral supervisor and with whom I shared my first visit to an independent Timor-Leste back in the year 2000. Thank you to Russell Drysdale, my geography colleague, and, and my, all my geography students who are online as well, with whom I have now shared many field class experiences traveling around Timor-Leste with the Melbourne University geography students. And that's also the subject of one chapter in the book. Thank you to the inspirational head of the former School of Geography, Professor Leslie Head. And finally, thank you to the brilliant Tamsin Wagner, whose expertise and editorial guidance from the outset to the very end of this writing process has been essential to the life of Island Encounters. So as I said, the book is free to download from ANU Press. I hope you read it and enjoy it. And thank you all so much for the opportunity to present it to you today. Haraben, Lisa. <laughs> Uh, and uh, this book follows uh, quite a few uh, other works, including a wonderful film about the honeybee, um, uh, Botare Baltazar, and uh, again, uh, Obrigada Barak, Kirsty, Obrigada Barak, Lisa, um, Parabens. Thank you. Congratulations to all. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thanks a lot for that, Marcia, Kirsty, and Lisa. I can't wait to, to read a copy of the book. And um, I've worked for a number of year now, years now in the same school as uh, Lisa and, and even worked on some, some uh, publications together, which has been a, a pleasure. So thanks a lot, Lisa and others. All right. So the final session, the final talk in this session is going to be from Associate Professor Sally Trelawne. Sally, if I can find my notes, sorry, is an ARC Future Fellow and Associate Professor in Ethnomusicology and Intercultural Research in the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music. Her research specialism is music revitalization and community-led audiovisual repatriation in Northwest Australia. Sally is co-director of the Research Unit for Indigenous Arts and Cultures at the Willen Center for Indigenous Arts, Cultural Development, and convenes the Indigenous Graduate Researcher Training Program. So I'll hand over to Sally, who will take us through her presentation. Thanks, Sally. Great. Thanks so much, Michael. And uh, thanks to the organisers uh, of today's event. Um, my name's Sally Trelawne. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri on whose country I'm sitting and speaking today. Um, I also acknowledge Bunwarang elders present and future generations um, on whose country the Research Unit for Indigenous Arts and Cultures sits. 
um, and on whose country uh, our research unit was founded and operates. Um, of course, I acknowledge the broader Kulin Nations um, where University of Melbourne's uh, campuses lie and the peoples of other countries that um, our campuses and activities touch. Um, particularly, I'd like to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Tiriki Onis, uh, co-director of the research unit for Indigenous Arts and Cultures and head of the Willen Centre. Um, he was to provide this presentation today, but unfortunately has had a, a family, um, family issue arise uh, and has handed over the reins. So I hope I, um, I do a good job uh, on his behalf. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm a settler scholar, a non-Indigenous person in this space. Uh, I grew up and was born on the unceded lands of the Dharawal. Um, and I'd like to also acknowledge Ngorin and Wurora and Wunambal elders, whose knowledges, whose song knowledges have been a foundation of my career. Um, and of course, I acknowledge their descendants with whom I collaborate today. So I'm privileged um, to speak in this forum today and thank Tiriki for uh, calling me in. Um, of course, I'm an inadequate replacement for Tiriki, but uh, my intention here is to go on with respect um, and to communicate to this uh, esteemed audience and, and host um, the activities of our research unit. So uh, thinking about the occasion of today, uh, the International Day of World's Indigenous Peoples, um, my mind goes to the text of the, the UNESCO Convention on the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. Uh, in particular, the recognition that, quote, social transformation alongside the conditions it creates for renewed dialogue among communities also gives rise to grave threats of deterioration, disappearance, and destruction of the intangible cultural heritage, in particular, owing to a lack of resources for safeguarding such heritage. Also the recognition that it's indigenous communities, groups and individuals that play an important role in the production, safeguarding, safeguarding, maintenance and recreation of the intangible cultural heritage, thus helping to enrich cultural diversity and human creativity. So in 2017, Tiriki and I with our colleague Pai Linda Ford from Charles Darwin University conducted a scoping project to understand the perspectives of Indigenous artists on what and how universities might do better to support Indigenous cultural practices, intangible cultural heritages, and more so to be more inclusive of the expertise of Indigenous communities, groups and individuals in teaching and research about these practices. Uh, our conviction was and is that expertise for safeguarding practices and safeguarding the world lies with Indigenous peoples past, present and future. And uh, for non-Indigenous institutions and uh, scholars such as myself to uh, learn from Indigenous peoples and authorities in conducting research in ways to support uh, the, um, the safeguarding of those, those knowledges. So these workshops led to the launch of our research unit for Indigenous arts and cultures um, that I'm going to talk to today. Um, so to give you a, um, a brief uh, history of our research unit, I'll just note that we, we tend to refer to the Research Unit for Indigenous Arts and Cultures simply as RUYAC, that acronym there. Um, so in 2016, we were fortunate to receive um, a small grant from the Indigenous Research Hallmark Research Initiative to conduct some workshops and scoping consultation with community to really understand um, the notion of artist voice, Indigenous epistemologies for research about arts and practice-based research. We really wanted to know what Indigenous uh, arts practice practitioners in our, in our orbit, in our networks, really wanted from the academy. And two things really came out, well, three things in a way. The first, was that there was a social justice issue that Indigenous authority over Indigenous arts knowledges was often excluded from the academy. Um, the second was that there could be more, more attention to Indigenous arts knowledges and cultural heritage within the academy. So songs, stories, visual arts, sculpture, uh, sound arts, uh, these could be a centerpiece of curriculum and learning. Um, and then, Thirdly, um, we realised that 
there was a strong voice that the university could really benefit from including including Indigenous arts knowledges and practices in their vision, governance and approach to engagement. The idea that Indigenous arts practices are not just philosophies of practice, but also hold um, great, there are great traditions of diplomacy um, and diplomacy around collaboration, around engagement, um, as well as great sources of wisdom and knowledge about the future of the world. So we launched our research unit in 2017 on Bumwadang country. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that launch as I go on. Um, one of our key uh, roles as a research unit is to deliver um, the graduate research program for Indigenous students in our faculty, in the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music. So we had inaugural commencements in our Masters by Research and PhD programs uh, in 2017. Um, and then in 2017, we also hosted our first symposium on Indigenous arts and cultures in the academy, which we titled Philosophies of Practice. Um, in 2018, we launched our Indigenous Graduate Researcher Training Program. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this as well, but it's kind of an academy approach where we have uh, writing groups, reading groups, uh, weekly check-ins, um, research assistance opportunities and so on um, to kind of create a sense of uh, community and cohort for our students in the often isolating experience of a master's of PhD and PhD and to you know a platform to really be responsive to the needs of our students as they arise. Um, we had our second symposium on indig Indigenous arts and cultures in the academy in that year really focusing on the notion of diplomacies, diplomacies amongst uh, performance groups and how these are enacted in ceremony and public uh, events um, and extending that to the idea of, well, what can the university learn about these diplomacies of practice um, to improve the way that it is engaging as an institution with, with communities. Uh, in 2019, we launched a faculty-wide initiative called the Area Leaders in Indigenous Engagement, uh, known as Allies. This is the idea, an idea to, to support um, indigenous and non-indigenous leaders across our disciplines to really um, be, a, um, be a safe landing space for people in community wishing to enter the, the academy um, and of course for indigenous students and, and, and staff coming through um, and that's continuing today our allies program. Um, we had our second round of commencements in 2019, uh, hosted our third symposium and uh, the, these are kind of key initiatives of symposia graduate program um, and allies are really what continues to, to um, go forward today. So that's kind of our, our brief history. Um, who are we? Well, we're a, we're a community of practice, really, research unit. Um, Tiriki and I are co-directors. We have uh, some special advisors, in particular, Pai Linda Ford um, and uh, other senior colleagues um, across institutions. But very much we... Um, We've taken the approach of um, honouring the relationships that, that we as a, as a group within a university have with different parts of the community and expanding that network of relational accountability, of course, um, as, as the years and activities have gone on. Um, and these relationships um, are enacted through um, ceremonial events, such as the launch of the research unit uh, pictured here. Uh, so our vision um, is to center indigenous philosophies of practice in the academy and society through arts practices, arts research, research training and partnerships. Um, we have four key objectives um, to support and build indigenous research and researchers in the arts through postgraduate training, research activity and research networks. Uh, to conduct and promote research that produces knowledge about indigenous arts practices and arts philosophies. Uh, thirdly, to inform and demonstrate good practice in intercultural arts research and arts research training. And finally, to contribute to a transformation of society through partnerships that celebrate and promote Indigenous arts knowledges. Uh, our key actions, which I've, I've uh, foreshadowed, are our Masters and PhD programs for Indigenous artists as researchers, uh, our graduate training program, our annual symposia, 
uh, our contributions to research and research training committees and forums across our faculty. Uh, and of course our, um, and you know, really much of this comes together um, in the course of our uh, activity through externally funded research uh, that's guided by community objectives and interests. So just thought I'd give you a little bit of uh, an insight into these key areas of activity uh, in these next few slides. So firstly, our annual symposium. So what we really try to do with our annual symposiums is to break away to some extent from what we might traditionally think of as a symposium, a, you know, a series of people speaking, sharing knowledges, um, but to, to really think about, well, what does knowledge production on country mean? What does knowledge production as a mode of performance and uh, ceremonial practice mean? Um, so um, talking circles, um, song and dance activity, weaving, sculpting, um, different activities like this have been the core, the core platforms for knowledge sharing, if you like, in our annual symposia. Um, our annual symposia tend to last for about a week in length. Um, and this allows kind of like a, an iterative, um, reiterative progress through activity, people sharing across art forms um, and navigating different, um, different diplomacies that need to be navigated as, as, they, as they arise. Um, and then we will generally have a day of a more conventional symposium format where where different projects and uh, research are shared um, and then coming together in a, um, sort of a ceremonial um, shared performance event. Um, our symposia have all to date been hosted on Boonwarang uh, in that bottom left photo there, you can see uh, Nawi Carolyn Briggs um, welcoming uh, Burora and Wunabal um, practitioners to, uh, to country there. That's an image from the Willen Garden in the South Bank campus. Uh, and there, uh, Rona Charles, who's a long-term, long-time collaborator of mine from the Kimberley, and Leah Umbergai from the Mojum Art and Culture Centre are being welcomed. Um, you see there uh, the second image um, um, activity by uh, led by Tirek on the on the um, the assemblage and um, creation of a big young art possum skin cloak. Um, that actually became, if you like, the founding document of the research unit. Um, the image in the center is uh, uh, Falau Ambagai, uh, a young Wurora leader of the Jumba practice, sharing his knowledges of rec reclaiming uh, Jumba practice uh, from the Kimberley, from Mohanjum. Um, and then fourthly, sharing of dance uh, amongst the group uh, led by Nick Harding. Um, and then finally, um, that last image there, um, you'll see um, some performers. Actually, that image is from the a very recent festival in the Kimberley at Mollendrum Festival, where a dance totem that was constructed and actually revived um, from historical documents in the course of one of our symposia uh, is actually being performed um, up there in Mollendrum um, by Pete O'Connor and uh, Lloyd Nolgut. So the idea is that the, the creation, the knowledges that are generated through our, symp our symposia are actually uh, traveling with people as they return to home communities as well. Um, so yeah, in a snapshot, that, that's uh, what our symposia look like. Um, our graduate program, um, as I noted, um, we have a Masters by Research. It's actually a Masters in Fine Arts that's offered by our faculty um, and PhD. They're both uh, in the discipline um, of Indigenous Arts and Cultures. Uh, we uh, have within our program both uh, uh, Australian, Australian Indigenous, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander candidates, as well as people coming from international uh, Indigenous uh, heritages. Um, we, as well as uh, students enrolled in those programs, we open our program to Indigenous students from across the faculty. So we have Pacifica student, uh, we've had students from, from uh, Uganda and, uh, and elsewhere. Um, 
we take, if you like, a, you know, this idea of an academy approach with um, a range of activities. Uh, the core activity at the moment is actually a weekly, or actually uh, we meet twice a week, a weekly writing group, um, just a kind of like a, a debriefing session, a catch-up session for our researchers. Um, we have seminars, uh, reading groups, and different academic skills development programs on offer. Um, we have graduate uh, graduate colloquium, um, giving students the opportunity to present in different forums um, and performance demonstration opportunities, many of which are supported through um, the, uh, the positioning of, of our program uh, with, within the Willen Centre. Um, and we benefit greatly from the strength of the Willen Centre's engagement and, um, and uh, uh, public facing um, opportunities. Um, because we uh, have been quite ac active with externally funded research, we've been able to provide quite a few research assistance opportunities for our students, something that we're keen to, keen to continue. And our program has been greatly supported by uh, the university libraries um, and research office and so on uh, in providing um, support as needed to our, to our students. Um, and also um, support for, for, for uh, supervisor training as well. Um, just on the on the left there, you'll see some examples of our student projects. Um, James Howard, uh, Jadwa, uh, singer and composer. Um, he's just on the cusp of submitting his uh, PhD, uh, practice-led PhD on reconnecting to Jadwa, cultural heritage and music composition. Um, to the right there, the beautiful beating work of uh, our Cree Métis um, artist, Nicole Paul, who's just actually... Um, uh, lodged her masters uh, entitled Homing Away From Home in, in the university repository. So it's a beautiful completion. Um, and then in the bottom panel there, you'll see Andrew Murambari Dowding, a Nalama uh, scholar um, conducting field work with um, um, Stephen Stewart, who's a Ngala elder, said to be actually 109 years old, um, documenting his knowledge of um, public tabi songs um, of which um, Andrew is uh, uh, part of a lineage for, um, and in particular, um, using uh, uh, mapping technologies to support the documentation and, um, and transmission of these knowledges to, um, to future generations. Um, so yeah, these are, these are just some examples of our current and recent uh, uh, PhD projects, but as you, it kind of conveys a range of people both working on the preservation documentation side, side of things um, through a cultural framework, as well as people practicing their art for personal personal reasons, um, family heritage, um, and conveys the, the, the local, regional, and uh, international scope of our, of our activity. I'm um, just pushing on here, um, brief look at our current uh, research. Um, Perhaps our um, primary project at the moment is around um, Tirukionis' work on the possum skin cloak, um, looking at uh, rematriation of those, those practices uh, through collaborative practice. Um, this contributed partly and interlinked with, at least with Tiruki's recent film, which um, people may have um, read some of the media around called A Blaze, about the legacies of his uh, grandfather. Um, and of course, that's linked in with uh, a discovery, an ARC discovery project that Turkey is currently involved in with uh, some other colleagues from Melbourne, uh, reclaiming performance under assimilation in Southeast Australia from 1935 to 1975. Uh, much of our other activity is, if you like, um, could be classed as ethnomusicological in nature, very much based around repatriation of legacy song records and thinking about the role that repatriation can play in music revitalization uh, and reclamation. And um, the key example, which I um, pointed to before, was uh, the, uh, the revival of this, uh, this Captain Cook uh, totem. Um, the work was done in the course of one of our symposiums in Melbourne, um, and then uh, the totems were returned. And um, through a extensive process of community um, practice-led research, reviving the songs and an actual dance. Um, this was just launched at the recent Mountain Festival. So this is just an ABC article in the bottom right there on that, that revival. 
Um, and then, yeah, we have some other activities uh, going on, that bottom project there specifically around um, hearing histories of the Western Pilbara um, interlinked with the work of Andrew Dowding, who I mentioned before, one of our PhD students, um, looking at the uh, intangible intangible cultural heritage values of, uh, of Morajuka, usually just thought of as a, uh, as a site of uh, rich rock art. Uh, yeah, so thinking about what's next for us. Well, we're very much guided and inspired by a statement that Piney Linda Ford made at, um, at our very first symposium. Um, you don't burn country once or by yourself. That is one thing that the university can learn about engagement. Um, so with that, with that in mind, we, um, we go forward with a view to really continue our symposia uh, graduate training program and research to uh, firstly increase opportunities for expression of Indigenous arts in the university, to prioritise the authorities of elders and Indigenous artists in representations of Indigenous arts and arts knowledges, uh, and to prioritise the authorities of Indigenous artists and communities in what should be researched and how. Um, we'd like to conduct uh, in our fifth year um, a review of the review and assessment of our programs and community impact um, with a view to you know, just be, be learning from what we've done, be uh, getting some external um, feedback and uh, to really um, continue to build and enrich our programs. Um, we hope that all of this, the review and the continuation activities will contribute to our vision of centering Indigenous philosophies of practice in the academy and our key objectives of supporting and building Indigenous research and researchers in the arts, of conducting and promoting research that, pr promote, that produces knowledge about Indigenous arts practices and arts philosophies, of informing and demonstrating good practice in intercultural arts research, and contributing to a transformation of society through partnerships for Indigenous arts knowledges. So um, I'll leave it there. Um, and uh, I look forward to um, hearing of any uh, questions or dialogue. Thanks a lot, Sally. That was, uh, that was great. We're um, pushed right to the end of our time. There's a, a quick question here. I'll just in thinking about this and the, and the knowledge production angle, I, you know, I'd love to explore at some point in time and maybe in the next symposium, there's the crossover with other, I guess, what we would call academic traditions such as science and law and astronomy and all of these sorts of um, areas of knowledge that must be and are, as a jury jury dancers highlighted, um, produced and renegotiated through, through what we would call art and performance. There's a question here. Um, does the program have protocols, a cultural framework in relation to copyrights on sound music, dance ceremonies that are organised for public consumption, um, besides that of the mainstream Australian copyright protection? Are there other particular um, question, uh, copyright protections for the kind of um, things that you produce? Yeah, our approach has very much been that, that the activities are, are private. Uh, in, terms of a, in terms of cultural protocol, um, we've conceived of it and do, kind of documented this as a as a protocol, if you like, um, it's not formalized, but very much a notion of, of gifting, but gifting not as, well, you now have kind of freehold access to the item or knowledge that you've been gifted, but by in the, in the process of gifting, one is entering into a, into a relationship of accountability um, and how one carries that gift um, really determines um, whether one is conducting oneself in an appropriate way or not. Um, this is, you know, with permission, I cite there just the, from our Kimberley participants, um, a notion of Wunan in that, in that, um, that approach to responsibility. Um, but very much, like I said, just at the beginning of my response, the, the idea is that these, these practices have been conducted kind of in, in private. We, we do have documentation. But at, at the moment, it's just held as kind of like access only, and, and really, it's the it's the possession of the of the participant that created it. Um, one of our current initiatives is to work with the uh, traditional uh, traditional knowledge licenses and labels, um, and revisiting each of our participants over the years to to think about um, 
about what whether whether that's a framework that they may wish to attribute to their work with a view to to making some materials um, shareable and uh, accessible to others. But at the moment, we our attention has been primarily on on the action um, and ensuring that we're keeping things uh, safe for um, for future um, planning really around that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, thanks a lot, Sally. It's uh, comforting to know. So we're out of time there. We are we're hitting just over five minutes behind schedule, which is good. Realised we had uh, an extra ten minutes built into the the run sheet here, so that's allowed us to catch up. We'll adjourn now for lunch, and I thank everybody in that session. It was a really amazing and informative and and broad session. Um, the lunch break will go until 1.30 Melbourne time or East Australian Standard Time. So that's 55 minutes for those who aren't in Melbourne. Um, we'll reconvene at 1.30 p.m. Melbourne time where Narek, Carol and Briggs and Professor Barry Judd will kick off the third session for the day and another fantastic session. I'll see you then and thank you to everyone again for who contributed to that session. Welcome back, everyone, and to the third session of the inaugural Indigenous Knowledge Institute International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples Symposium. We've had two amazing sessions so far, and this one is no doubt going to be as equally amazing. Just as a reminder that this year's theme and a number of talks and presentations of touch on this is leaving no one behind indigenous peoples and the call for a new social contract i'm really pleased to announce the two people who will be taking this next spot speaking for about 30 minutes first is professor barry judd <clears throat> who is the director of the indigenous of indigenous studies at the university of melbourne he was awarded his phd by monash in 2007 his thesis, Australian Game, Australian Identity, Post-Colonial Identity in Football, explored formations of identity in the sport of Australian rules football. He's joined by Nawi Carolyn Briggs, a Boongwurrung senior elder and chairperson and founder of the Boongwurrung Foundation, a descendant of the First Peoples of Melbourne, the Yalluk Ut Wheelam clan of Boonwurrung. She is a great granddaughter of Louisa Briggs, a Boonwurrung woman born near Melbourne in the 1830s. Carolyn has been involved in developing and supporting opportunities for Indigenous youth and Boonwurrung culture for over 40 years. In 2005, she established the Boonwurrung Foundation, which has been responsible for significant work in cultural research, including restoration of the Boonwurrung language, the foundation also helps connect Aboriginal youth to their heritage. So I'm really excited to hand over to Barry and Nawek Carolyn for this next talk. Hi. Uh, a real honour and a pleasure to be invited here today to uh, interview Nawek, Ani Carolyn Briggs. Ruth. Um, Many people will know Ani Carolyn as a Boonwurrung elder, uh, but she's actually here Ruth. today to speak to us as a fellow uh, researcher, fellow PhD uh, graduate and an elder uh, within the Victorian higher education system. Uh, one thing that I really admire uh, about Ani Carolyn is her dedication over many decades to the support of Indigenous people in higher education. And I know that uh, over those decades, she has done much work uh, behind the scenes in just about every uh, university uh, there is in this state um, and has a, a history of working in the sector that goes back to the 1970s to Monash University, where I um, graduated with my PhD. So, Annie Carolyn 
is a significant figure um, in terms of the history of Indigenous higher education. And um, she's here today to help celebrate that fact. Uh, recently, she gained her own PhD from RMIT University. And this session uh, today between the two of us is a Q&A session. It's very informal. It's not a formal paper session like many of the other presentations might have been. So I'm going to simply run it as if it's a chat between uh, two people who have known each other for a couple of decades now and both have PhDs and who are both highly committed to uh, Indigenous research and Indigenous student support activities within higher education. So, Ani Carolyn, you describe your study broadly as defining my role as an elder and how the transmission of that knowledge to urban youth demands all resources available. This included mapping, recordings, documentation and language. Uh, this also involved having a certain understanding of country and defining society and what belonging means. So my first question for you is, why did you choose that particular topic and what kind of conclusions or re recommendations or findings emerge from your PhD uh, studies? Well, it was, it was, a, it was a, a big challenge when I think about it because um, I didn't be believe at that stage I had enough references because I was, I was entering into doing my master's at Swinburne. I started off talking about doing a master's when our um, pre presentation at um, Melbourne Uni, but somehow I got a position over at Swinburne and that's where the opportunity came about when I was looking at the knowledge base that I'd built over the years, as you stated, it was about art and design and it was it was um, design anthropology and they wanted me to lecture in it, but they were also preparing me to do my master's as well. So I presented my um, first uh, to the, the committee and they stated that this was more than a master's, this was a PhD, which threw me into a, another oh, my goodness, I just wanted to know how to do a master's, you know. Now I have to do something that is relevant for what I needed to do, and that was the importance of identifying and recognising elders' knowledges. So that's what led, because people tend to call you auntie and giving you that status, but it's more than a role as the word auntie and what auntie re represents. And I remember the early public servants used to say, oh, when we're old, we call our old people auntie. But auntie brings a lot of responsibilities, and I think that's what I needed to address. What were those responsibilities when you're providing information back to your communities or you're, you're recognised in the community as an elder? And what is an elder? And what is the responsibility of an elder? And who I could only model myself on was looking at old knowledge or old documents, looking at remembering my own stories, because when you grow up, you never question. You never question about who you were, how you belonged. You just knew families, you know, and you just remember meeting people and they'd be calling my mother, auntie, and I've gone, oh, there must be more relatives in my naive sense of my early years. And um, But it became, when my mother passed in 1970, the need to know what it meant to be for Indigenous, Aboriginal, 
curry, whatever, whatever label they were putting on us. And that was, and I think working with Professor Colin Burke, it was sort of, he came in that period of time. It's, well, what did it mean being an Aboriginal? What did it mean? I just thought I was a kid growing up in a system that you knew there was boundaries, but you didn't understand what those boundaries meant till because of 67 referendum. And my old people had lived under that. I didn't realise I lived under those two acts. So I had to look back at those two acts that I lived under, the protection acts. And that was a bit of a rude awakening. And then it was another awakening that Aboriginal people could be in institutions like Monash and, um, and listening to the speakers of that time who were, who, who were the early activists, it sort of made me aware of what was going on in this continent and what was, how we were marginalised and then I had to understand why we were marginalised. I didn't. I knew we had to obey rules and I thought that was for everybody, but it was for a particular group like ourselves. So that was something I needed to research, look at, understand the people what were presenting papers or talking about in, um, constitutions. <laughs> My world certainly, certainly woke up to a lot of information that I was quite naive about, but I was I was because I was very protected in a way that my mum obeyed the rules that we were assimilating into a system that that was very relevant for us at that stage, relevant for her not to lose her children. It was relevant for her to make sure that I had some knowledge and I always grew up around my family. We went from Naya West to Moolaman to Maui. So my father got work. So there was a mobilisation of a lot of Indigenous people that was for work. But they all had a connection with my mum. So it was something... And then the rude awakening came when they started labelling me and I couldn't understand that. And I thought, well, I'm not a black fella because <laughs> I had a different image of what a black fella was. So I thought, oh, the people who were calling my mother were black fellas. And I thought, well, they're just like my relatives. So it was all this conflict and confusion and growing up and then having to challenge that and PhD did that and but my working and seeing how people were being marginalized soon awakened a lot of impact even not having a good education at that stage working in factories being abused being called names um, soon toughened me up and always looking for that avenue out because my mother used to say white people, their learning is in books. Ours was about storytelling. So if you want to be as, to you, as good as your white counterpart, you have to go and keep building your educational needs in the Western system. So it took me a long time and then I had the opportunity working with Colin Burke and Reg Blow at that stage and, and in between that I did mothercraft and childcare in the evening and that gave me more skills of working and understanding children's development. So it was all of those processes and then realising a lot of our community members the lack of educational skill, you know, Western educational skills, but they had other knowledges. And the knowledges that reminded me of that was when we could connect with each other 
So when I was working in Dandenong, I could connect with family groups who had moved down from Dineliquin, who was from my grandmother's side. So it was always that reaffirming who I was, how I fitted, the strength of my family's knowledge, the kinship or the relationship with each other was very important to keep building that relationship or that assets of knowledge and realising those opportunities could be afforded to me and I took them and, and then they set up neighbourhood houses where you could do studies. I tried to go back to high school, realised I'd missed a chunk of my learning. So going into a neighbourhood house, learning to write, because <laughs> I dropped out in year eight. And um, hmm. so that's where it was. And that's why opportunities of building skills, listening to other Indigenous people who had gone through those processes, so mine was about listening, learning, being observant in and around communities. So it was a different way of learning, but it was an Indigenous way of learning. The old people give you skills was the way of understanding the way I transitioned through the bush, how I transitioned about food, the importance of language, how we started to borrow other cultures, languages, so that we had a point of difference to, to, to identify ourselves as blackfellas that could speak a language or how we coded, how we learnt to code, to keep demonstrating that point of difference. So that was led me on. And when they, I thought I could do a master's because I, I'm teaching master's students I could do this and then I started writing it all up and then they said no do a PhD it just threw me back into another spin like I said before so the hard work is that I collected a lot of information stories old people validating their knowledge that they were sharing with me and re remapping the stories of my ancestors, how they were taken to Tasmania, or oh, not Tasmania as such, to an island just off Preservation Island, uh, Gun Carriage Island, and how they came back, how she had a husband who was Tasmanian, and going over there, trying to track those people down in the 60s, but they weren't there, so... I didn't realise they were on other islands. Um, what was it? Uh, they were on Flinders Island and um, Cape Barren. So when I went to Tassie, there wasn't many people who had identified as such. And then I met up with, um, he was a lecturer at um, Tasmanian University. I think he became the um, grandfather of permaculture. And, he, and I used to talk to him a lot about his research. And I said, some of this information is a bit wrong. And he said, yes, a lot, of, a lot of the people didn't know who they were or their heritage of who they were because of the sealing and whaling industry. So that was um, Professor Bill, Phil, Bill Mollison. Then I went and seen the guy what does phonology and I thought, I wonder how he measures me in the skull. So it was always this wondering and not knowing how to ask the question. So a lot of that was because I've been conditioned not to ask questions. You just observe, see how the learning process is. And then it was about, when I was doing that PhD, it was a lot of drawing on a lot of knowledges from my Cousins who are in their 90s, they're 96, they had memories that passed that I didn't have. My brother had memories, but I wasn't quite there at that stage for him to give me. He gave it to my son, not me. Honey, Carolyn, can I be very uh, rude um, and ask a question at this point in time? Yes, so I'd like you to because I'll end up 
getting off your I think you're describing uh, key differences between what we've come to know as Indigenous knowledges and the way that um, Western knowledge operates through institutions like universities. And uh, you you came to complete your PhD in your 70s, um, build on a lifetime of learning and experience uh, of the type you've just described to us. Um, can I ask a question about um, the methodological problems or the institutional problems that you may have encountered as somebody who wanted to do a PhD based on that lifetime of learning in your own community and outside of the institutional context? What, what kind of um, pitfalls, I guess, or... or um, problematic situations perhaps did you face in being someone with elder status coming into a university um, in midlife um, to complete this qualification? So when I was looking at that, I had spoken to another Indigenous person who said um, you're putting a lot of stress on yourself maybe you need to be looking at um, doing your PhD in understanding writing down what you were doing and it was um, Peters young uh, Peters what works out at um, RMI uh, not our Swinburne and because I knew all his family so it was he was saying look at the way you're telling your story because it's oral tradition. So you're working from the premise of developing a structure in oral tradition, but you have to frame it into a Western paradigm <laughs> to keep your boundaries um, moving. So the methodology was the big challenge for me. How do I put something that is transitioning from an oral to a Western model? And I had, where I was working with Dory Tunstall, understood that because she was filling my head about the early writers, blacker writers in America. So I was getting all of that scaffolding of that knowledge and thought, well, how could I tell the story? So it was telling a story about my journey as growing up in a very strong family my Napa kept us together on his property. Um, so I had to retrace a lot of the memories that my mother, in, but there was a lot of genealogical stuff that she gave me, but also stories that she filled my head with. And differently that I couldn't expose her but I just thought it was normal that family and parents give you stories, and but it wasn't the same as what I'd be learning in school, because we were seen as the the objects of the other. And um, listening to Maori people, thinking about how they told their stories from an oral tradition. So I had to. I was very fortunate to have moment of a time with Linda Tuaway Smith. And then Dory Tarnstall, and then she left to go to America or Canada, and then I got Olivia. So it was a challenge for Olivia, and I just kept writing. <laughs> I just kept writing and helping her helping me frame it in a way that staging it. So that's how that methodological, I challenged it. I challenged the... Um, the academic structure, but I was able to, it was able to fit the academic framework somehow um, through her helping me sculpture it into a model, um, talking with others, talking to other relatives, and making sure I was on the same track. 
So for me, it was a big challenge, and I think they didn't know how to question me on it, even though I put a lot of evidence into it of what old records I could match it up with. Because you, with you, when you're doing setting the model, you had nothing to model it unless I looked at whoever done oral traditions, and I couldn't find anybody who had done that. So I just kept moving through sculpture. I was scaffolding my process into a way that there was a lot of reflections and memories and how do you impact in that memory space of my life, my life, and how policies had guided me, looking at policy and what influenced the way I I operated in within my system or my family system, how I operated in Indigenous knowledge systems, validating the people who had scaffold my learning process by stories, always stories. Everything was about stories of place, how I, I felt I was able to fit into place, how I fit into the role of an elder. I was recognised as an elder. And then I thought, how do I transition that knowledge using... I had to look at ways I could share that knowledge. And the way I could share that knowledge is through storytelling, creating stories, um, the rigours of those stories and doing some background information so it made sense to the listener. Um, it, getting people to have that experiential ways of knowing or that epistemology of the two ways of knowing and getting people to understand that that is what makes who you are and that consciousness that you bring. So I was always rigorous about the consciousness of what I was sharing and being conscious of that. But it was also validating the people who had been a part of my life and my growing years so thank you Annie Carolyn we're running out of time and oh. I, I just want to prompt you with one final question perhaps and that is um, as a result of your PhD uh, were you able to to come up with something concrete about what it means to be an elder in an urban environment and, and perhaps what Indigenous youth in an in urban environment like Melbourne uh, require from someone like you? Well, you challenge yourself on that thing about the outcome of that research was to, well, I was one, I was, it's inherited. You're scaffold through your years to take on that role and responsibility. You don't realise it at this time. Um, and then it was validated by your community because I realised a lot of the community members when I was put through at the rigour of three judges questioning me about my heritage and my identity and then validating that information however they do it, that three judges, I mean three white judges having to, to examine your existence or your background that validated that you were recognised as the holder of knowledge. So I would say I was a holder of the knowledge and what constituted that holding of that knowledge. So it is that thing of epistemologies, of understanding how you fit within your society. So it is a what I think anthropologists would put it up, what is the polity of your what makes your society, but also the nodal, the nodal of that you have continued to express your knowledge through 
the continuance of what makes your society in your family structure of identity, I think, I believe. I'm just coming to terms with a lot of that information because it's another discipline like anthropology, but it's about the history, my own history. It's about the rigour that you have to understand where you fit in the society and the content of what scaffolds your learning process. So using modern technology is a way that I understood how I could share it in the way young people learn today. But I also, I was very fortunate to have a lot of people invest in me that scaffold my process in the learning of Indigenous knowledges and, valid, and, and validating that knowledge because it's my knowledge. It's what makes me who I am and at what a lot of people, our old people, would had invested that part of that knowledge into me as well. So I'm speaking on lots of people's voices, but my own impact that they contributed to that process as well, whether it be in food, whether it be in language, whether it be in just being a part of something that is a pretty amazing human being about this, the people that have been present in this landscape through their transmitting of knowledges. So I was looking at different ways I could transmit that knowledge through storytelling, through producing books, through um, new mediums like um, augmented realities or things that, which I love learning through, design, which I'm loving too as well. So I'm working with architectural design students, getting them to revision the landscape. Um, everything's been a whole learning for me. So it's a, a reciprocity. It's about a reciprocity. And it's what I've been given, what I want to give back to the next generation. We'll, we'll may carry it forward to build who they are because it just doesn't come along. You just can't construct this person. The person is built from so many other things that went before them. Thank you. That's a, a wonderful answer. And um, unless I'm mistaken, I think we are three minutes over time. Uh, we were allocated half an hour. Um, so I really uh, thank you, Annie Carolyn, uh, for coming along today and to speaking about these issues. I know that um, they're issues that are central to the Indigenous Knowledges Institute at the University of Melbourne. Um, working through uh, these issues of where ind Indigenous knowledge might fit in an institution like ours is the reason why the Institute was established in the first place. So um, thank you again for taking some time out of your day to join us. Thank you, Barry. And I hope that helps somewhere because it was, it's, it's not in an academic framework. It was very much about my life and understanding how I played out in this world that we play in now. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. But there's a lot of people, older people like me, that we can unpack and bring them forward because I think it's very important because you will lose that unless there's academics out there writing about us but really don't have the sense of what what it's about to live have that lived experience. Thank mm. you. And thank, thank you. you to all the audience out there in the international day that is about Indigenous knowledges. Thank you. Nungujin. Thanks so much, Anna Carolyn. That was amazing. And Barry for, for providing the questions. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. If there's, if there's something that we could maybe uh, call as a universality in, in Indigenous knowledge is that it's it's negotiated in place in a reciprocal manner. So I think that, you know, you're, you're deep, thank you very much for your deeply personal story. And I think that's exactly what we, we are trying to do, Barry, and, and what 
really glad for the contribution to this day. Thank you very much. I'll move on now to the next speaker in this middle session, who is, which is Associate Professor Dwayne Hamaker. Dwayne is a cultural astronomer in the Astro 3D Centre of Excellence and the School of Physics at the University of Melbourne. His work specialises in the intersection of astronomy with culture, heritage, history and society. He earned, a, he earned graduate degrees in astrophysics and the social sciences and is leading initiatives in Indigenous astron astronomy and dark sky studies. Thanks a lot, Dwayne. Thanks, Michael Sean. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for um, inviting me to come present today. Um, I'm sitting here in Bunurong country over in the inner west, so I'd like to acknowledge where I am and to pay respects to elders past and present. And it's always great to hear from everybody here, um, especially great to hear from Mandy Carolyn. About 13 years ago, I began working in this space on Indigenous astronomy, and it's been a pretty tremendous journey since then. Um, it's been a lot of uh, learning experiences for someone like me, an American trained in physics who's come over to Australia and you know, immersed themselves in, into a world very foreign to me. Um, but I've, I've been working primarily with communities on the East Coast and in particular in the Torres Strait where I began working uh, about 2013 under the guidance of Professor Martin Nakata. And the initial project was to go work for the elders up on the island of Mare or Mary Island to document traditional star knowledge uh, guided by the elders, of course, by the communities and their desires and to find a range of applications that were guided by the community. And it's been quite an interesting journey over that time because we've found a lot of fantastic applications and outcomes with this. Some things the community was expecting and some things they weren't expecting, but were very happy with. Most of the work that I do, because I'm such an outsider to so much of this world of indigenous knowledges, my, my role in all of this has been to help document the star knowledge. Um, and it, it's very useful to have a background in astronomy and astrophysics. And part of that in, in incorporates working with communities um, where the star knowledge has been fragmented quite significantly. And it involves working with all the different sources of information to try to reconstruct as best we can what that knowledge was once uh, like pre-invasion. Of course, we're never going to completely get there, but we do as much as we can, and we are as rigorous as possible. That's a process that, of course, is guided and directed in constant collaboration with the communities. In places like the Torres Strait, the star knowledge is still very strong, and the elders do say that less of it is being passed down because one thing is the schools on most of the islands only go to about year six. So when the students leave the island to finish high school, go to uni, get a job, there aren't always a lot of economic benefits to coming back. And when, when youth don't come back to the island, they're not quite learning the same amount of knowledge as they were before. Um, that's also tied in with the language. So the elders with me on Mare really wanted to find ways that we could document the star knowledge and generate that into educational curricula and outcomes for the students, but also for the people around the world, because they wanted this knowledge to be shared on a global scale. And in particular, my focus has been on looking at the scientific information within this. So as we all know, indigenous knowledge contains quite a significant layer of science. And that is something that is not generally recognized in the public or even academia. And that's been one of my main focus areas. Uh, there's so many ways we could go about doing that, but I utilize my, my particular background in astronomy to try to fill in that specific gap. And of the outcomes that we've been working on with the elders, one that will be coming out early next year is a new trade book on indigenous astronomy, the science of indigenous astronomy, that'll be co-authored with six elders and knowledge holders. And this focuses not entirely on the Torres Strait, although the Torres Strait is quite heavily um, involved in the content, but it is on a global scale. And I've worked with um, some knowledge elders and knowledge holders around the world on that. So what I wanted to talk a little bit about today was what is some of this science behind it and, and what are some of the outcomes that we've produced from it? 
Well, when we talk about science or scientists, we have to talk about well, what's an astronomer? What does astronomy mean? And at its core foundation, science is about understanding the world around us. It can be done through observation and deduction, experimentation, um, direct application. All of these things give science its, its very foundations. And when it comes to astronomy, that's understanding everything that's in the sky. But as every elder that I've ever learned from has said, every single one, everything on the land is reflected in the sky. Uh, the sky serves as a map, as a law book, as a textbook, as uh, everything. It's, it's all encompassing. So when we're looking at this idea of, well, what is an astronomer? It's kind of a narrow way of thinking of it in the Western framework. But there are the roles of astronomers, the people who study the stars, the people whose job within a community or society, it is to observe all the changes and the positions and properties of the stars. And this is something that the elders refer to as reading the stars. And in the Torres Strait there, and as well as many other parts of the world, there are traditional astronomers. In the Western Torres Strait, this person is called Zugabo Mabaig. Uh, Zugabo refers to a, a star person, it would be something I'll talk about in a minute and Mabaig means man or person. So quite literally, it means star man or star person. And this person, when they were um, educated in the quad, which is sort of like an, a university, uh, for a period of seven years, they were taught all the traditional and sacred knowledge about the movements of all the celestial bodies, but not just the movements of the celestial bodies, but what that can tell you, what the direct applications are for that, and how it relates to everything on the land, because the two cannot be separated. So the positions of the stars and their changing positions throughout the year inform the people about changing seasons, about the behaviors of plants and animals, weather and climate. And there's a whole range of different time scales that this is measured and observed from. And these time scales go on a whole range. Uh, it's, it's like a giant Venn diagram. And it's finding those crossover points that are going to give you the information you need. So, this, this artwork is from David Bozen, whose father was a Zugabo Mabaik, and he is one of the um, champions of the lino cut print design, which is what you see here, um, along with a few others like Tommy Powell and Glenn Mackey and Brian Robinson. Uh, they really pioneered this sort of newer form of, of art. And in here, the Zugabo Mabaik, this particular one that he's speaking about is, is commanding two particular groups of stars. Um, that he's directly socially connected to. And the information that's passed on is done, through, done so through the warp. And that's the hourglass shaped drum you see just behind him. So it's that that's passing on of knowledge through song and through dance and through old tradition um, that keeps this knowledge, this very ancient knowledge living and thriving today. So we can look at some of the larger ideas about the knowledge itself and this these, these motifs, these ideas are very widespread across the straits. Um, the story of Tagai is one of the most common and it's one of the most important that informs the traditional laws and practices of people in the straits. And the base story of that was that Tagai was a, a spiritual being, a very powerful, fierce warrior, fisherman, you name it, they did it. Um, he commanded a crew of men called the Zugables. Uh, that's more the, the Western Islands and the Eastern Islands. They didn't have a specific name for them as a collective. Uh, and his first mate, Kareg. Um, and versions of the tradition talk about them going on a large expedition and not having much success. So while Tagai went onto a reef to find a better spot that they could fish and hunt, the, the crew consumed all of the rations. Um, against the advice of Kareg and Tagai. When Tagai returned, he found out he killed the 12 crew members into two groups of six, saving Kareg. Kareg was variously described as his, his brother, his first, uh, first mate. And they all ascended into the sky and it's their positions and orientation in the sky throughout the year that dictate and inform the changing of seasons, the changing of the behaviors of the plants and the animals. Um, whether it's fishing, hunting, agriculture, whatever it happens to be, all of that knowledge is guided by the stars of Tagai. And this 
particular motif here, you can see the left hand of Tog. I, I realize not many of you may know a lot about astronomy, um, but that left hand of his on the bottom center is the Southern Cross. And his right hand is Corvus the Crow, the Western constellation Corvus. And the stars in the sky represent the different parts of his body. And he's standing on the canoe, which is traced up by the stars in Scorpius. And Kareg, his first mate, is the star Antares. Now, Tagai placed the crew, which he calls Usium and Seg, on the opposite side of the sky. They're in Orion's belt and scabbard and the stars of the Pleiades. So they're on polar opposite sides of the sky, which is interesting because you find similarities in narratives from different cultures around the world. And this is one that is pretty widespread. In ancient Greece, it was Orion and the scorpion battling each other and the gods putting them on opposite sides of the sky to keep them away from each other. So you can see that, um, that Tagai is something that, well, I'm sorry, this motif is actually um, the logo for the Tagai State College, which is the school system across the Torres Strait. So the changing positions of these stars inform people on everything that's happening in the world around them. And how we're working on sharing that publicly now is developing that into curriculum, to planetarium and observatory programs, into museum programs. And we're doing this in collaboration with the elders through the traditional knowledge and in collaboration with the artists who are putting this literally onto canvas. It's, it's bringing the world of the tangible and the intangible together. So here's a series of artworks that were put together by Robert Tommy Powell, who is a, a Marian man from Arab. And a lot of his artworks focus on these different aspects of calendars and knowledge that are tied to specific stars, but all of these star groups, they all link together. So this here is one of the seg and how Tagai is bringing them across the sky. And there's so many layers to it, we can't go into all of that. But it, it does show how everything is interconnected. Um, and then we look at the Usium, who were skewered and placed in the sky as the star cluster called the Pleiades. So what we've done with some of these outcomes in, in the ways we conceptualize the knowledge that's been shared by the elders is we've guided some planetarium programs. We've, uh, so at the Brisbane Planetarium, there's a 13 meter by one and a half meter permanent exhibition called Skylore. And that features knowledge from Miriam on Mare, uh, mostly through Uncle Ilo Topham, through Uwalyi, through Uncle Gilar Michael Anderson, and through Wadaman, through Uncle Bill Edom Ben Maharney. And each of these feature different elements of traditional astronomy. And when I say astronomy, I'm really referring to the science of it, as opposed to star knowledge, which can be thought of in a more broad context. But it does really focus on the astronomy. It shows how different properties of the stars uh, changing over time or positions of those stars changing over time can be utilized to understand the atmospheric conditions, um, the seasonal changing of, of climates and trade winds and ocean currents. And this is really important because it is a way to get the people in the public to understand and directly see how this knowledge has so many layers of science encoded within it. And when we look at this intersection between Western astronomy and indigenous astronomy, in this case, the Torres Strait, it's a great anchor point because astronomy is arguably probably the most popular of all the sciences. It's one of the most, you know, it gets people really awe-inspired. And it's one that has a tremendous amount of, of prestige associated with it. So when you bring in indigenous knowledge and you tie it to astronomy, it has that benefit and it explains one of the reasons why indigenous astronomy is so absolutely wildly popular within the public and why so many people um, are able to connect with this in a way that people can obviously connect with all the other sciences with traditional knowledge, but this is one that seems to have a really deep profound impact. Um, in some ways, even more than the other areas of science. That's not meant to disparage any of them, of course, because they're all integrated, they're all part of it. Um, when we talk about physics, physics is very much a part of this. And I know there have been academics and scholars and political pundits 
who have chastised the idea of Aboriginal physics or Aboriginal astronomy or Aboriginal mathematics or Aboriginal name of science. Um, and it comes from a deep level of misunderstanding about what those knowledge systems are and how they link together and how they tie in that knowledge. And the work that we're doing that's guided by the elders is a great way to demonstrate that and to share that with the public. It's also really important because it challenges the history and philosophy of science. And what I mean by that is the history of science and the philosophy of science obviously are very heavily dominated by Western discourse. And many of the attributions, um, I don't know what just happened there. Um, many of the attributions of Western science discoveries are actually made by indigenous uh, communities long before. So discussing the science behind them shows how the observations of variable stars or the synodic period of Venus or other astrophysical phenomena and ideas actually go back much further. They actually go back to um, before Western science knew about them. So this creates a, a larger narrative that is changing public perception about how we understand um, indigenous knowledges, at least with respect to science. And that's something that no doubt our ongoing work is going to continue challenging. And like anything else, when you challenge something, it's gonna get a lot of pushback, but that's part of the exciting aspect of it is you're not gonna change minds in the public without that sort of discourse. So we've uh, been working um, particularly with, with Professor Marcia Langton over the years to develop a national curriculum. We've included indigenous knowledge in commemorative coins. I know just about to go over time, so I'm just gonna rush through a couple of things and pass that up. Uh, one of them is Bays on the Shark, which are the stars of the Big Dipper. What I know is the Big Dipper being from North America. Um, we had a series of commemorative coins released by the Royal Australian Mint. Um, one on the emu in the sky from uh, Wiradjuri country, one from the Pleiades in Yemenji, Wajari country, and one of Bazom, which is the shark in the Eastern Torres Strait. This coin was one of the fastest selling coins in the mint's history. This was also done by Uncle Sigar Passi. The coin completely sold out in less than two hours. So it was a pretty tremendous feat and one that Uncle Sigar has been very pleased with. And some of the other expectations or outcomes of this that the elders didn't quite expect were um, asteroid names, for example. We had a few asteroids named after um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander academics, uh, elders, and even the entire Merriam community. So that's something that we've been able to um, work with the elders on doing. And I was told that when I had some certificates printed, framed, and shipped up to, to Mayor, that the community held a very special ceremony and that Uncle Seagar um, was, was very, very chuffed, as they say, to receive his asteroid name, um, which got a lot of media press. So this public perception, these public links, this public visibility and optics of indigenous astronomy is one that is having a very substantial positive benefit and outcome, um, as well as the other outcomes of curriculum, calendars, educational tools, and even, you know, even uh, documentaries with filmmakers like Brenner Herzog, which we, we had here. I think I'm probably just about to go over time. Um, if I've got a minute, I'd like to show this little clip, but if I don't, I'm fine with that and we can move on. All right, go for it, mate. Okay, great. So what, what this is, is a couple of years ago, we filmed a clip for a Brenner Herzog film on meteors and asteroids called Fireball. Messengers from Darker Worlds. The film starts off in Gondamalala, Wolf Creek Crater in Western Australia, and it ends with the Mayer, the shooting star dance here in the Torres Strait. What you're seeing on here is the first time these dancers have ever done the dance. Um, they only learned it the afternoon that we were filming it. Um, Uncle Alo taught them this dance. And even though this dance comes from Mare, it's the first time it had been performed on the island in 50 years. So these are some behind the scenes images of it. Fast forward a little bit.
So I'm going to go ahead and stop it there. But a very, very quick recap is a Maillard is a very, very bright shooting star, a very bright meteor, what astronomers call a fireball. And this is the soul of someone who has passed away going to beg the land of the dead or returning home. And all the different properties of that fireball, of that Maillard, tell you different things about that person and about their journey. So it was a great way to end the film. So if you get an opportunity, it's called Fireball Messengers from Darker Worlds by Clive Oppenheimer and Werner Herzog. And it is the um, scene that wraps the film up. But thank you very much for having me on today. Thanks a lot, Dwayne. It's uh, really, really powerful stuff. We've, we are pushing a bit over time, so we, we'll move on without questions. The, your reflection, though, on, on the seriousness with which um, Western science or, or the public take star knowledge, particularly Indigenous star knowledge, is, really echoes some of the sentiments of, of the Western knowledge system's push to decouple scientific endeavours from culture, which I think really robs and erodes a lot of the meaning and significance of, of the things that we do. So it's a really nice illustration there. Thank you very much. I'll um, move on to our next talk, which takes us back out of Australia and into Indonesia at this time uh, by Dr. Justin Wijak. Uh, Justin is an Indigenous ethnographer from the eastern Indonesian island of Lambata. He currently teaches in the Indonesian Studies Program at the University of Melbourne. Justin has studied philosophy in Indonesia and theology and anthropology in Melbourne. For his PhD in 2017 at the University of Melbourne, he undertook an autoethnographic analysis of cultures of fear amongst Eastern Indonesian Catholics. By exploring the feelings of fear triggered by an Indonesian propaganda text contained within the killings of communists in Indonesia in 1965-1966. He argued that Eastern Indonesian Catholic experiences of fear are simultaneously secular, religious and supernatural. Justin's going to talk to us today about uh, indigeneity in Indonesia. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to the Indigenous Knowledge uh, Institute, IKI uh, team, who has organized this uh, symposium uh, to celebrate the International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples. I would like to acknowledge uh, all the Indigenous communities around the world, past and present, who, despite many challenges, including the challenges of modernity and globalization, have continued to maintain the cultural traditions, their stories, languages, rituals and ceremonies, beliefs and epistemologies. All these are fundamental and together have constructed and reconstructed their shared identity. The critical question here is how do we as a global community help to ensure that those indigenous communities around the world maintain their traditions, stories, languages, rituals and ceremonies, beliefs and epistemologies in the midst of rapid globalization and modernity. For me, the recent establishment of Iki in this university is a response to the call or to the question. Ike's presence is to ensure that the important aspects of indigeneity are maintained by documenting the stories and practices about the spiritualities, knowledges, and wisdoms. In this short presentation, I will share with you some stories from my indigenous community that I am researching through Iki this year. However, before I do that, I would like to quickly show you the map of Indonesia and my home island where the research of my team on indigenous knowledge of traditional medicines and food is situated. 
I have four slides to show you. Yeah. So you can see here the first one, the first slide is the map of Indonesia. And then the second slide is the map of the province of Nusa Tenggara Timur or East, Southeast Nusa Tenggara, um, where I come from. And the third slide is, um, is the, um, the map of the, some of the islands in the region. Yeah. Um, and the last one, the last slide, the fourth slide is uh, uh, the island uh, of Lambada, where I was born and raised. Yeah. Okay. Um, as we have seen in the map, Indonesia is uh, an archipelagic nation state. There are over 17,000 islands, including the five major islands of Java, Sumatra, Kalimantan, previously Borneo, Sulawesi, used to be called Celebes, and Papua, or Irian Jaya, during President Suharto's time in office. The total population is huge. It is now over 270 million. The government family planning program in Indonesia called Program Keluarga Berencana has helped to manage the fertility rate in the country over the years since the 1970s. According to the family planning policy, its family of public servants in particular is recommended to have only two children. This two children policy can be a challenge particularly to some indigenous communities who live from agriculture. Traditionally, it was a need for the local farmers on the island to have many children, at least four for land cultivation, to carry on the clan name or namasuku in Indonesian, especially for boys and to take care of their elderly parents. In fact, we do have a saying in Indonesian, banyak anak, banyak rezeki, many children, much fortune. Ethnically and linguistically, there are hundreds of ethnic groups and indigenous languages spread through thousands of islands. It should be noted, however, over 50% of the indigenous languages in Indonesia are actually found in Papua or the Melanesian region that includes the islands where I come from. However, most languages have been shifted, if not completely lost, mainly due to the project of nationalization of identity using Indonesian language as a means or a force of unification, if not for uniformizing purpose. This can of course represent a challenge for indigenous languages and their stories in the country. We all know there is always a need for stories to be told in certain ways and languages. Stories are just about the content of substance, but also about how they are told because stories from my indigenous perspective are always sacred and powerful. Stories about something such as about traditional healing can be told by the ancestral spirits through dreams with clear instructions as to where to find and how to use certain medicines for healing purposes. In the following, I will tell you a story about how to respond to the outbreak of COVID-19 in the indigenous community of Baolangu, Lembata, Eastern Indonesia, as an illustration. In 2020, the indigenous community of Baolangu held a ceremony or ritual called Nawu Warat. Nawu is a word which means to take someone or something to a place out of the community. And warat is a noun which means strong winds. 
In this context, the word winds has a negative connotation referring to disaster, disease, illness, pandemic that needs to be sent away out of the community. COVID-19 is seen as a bad, as bad means coming from outside to threaten the lives of the community. This threatening energy or force must be blocked or prevented so it does not enter the community. So one morning in April 2020, several community elders performed the ritual at the gate of the village of Bolang to basically tell the deans to go or to blow outside the village and not into the village. The ritual was conducted due to the advice by a traditional healer locally known as Molan, who received the instruction from ancestral spirits through a dream. Dream is an important medium where a lot of important knowledge and stories are shared. According to the locals, COVID-19 is stated in the local language, nanede na awe mata, na awe mata. Nanin enaku eni yang kalau takuna jaga awe mata ale, dere na serangi jane. Ketite mesti ta jaga tutup awe mata sa, be COVID-19 na dorik sabaye. My translation is, uh, COVID-19 has a face and eyes. It can see anyone who doesn't look after himself or herself will be attacked. So we must cover our face so COVID-19 doesn't follow us. What I've just shared is just a story about a local ritual or ceremony performed in the village of Baolang in response to the outbreak of COVID-19. In Bali and elsewhere in Indonesia, similar protection rituals have also been performed. One thing I have learned from the story is that indigenous communities, as in the case of Indonesia, always have a way to respond together to natural disasters, diseases and illness, viruses and pandemics. They aren't left to deal with anything bad alone and in loneliness. A community-based approach and solutions are key. In addition to the Nawuwarat ritual, the local community also began to implement checkpoints to restrict the entry of outsiders into the community, which support the COVID safe restrictions imposed by the local government. The community dealt with the threat of COVID-19 in supernatural and physical ways together. It should be noted, there have been no COVID cases in the community of Baolang. The question is, how can the beautiful, beautiful communal beliefs and practices be maintained in the face of challenges of rapid globalization and modernity? where individuality has become a value superior to commonality. Having posed the reflective rhetoric question, and my time for this talk has come to the end, I would like to conclude by saying thank you once again to the Indigenous Knowledge Institute for organizing this very important event to celebrate the International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples. It is indeed a day of celebration and reflection. To the Indigenous peoples around the world, I would like to also say thank you. Thank you for keeping all the beautiful things about our indigeneity, things that are so precious, our traditions, our stories, our languages, rituals and ceremonies, beliefs and epistemologies. They all need to be recognized and shared because they give us a true sense of connectedness with each other, with nature and with the supernatural. Thank you. Thanks so much, Justin. That was uh, really powerful. Um, I'll have a, a question if you if you have time.
Oh, I'm with, we're close to, to the time here. So the I find it really fascinating, the, um, the oral knowledge and stories that have been adapted or developed for this new pandemic. And I imagine the, it has recurred consistently throughout time, like you say, for national, natural disasters and other, other um, things that impact societies and communities. The <clears throat> main way of story transfer is oral. I assume in, in the communities you're talking about. Can you have any reflection on, on how oral traditions um, either make a knowledge system more resilient to change when compared with written traditions? Or do you feel that the, the opposite is true? Like, How does the oral transfer of knowledge and the transfer of knowledge in stories equip a community to uh, adapt to new situations? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's a very interesting question, uh, Michael. Um, yeah, um, what do we, I mean, the, the stories can also be told, uh, yeah, they're, they're told uh, orally, but also they are told through, um, through dances, also through singings. Yeah, and we do have uh, local songs, uh, traditional songs that basically tell those, those stories. Um, uh, and those songs are usually, uh, the stories are usually told and sung and danced yeah, uh, using the local local language and local local movements, unique, very unique, usually very unique movements. And um, now what we are trying to do or what I am trying to do with this uh, research is to um, uh, showcase, showcase those stories and to perhaps to try to, to start documenting them, to write them. Yeah. Um, uh, so, because I mean, uh, now I notice, I, uh, I observe that many um, local uh, uh, members of the community um, don't, don't seem to speak the local language very well. Yeah, so I think it is really important that uh, those stories are, are written, yeah, are documented in writing in Indonesian and also in local languages. Yeah, so they are lost. Yeah, that's a very, very, very important uh, aspect of it. I've often wondered whether we would have the debates that we have, you know, around various texts that are important, for example, the Bible or whatever it may be, if they weren't written, if they were stories. Stories seem more fluid, but in the, the counter position to that is in situations where stories are not told as much, they, they risk uh, being lost. And I think yeah. documenting them and recording them is is fundamentally important, you know, like you say. That's uh, really fascinating. Thank you, Justin. Um, lots to think about. We better move on to the next talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to introduce Eddie Kubillo for the next talk. Um, Eddie is from the law school. He's an Aboriginal man with strong family links in both urban and rural areas throughout the Northern Territory. He is of Larrakia and Wadjigan and Central Arante descent. Eddie has a Bachelor of Laws degree and was admitted to the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory. Throughout his career, Eddie has been involved with a number of organisations and causes, including the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Service and the Royal Commission into the Protection and Detention of Children in the Northern Territory. He recently submitted his PhD and is working at the University of Melbourne Law School as Associate Dean and Research Fellow and Senior Research Fellow in the Indigenous Programs. Thank you, Eddie. Um, yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, can I acknowledge the uh, Wurundjeri peoples of the uh, Kulin Nations and other nations in Victoria and all nations across the country? Um, as Michael pointed out, I'm a proud um, Northern Territory Aboriginal man, I'm, again, from the Larrakia, Wadjigan and Central Islander peoples. Um, and, and I must say that I'm proud of the resilience of our people and the capacity to, um, that they've endured the hardship and the fight for our recognition as first peoples of this nation. Um, from all the adversity our, our people continue to face, they continue to speak um, or regain our languages, culture and laws. Uh, 
And I, as we're talking about knowledge, indigenous knowledges, uh, I want to relate to people that I have, like most, um, more moved away from country for uh, work purposes, uh, to advocate for our people, uh, also as to um, equip ourselves with uh, skills and qualifications that non-Indigenous Australians respect. You know, from, in my case, uh, I've got a law degree, um, a master's in law, and uh, as I was said, I, I've been um, admitted as a practitioner in the Northern Territory, and I've recently submitted my uh, PhD examination. In saying that, I've also um, sent my kids away to arm themselves to become um, better educated, and both of them have uh, tertiary degrees, uh, so, so they can be prepared um, for the treatment our people confront daily and educate others on the uh, realities of being Indigenous. Um, but I want to stress that, you know, what we gain in non-Indigenous education from such institutions um, sees us lose uh, extremely valuable learnings from our families, um, our country, our culture, our language, and so on. Um, it, it is, you know, it appears that we are always giving uh, with not much in return. Um, and, 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 and I've seen over the years that it's like a balancing act with um, sometimes bring criticism from both sides, which, which has a huge impact on our, on our well-being. Um, so now that's the way I just wanted to um, start my discussion on the justice industry. And, and in doing so, I would like to tell a story which um, emphasises uh, the underlying systemic racism and how ingrained this bias is that um, in the, underpins the justice industry. And, and as such, um, speaks to the why. Um, it was, you know, back in 2002, uh, I was sitting in the front row of court, uh, a recently admitted lawyer, uh, waiting for proceedings to commence. I was really nervous. Um, it was a Monday morning, which meant, you know, the weekend offenders, which I knew many, um, were waiting to be heard. Uh, a court orderly approached and advised me that, that the, as the front row was for lawyers and I should move into the second row and sit directly behind my lawyer. Now, if we jump forward some 18 years later, um, I, I was sitting again in the same court, working on the Royal Commission into the protection and detention of children in the Northern Territory. You know, I was waiting for a client to finish, finish his matter so that we could follow up his evidence. Um, the room was empty except for um, some lawyers and, and this client. Uh, the lawyers had just given myself and, and my colleague a welcome nod as we both had worked um, together over many years in the, in the justice system up in, in the Territory. Um, and a court orderly on seeing us wander, wandered over, they, they again asked whether I was on today's court list and if I was in the right court. Um, and look, that, that's some, almost some 20 years later. And, and, but before I could reply, um, my colleague who also was Indigenous and, and a lawyer, um, you know, produced his um, Royal Commission ID and, um, and, you know, advised that we'd both be working on the Royal Commission. Now, I just want to highlight that these type of incidents aren't, aren't one out, you know, they, they are fairly regular when you're working in the justice system. Um, and and I, as an older gen gentleman now, I've, um, I've grandchildren and, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obligated to make sure um, their place in family, their connection to country and their cultural obligations um, it's not easy, you know, to do so in the current environment for Indigenous people to keep up with these challenges, um, to make sure that our kids learn the um, importance of our people, our land, our culture, our languages, when there's so much unjust negativity towards us and no willingness to respect our values and way of life. Um, you know, a good friend told me that um, her elder said to her when she started university, um, don't let your studies get in the way of your education. And, and this rings true to me, and I've always tried to incorporate all my practical learnings and experiences into my, either my writings and teachings. Um, so, so I just want to speak more about the justice industry. Um, recently, I wrote a piece for the, uh, the Alternative Law Journal. As, as uh, most Indigenous people know, April this year was the 30th anniversary of the um, tabling of the Royal Commission into our Aboriginal deaths in custody which I'll call Ricky Dick from here on. And for our people, things are worse than they've ever been when dealing with the justice industry. Um, can I ask to put that slide up, please? Um, I'm not sure if you can see that, but th those are the um, current stats that are, um, you know, shows where, where our people are at this time. Um, at the time of writing this piece, um, The Guardian had put these grim totals of First Nations people in custody 
um, at 474 since the Ricker deck. Now, I, I despair the lack of progress made and um, evidence, as you can see there, suggests that things have changed for the worst since the Ricker deck report and its 339 recommendations were released. Um, you know, this despair resonates with the findings of the 2018 Australian Law Reform Commission um, Pathways to Justice report, in which the Commission is there explained and examined the multiple and layered nature of entrenched disadvantage we face in social, cultural and economic spheres. Uh, the, the Commonwealth Government has never um, publicly responded to this report. And, you know, working in this space for such a long time, I've, I've thought long and hard about whether um, this practice of appointing bodies and then ignoring them is a deliberate strategy of uh, distraction um, designed to keep our people occupied and engaged with these serious problems, but always kicking our response down the road to some future government. Now, racial discrimination plays a huge part. Um, the Ricky Dick report made it clear that um, racism is a fundamental cause of high rates of incarceration and deaths in custody, explaining um, that it's, it is uh, institutionalised and systemic and re resides not just in our individuals or individual settings, but in the relationships between the various institutions. Um, and we've got to remember this report is 30 years old and it's still current in what, in what it says. Um, a good example is the coronal exposures of these systemic failures. failures. Um, there have been many um, coronal inquiries that have highlighted the impact of systemic shortcomings in the health and justice sectors. Uh, I'm going to give two examples here, but um, there, you know, there are obviously many more. Um, firstly, the misdue coronial. Uh, here, the coroner found that misdue death could have been um, prevented if her illness had been diagnosed earlier and she'd been given antibiotics, adding that her overall care was below expected um, standards. The doctor um, who declared misdue fit to be detained before she died uh, in police custody has now been ordered to pay a $30,000 fine for um, providing inadequate and substantially below standard care. Um, the, the State Admin Tribunal for Western Australia declared that the 2014 death of Ms. Dude demonstrates the serious and tragic consequences of um, racism in our, in our health and justice systems. Um, you know, the tribunal fined the doctor for professional misconduct, but he's not been suspended from practicing medicine. Um, and, and that just reinforces the um, concerns around here. Um, we must re um, also remember that uh, Miss Dew was only apprehended and held in custody because she failed to pay fines. And, and please testify that they thought, um, you know, she was faking the illnesses and, and, and coming down from drugs. Well, well, some of the medical staff also uh, thought uh, she was exaggerating um, her behaviour. Um, so the other coronial I wanted to uh, quickly discuss is um, Kuman J Langdon, who was a respectful Aboriginal man from um, Central Australia. He died in Darwin's police cells after being taken into custody for minor alcohol-related uh, offences. Um, he was detained under the paperless arrest police powers. Uh, he was found dead in his cell about three hours later. Um, here, the coroner was informed that um, Mr. Langdon was um, kept in custody for having committed the offence of drinking in a regulated place in a designated area. And look, I'm from the Northern Territory, and if you go to the um, beachfront, you'll see non-Indigenous people drinking as much alcohol as they want, and no one's being locked up. Um, so, you know, we're looking at biases here. And, and, and the coroner highlighted that while no court could have locked Mr. Langdon up for that offence for any period of time, it was under these laws uh, that implemented by the anti-government, the police can um, exercise their discretion to do so for a period of up to four, four hours or even longer if they um, determine that the individual was still um, intoxicated. Um, the coroner went on to say, and, and I, I think this is prevalent, that um, a, a sick middle-aged Aboriginal man was treated like a criminal and incarcerated like a criminal. Uh, he died in a police cell which was built to house criminals. Uh, he, he died in his sleep with strangers in this cold and concrete cell. He died of natural causes and was always likely to die suddenly due to chronic and serious heart disease. 
Um, but he was entitled to die in peace in the comfort of family and friends. In my view, he was entitled to die as a free man, said the coroner. Um, look, I, I gotta, these laws are covertly target our people and, and are racially biased and they don't afford our people um, the same discretion that others receive from police and even sometimes the judiciary. Um, you know, if we are serious about addressing the uh, extreme overrepresentation of um, Aboriginal police, uh, people in the um, criminal justice system, you know, we need to ensure that this system is meaningful for, for and relevant to Indigenous people and, and respect, you know, their status as members of the First Nations, the original Aboriginal uh, Australian sovereigns. Um, you know, this is not to advocate a, a separate judicial system for Aboriginal people, but rather recognition that the justice system was is uh, failing Indigenous people, and that you know there needs to be a serious consideration of the overhaul required to to make it equal for all. Um, look, and I want to stress that customary law is um, not a historic artifact. Um, it 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 guides people in community on country in real and concrete ways, um, emphasising responsibilities that we must look after one another and care for country. Uh, Indigenous Australians cannot help but feel, you know, the irony of statements made by the rule of law and one law for all when they bear the brunt of uh, criminal justice laws that are, you know, apparently universal on the face of it, but, you know, typically deployed, you know, to control and coerce Indigenous peoples and, and all peoples of our low socioeconomic um, backgrounds. The, you know, the move on laws, for example, are rules enabling, you know, paperless arrests and imposed laws prohibiting um, the possession of alcohol in um, Indigenous communities. Uh, the systemic and structural biases uh, are inherent in both the laws themselves and their application work to criminalise Indigenous Australians. Um, such laws, you know, they, they operate in two different ways in practice. Um, they are effectively two laws treating Australians differently, depending on whether they are or appear to be First Nations people. Um, you know, time after time, governments have failed um, to, to properly implement recommendations arising from, you know, deep and thoughtful inquiries and research that, they, they, that they've initiated. Um, I reflect on my learnings as a law student um, being told from my first year that uh, law is fair and just. And, you know, um, it did not then, and nor does it now reflect what I experience and perceive as an Indigenous person in this country. Um, the theory and the history of settler law reflects a self-reinforcing system that, you know, is designed to you know, basically justify continued settler supremacy. Um, you know, our people and our justice systems were here prior to what um, colonialism and ha which has ignored or disrespected them ever since. Um, perhaps this is because the inherently illegal nature of the occupation has yet to be addressed, including through relatively benign measures, measures such as our recognition of customary law. Um, the presence of peoples with our sovereignty and legal systems of their own belies the premise that uh, Britain acquired sovereignty over land by settlement. You know, this is a, is a legal fiction and uh, does not um, borrow a phrase from Brennan in Marbo number two, accord with our present knowledge and appreciation of the facts. Uh, is it time to, to, you know, to take up the challenge to, to de developing the Australian legal systems in ways that the court in Marbo number two uh, declined to? Um, you know, those are the questions. Uh, is it to acknowledge Indigenous law and legal authority? Uh, in, in my opinion, until we do, the flaws in this foundational legal fiction, is my time there, um, you know, legal fiction continuing, you know, affect the entirety of Australia's legal system. Um, I'll probably leave it there with um, just saying, you know, Professor Mick Dodson described it perhaps too diplomatically when he, he said that the sovereign pillars of Australian state are arguably at their very least uh, a little legally shaky. Um, Michael has got a bit more time, or is that it? Uh, we're, we're right on time, mate. So, and let's say you can yeah. part with a few words if you want, if you want to sum up. 
yeah, I just, just wanted to get to this party where um, in Mabo number two, much um, attention was devoted to the idea that the common law must develop to reflect uh, contemporary notions of justice and human rights, but not in ways that it fractured a skeletal principle of the Australian legal system. As Brennan pointed out in that rule, um, that is pegged for a change must be assessed to see whether it's essential in the sense of being skeletal. Um, we are told that any rule that seriously offends the value of justice and human rights, especially equality before the law, cannot um, command unquestioning adherence, but also that in weighing up the pros and cons of changing a rule, we must ask whether if the rule were to be overturned, the disturbance to, to apprehend would be disproportionate to the benefit flowing from the overturning. But to my mind, this is essentially the dilemma. Uh, in the criminal justice system, there are many rules and practices that uh, do not accord, accord with the equality before the laws. So their persistence seems tied in some ways to the idea that overturning them would result in a disturbance disproportionate to the benefit. And, and then you've got to ask as Indigenous people, uh, whether the benefit to whom? And, uh, and it's not to us who lost lands, family, languages, cultures at the hands of this settler law. And, I, and, I, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Eddie. Really thought-provoking stuff and some sobering uh, stories you've, you've mentioned there. I, I, you know, there's so many questions in my head and a few on the, the Q and A. Just might like a, if you could quick, we'll do two quick ones and then we'll um, then we'll call it for afternoon break. The it seems as though, particularly in the case you said about the um, man who died in custody after having a drinks in a in a publicly excluded place. Where do we need to best focus our energy? Because if we could focus it in all directions, it seems as though is it the policing and their interpretation of what they need to do, or do we fundament, or do we first go at fundamentally changing the law? Like, do we need what's the what's the path well, forward here immediately? Well, um, that's a huge quest question, and. Um, you know, you, you could quickly do stuff if you just um, change the bail, bail Act and the Sentencing Act and also, you know, the age of criminal responsibility, you could really um, make some huge differences. But overall, the law in itself, um, I mean, we can just see the Northern Territory had a Royal Commission to, um, in regards to the, you know, children protection and, and, and juvenile justice. And, you know, it's only been three or four years since that uh, Royal Commission and, and they've gone tough on crime and, you know, they've sort of just ignored the whole um, 227 recommendations that has been given down. And so, and if you go on in the paper that I wrote, they, I, I get to um, um, chief justices who, you know, for them to come out and talk about the system and that it, the unconscious biases um, are there for Indigenous people, so it must really say there's something wrong with the system. and. And, and I've, I've, I've said it in numerous other talks that um, the profession has been complicit in how, you know, these numbers are, are such high and, and gone on from where it is. And don't get me wrong, they've, they've all done um, submissions and, and, and et cetera, but the reality is where do we, they go next? And, 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 and I, you know, I, I, I put it on them that we, they need to be, be doing more than just writing submissions now, we're past that stage. And um, and I, got, I talked to you back to the, the, the foundational of, of the laws of this country. We, I think we really need to go that way. And and earlier we had, um, you know, uh, Marcus and, 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 uh, and they're talking about treaty. And I mean, that, that's, that's one way of, of trying to make that change, but also, you know, um, the voice that is trying to look at the constitution and, and structural reform is also a huge um, need in this country, I think, for Indigenous Australians. Yeah, cool. And that, that was feeds into a quick question, I guess, if you just give a couple of words on, yeah. on the, the, whether the treaty process is make, heading in this direction, but how far away do you think you are, we are from recognising that Australia is a legally pluralist place? Pluralist uh, place. <laughs> Um, is this where the treaty process is going or are there other ways to get there? Uh, man, you ask hard questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
Yeah. So I've been involved with the um, the treaty assembly in discussions around this stuff, and um, I think that is a process where they, they can have um, discussions around. But the thing you don't want to also do is um, take responsibility away from government, you know, and then um, be lumped with something that you really can't, um, you know, look, do yourself. And 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 the reality is that. Um, there is already legal pluralism in this country, you know. We've got mob all over this country who are on country who would not know what's going outside of their community other than, you know, watching the footy or something, who practise their daily um, laws and cultures um, like they've always done. So um, there's no denying that, but the, the, I think it's a bigger picture around um, if you look at the High Court, they're still reluctant to... Um, question that sovereignty question and um the recent love tom's case also goes there so i think um we, we, people are you know re relearning their languages and and culture so it's an issue for this country and, and and they need to accept that there is um you know legal pluralism in this country yeah really really important i think Thanks a lot, Eddie. Really, uh, really amazing stuff and powerful narrative. Um, thank you, everyone, in that session. It was, you know, it's going from strength to strength through this symposium. I really thank everyone. We've got um, a half an hour break now, which I'll shorten. I'll, I'll own that one because I asked an extra question in there on Eddie. And, um, but we will return at 3.30 p.m. Melbourne time. Okay, so that gives you 23 minutes uh, to have a break. Um, where we will kick off with another book launch and then move into some other fascinating topics. So thanks everyone again in that session and we'll see you back here in 23 minutes. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. Uh, this, welcome to the fourth and final session of the inaugural Indigenous Knowledge Institute International Day of Indigenous, World Indigenous Peoples. It's been an amazing seminar, a symposium so far with some really powerful talks and displaying the breadth of Indigenous knowledge um, broadly. And one of the things that has really impressed upon me is the range of approaches and the, the high amount of skill and intellect within the walls of the institution, within the University of Melbourne and our connections. Um, we'll hear now from some other people working in this space within the university um, and end up finishing off with our director, Professor Aaron Korn, prevent, providing a, uh, a wrap up. So this next session is a book launch by Dr. Vanessa Russ. Again, I will introduce uh, Professor Marcia Langton. Uh, for those of you who were not here in the morning, I'll recap um, Professor Langton's bio. She's an Aboriginal woman of Iman descent, an anthropologist and a geographer with a strong research track record on Aboriginal alcohol use and harms, family violence, Aboriginal land tenure, management of environments and native title, aspects of Aboriginal culture, art and performance and the shift to modernity. Professor Langton has held the foundation chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne since the year 2000 and was appointed Associate Provost in 2017. Professor Langton is also a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, a Fellow of Trinity College and an Honorary Fellow of Emmanuel College at the University of Queensland. There's not much that Marcia hasn't contributed to in the lives of Aboriginal people on this continent and we owe her a deep debt of gratitude. So I'll hand over to Marcia will introduce um, the book and uh, Vanessa and Ian. Thank you, Michael, Michael Sean. Uh, it is my very great pleasure to introduce to you uh, today on the uh, International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples, Dr. Vanessa Russ and Professor Ian McLean. Uh, Dr. Vanessa Russ has joined us at the University of Melbourne um, and uh, 
Her book has been published, and so today, Professor Ian McLean will launch her book. Uh, I just want to say how excited I am uh, to be able to read this book, um, and all of you who are interested in Aboriginal art, uh, which carries so much of our Indigenous knowledge, uh, will be, I'm sure, as excited as I am to read a book by a uh, profoundly important Indigenous scholar. Uh, so let me uh, introduce you to, first of all, um, Dr. Vanessa Russ. Uh, so to begin with, her book uh, is, uh, is entitled A History of Aboriginal Art in the Art Gallery of New South Wales, published by Routledge. Um, and it was just recently published this year. So, Dr. Vanessa Russ, sorry, is a Ngarnian Gidja woman from the Kimberley region of Western Australia. She is the former Associate Director of the Burnt Museum of Anthropology at the University of Western Australia. She has a PhD in art history. Uh, and I believe Professor McLean was one of your supervisors. Is that right, Vanessa? Yes. Um, and uh, <clears throat> In her PhD, she investigated the history of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, which, as many of you would know, has one of the largest holdings of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art in Australia. Um, and she uh, established how Australian Aboriginal art came to be in the collections and the work to change the narrative of exclusion up until today. She has an extensive curatorial and research experience, having successfully managed the Burnt Museum for several years. Um, and she's worked on several interdisciplinary projects uh, that have included uh, disciplines, her disciplines, such as anthropology, art history, and Australian history. And indeed, she has an extensive knowledge of Aboriginal art and culture from several parts of the country. She is keenly interested in understanding evidence-based interventions that uncover contemporary colonisation and its history in Australia as well as opportunities to transform the concept of the nation state with Aboriginal voices at the forefront. Uh, Vanessa, by the way, is also a practicing contemporary artist and she's won awards for her work. So in this highly original study, uh, she examines the gradual invention of Aboriginal art in the art gallery of, of New South Wales. But I'm going to leave it to Vanessa uh, to talk about her own work, uh, because I believe that she uh, can do that so much better than me, of course. So, Vanessa, welcome and uh, many congratulations uh, on uh, the publication of your book. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Marcia Langton. I really appreciate the opportunity to launch the book with you and, and um, at the University of Melbourne. <laughs> Um, I'm on Wajak Budja here in Perth and I just wanted to pay my respect to Elders past and presence on the land that I, I live and work on. Um, I also wanted to recognise that the book is really about Aboriginal Australia, so the whole of Australia and Australian Aboriginal art, but it really needs to acknowledge the Gadigal mob of the Eora Nation in Sydney and I set about doing that um, without knowing. I really started looking at the history of place, uh, the history of how the colony started. And I know we talk a lot about the, uh, the difference between notions of invasion, which is quite an Indigenous thing, and settler narrative. But when you hopefully when you read this book, you'll start to rethink the settler narrative and think more of the fortification of Sydney, the, the idea of consuming lands in order to increase wealth and trade. And I think that that's really the intention that came out of the research over time. I looked at the Art Gallery of New South Wales as a case study, and I absolutely love that state institution. Um, I had the opportunity to work there with people like Hetty Perkins, Jonathan Jones, Amanda Peacock, uh, Cara Pinchbeck, who's the current senior Aboriginal curator there. And 
had a really amazing experience and time and it's through conversations with staff past and present that I both gained a passion for for what they do and a real respect for how hard the work is in terms of engaging community mob all over Australia in a, in a conversation. Um, I also have to acknowledge people like Alan Krell and Joanna Mendelson from the College of Fine Arts where I started. Um, Joanna did a great course walking us through the Art Gallery of New South Wales and it started me thinking about the colonial narrative versus the Aboriginal narrative. And so that's kind of where these things start. And of, of course, I have to recognise uh, Professor Ian McLean, who was used, used to be at UWA, um, and uh, Associate Professor Darren Jorgensen, who couldn't join us today, who is at UWA. Uh, without them, I would not have passed my PhD. Um, the, the belly of the book is about the idea of inclusion and exclusion. And I think we need to look at the debates in Europe around the inclusion of, say, Asian art to kind of get a framing for it. But one of the things I think we all know is that there is a mainstream Australia and then there's an Aboriginal Australia. And I think that that was something I've always been fascinated with as we talk about um, sort of this Australia of the future whilst we're caught up in the Australia of the past. And so I'm really interested in how do we think about the colony and how does Aboriginal art play a role in that conversation? The book started really with looking at ground up. So I did kind of think about where the gallery was situated in terms of Sydney Cove. Uh, and I also was thinking about how Sydney was formed as a colony itself. And over time, you see Aboriginal people, they don't leave Sydney at all. In fact, they're hanging out around the gallery from the moment they were fishing along, uh, you know, Woolloomooloo Bay, all the way up until today, where they still uh, engage in ceremony on, on Yurong Point. So I think it's really important to, to recognise um, that. I think in terms of this idea of inclusion and exclusion, before I sort of talk about the book itself and how it, it's situated, um, I'm really interested in the way that we think about art history and particularly the way we define Australian art. We always seem to define it from a very Eurocentric position and I don't wouldn't blame anyone for that because that's, the idea of art as an invention. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we have is actually having enough evidence to actually define Australian art in new ways that includes Aboriginal art. And I don't think we're there yet. I also don't think that by placing Aboriginal art in state art galleries like the Art Gallery in New South Wales, that somehow resolves the conversation as well. Because a lot of the time we've found, and in the history of this book, you'll see um, that Aboriginal art was always in a basement, some basement somewhere, either packed away in a basement or hidden behind Hessian walls in a basement and then moved to another basement. <laughs> Um, so I think that that's really relevant to our conversation. I think that we shouldn't separate in some ways art history out from the actual acquisition decisions that gallery staff make as well. Um, I guess one of the challenges that I had in the book was how far do you go? I cover the entire history of the Art Gallery of New South Wales from its initial inception with £500 uh, in the 1800s until the establishment of Sydney Modern. And in that time, Aboriginal people have had to transition and shift and change and assimilate and then uh, be inside, outside of society. So one of the challenges that I had in the book was actually building that story um, that was relevant to mob, to people thinking through their own position and what I found was that really it was the external political pressures that made change for the community in terms of uh, bringing Aboriginal art into the gallery. So we could talk about the war in post-1945 when conversations around acquisitions of Aboriginal art included the acquisition of most state institutions of works from places like Hermansburg. Um, and then following that, we could think about the... Uh, referendum decisions that were made, the push to buy community, um, especially in nor Northern Australia, to get politicians to pay attention to their land rights. Um, that also helped 
we go into the 1990s when we think of the Deaths into Custody Royal Commission, which really significantly influenced the decision to employ curators of Aboriginal heritage. Um, so I think that that's kind of the overall story of the book and um, I hope you'll get to, to read it. Thank you so much for letting me launch it on your program. So I think Marcia is in here. Yes, yep. yes. I'm just about to hand over to him. Thank you, Michael. Um, so Ian McLean, uh, who is joining us, uh, is the Hugh Ramsey Chair of Australian Art History at the University of Melbourne. Uh, he has a long and uh, wonderful history of engagement with Australian art and particularly Indigenous art. So to keep this short so that he has an opportunity uh, to speak to Vanessa's book, I'll just mention briefly that his, his own books include Indigenous Archives, The Making and Unmaking of Aboriginal Art with Darren Jorgensen, Rattling Spears, A History of Indigenous Australian Art, Double Desire, Transculturation and Indigenous Art, How Aborigines Invented the Idea of Contemporary Art, um, and uh, so much more, uh, anthologies, journals, special editions and so on, let me hand over to Professor Ian McLean. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much, um, Marcia. And um, thank you for the invitation to be part of this um, very important day. I think that the recognition of First Nations and their rights by a body of nation states was a long battle, which the Australian nation state resisted to the end just about. And it's a victory, I think, that should be remembered and celebrated. And it's also, I think, the story of Vanessa's book as well. Um, now, I, I was born and raised in Cairns in North Queensland and after teaching art history for some 25 years in the north, south, east and west of this continent, I've ended up here in Parkville, um, Melbourne University in Wurundjeri country. And um, wherever we are from and wherever we have been and wherever we are now, we should always, I think, remember how we got here and on whose shoulders um, we travelled the shoulders of those who preceded us. Now, I do this through my profession as an art historian, and, and so does Vanessa. This is what her book on the collecting practices of the Art Gallery of New South Wales is, is all about, I think. It's a story, um, as, as she explained, it's a story of a journey from absence and invisibility to increasing invisibility of Indigenous art in the discourses of national art. And while I think she's perfectly right to say there's still a fair way to go, it's a story that echoes struggles, I think, in, in other spheres in Australia. Now, um, it's immensely satisfying for a teacher to see their students make good. And Vanessa's been making good for quite a while now. But it's a very special honour to be invited by one of them to speak on an occasion um, such as this. Just to see a thesis where I was there at the beginning of it and then, pursue, you know, this is how long a thesis takes to often get out. Well, only a few actually get out to start with. Um, now, I met Vanessa over a decade ago when I was teaching at the University of Western Australia and she had just returned from Sydney, excited, as she's told you, after studying and working what by then was a, a rich and stimulating and, and fairly new still contemporary art scene. And uh, Vanessa, I, I immediately felt Vanessa's energy, you know, when she came to ask to study because you could feel her ambition to learn and but also to make waves with that knowledge. She already had very strong ideas about the relationship between Aboriginal and Australian national culture and, and those ideas I've just seen develop and they, they resonate throughout this book, I think, Vanessa. Now, Vanessa was also very special to me because she was the first postgraduate Ab Aboriginal student I'd supervised in my 20 year career. That to me tells you something about um, how Anglo-centric art history still is in Australia. I knew plenty of Aboriginal artists and curators by then, but Aboriginal art historians and critics were, were thin on the ground. Um, we're beginning to see a few now, but um, this is one another reason why this book I think um, 
it's, it's, it's such a welcome addition to, to our discipline. Another thing that fascinated me about Vanessa was her unusual background growing up in a Kimberley cattle station. Working from a young age, she told me many stories about this with her father and um, out there on the horses with her father and other drovers and imbibing the stories about place around the campfires. Now, drovers are natural philosophers. Working with the animals in the country under the stars makes you think about the meaning of it all and the place in it. And I'm sure as you heard Vanessa speak, you would have picked up on this philosophical edge in her talk, in her attraction to art theory and ideas and to, the, to just to the idea of art itself as it has manifested in many cultures. Vanessa is deeply interested, not just in Aboriginal art or even um, Australian national art, but Asian art and, and art from other places. And she's especially, I think, interested in um, how the way art is manifested in other cultures resonates and builds bridges between them. And that again is what this, this book is about. It's about a particular bridge being built between, between two um, very antagonistic cultures. So it's with great pleasure I um, launched Vanessa's very, I should say, thoughtful book. There's an extremely thoughtful book with lots of ideas which, are, which um, have a long way to go. A history of Aboriginal art in the Art Gallery of New South Wales is also a history of Aboriginal art, I think, in, in all, of the, all of the national art galleries in Australia. Now, it's hot off the press and um, she should be here to sign it, but she's not. So what can I say other than go out and buy it anyway? And... Um, Keep, keep on pushing, Matt and Vanessa, and congratulations. We should all give her a clap, even though we can't hear each other clap. Thank you, thanks. I guess we should do the thumbs up sign, shouldn't we, and the clap sign. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Marcia. Microphone, Marcia. Uh, thank you so much, Ian. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, this wonderful book is available, available at Taylor and Francis Books, uh, or you can order it at your favourite bookshop. Um, and you know where I'll be going here in Nam. Um, so, uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Marcia. Thanks, Ian. Good one. Sounds like a, an amazing book and one to, to read. Thanks a lot, Marcia, uh, Vanessa, and Ian. So we move on to the next um, presentation in this session. This one is by um, Professor Bruce Pascoe. Bruce is a Ewan man, a Ewan, Bunurong and Tasmanian man. He has published 36 books, including Dark Emu, which won the New South Wales Premier's Award for Literature in 2016, and Young Dark Emu, which won both the Booksellers Association Prize and the CBCA Nonfiction Award in 2020. He has published numerous essays and journalism, <coughs> excuse me, in both Australia and overseas. Bruce is also a farmer and grows Australian Aboriginal grains and tubers. I've been out to his farm and it's a wonderful place. He's a board member of the First Languages Australia, Black Duck Foods and Twofold Aboriginal Corporation. So thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's a, a great uh, pleasure to be able to uh, talk with so many experts in their field. Um, I'm on Ewan land uh, down in Far East Gippsland near Malakuta on the farm Yumbra uh, on the banks of the Wallagra River. Uh, we've been uh, growing food on this land now for uh, three or four years, and um, I first started uh, growing these foods about 10 years ago when it became clear to me that there was enormous enthusiasm to grow Aboriginal foods um, amongst chefs and uh, the, um, uh, the foodies in the, in the cities of Australia. But there was 
no matching enthusiasm or knowledge about how to go about making sure that Aboriginal people were included in uh, the growing of these foods. And as always, that, that had the potential to lead to a, a further dispossession of Aboriginal people. Um, and it was interesting listening uh, to uh, the discussions on Aboriginal art, uh, because in the early stages of Aboriginal art, there was a lot of dispossession going on there too, until uh, universities and um, curators and entrepreneurs uh, came together to respect the rights of Aboriginal people. So we need something like that in the food industry because of all the money that is spent on Aboriginal food, only 1%, 1% uh, of it goes to Aboriginal people. So that's the purpose of this farm. Um, I'm not particularly interested in uh, farming. Um, again, I've, I've done plenty of that, but it reminds me of a, the Yorta Yorta case when Judge Olney told the Yorta Yorta people that he couldn't find in their favour in their land claim because their culture had been wiped away by the tide of history. And uh, when, I, when I could see this happening in the food industry, um, and there were a, a lot of sharks in the water um, 10 years ago, and there are still people who want to uh, make use of our food, but um, only acknowledge where it came from in a very tokenistic way. Um, you know, sometimes it represents itself in labelling, sometimes in the, the language name, but very, very seldom in terms of dollars. And this is common in Australia to want Aboriginal culture and art, uh, but not want to pay for it. So uh, at the farm, we're growing these foods, uh, we're learning about it, we employ Aboriginal people from the local communities uh, to grow the food so that we can always uh, defend our right to be in, in this industry. And because the industry will allow us to uh, have Aboriginal people gainfully employed in their culture, uh, traditional culture. So I see it as being very important, but it's an uphill battle sometimes convincing people that Aboriginal people were actually engaged in some kind of agricultural activity and it doesn't matter to me at all whether we call that activity um, aquaculture, agriculture, um, or hunter-gatherer. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's the outcome. It's whether or not the result of it means that Aboriginal people gain more respect in the community and that their knowledge is paid for. Those are the important things. And I was reminded of it today when a First Nations person from Canada sent me an email about a fish trap in uh, Vancouver Island. And it had been so visible for so long. I think there was something like 300,000 stakes had been hammered into the ground, in, in the water, and into the mud of this estuary. 300,000 stakes in a very intriguing design, uh, but everybody must have known in the early days that it was a, an aquaculture system. But when uh, Europeans got involved with the fishing industry there, they banned the use of that fish trap. And the, the knowledge apparently that this was a, an uh, indigenous aquaculture system is said to have disappeared. I find it really hard to believe. I think it was just extirpated from the history. And uh, 
the, the example uh, that the First Nations person sent me really uh, brought me back to those old feelings I had when I first started reading explorers journals and finding really detailed reference to uh, Aboriginal people building wells and dams, uh, harvesting grain, planting grain, uh, harvesting tubers and replanting the tops and storing food, creating recipes to preserve food. Uh, all of those things had been completely eliminated from my education. And you can ask why that was, you know, why those things were left out of the education. Um, but I think it's deliberate. I don't think there's any accident about it. I, in um, Canada, the, the government tries to say that it, it, it happened um, as an accident this loss of knowledge. But it happened at the same time as dispossession. It happened at the same time as residential schools, which were equivalent to Aboriginal missions here. And um, I think it was deliberate. And I think leaving Aboriginal knowledge and sophistication and achievement out of uh, the Australian curriculum is deliberate. Um, and you know, I've been challenged on that uh, view recently. Um, and uh, I reviewed my resources um, and sources and uh, informants. And um, I'm afraid there's no other conclusion. It was a, a deliberate um, absence in the curriculum. And, these are some of the things that um, so many people in this forum are trying to relieve, to put forward the case for Aboriginal excellence and, uh, and also the platform for what that might mean in terms of legislation and uh, understanding and education. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in the education because we need young people to know about their country and we need young people, whether they be black or white, to care for country, to love Mother Earth, and to have knowledge of the sustainability of Aboriginal agriculture and uh, aquaculture, and the fundamental reliance on that conservancy in the philosophy and governance of Australia, I think is something that Australia is interested in. There are some people who aren't interested in it and don't want any other Australians to be interested in it. And I think that's political. I don't see it as an advance of scholarship. I see it as a political act that there are some people around who want to deny uh, anything to do with Aboriginal accomplishment for political reasons, political and economic. And I think those people are a minority. I think a great many Australians are interested in these things. They are fundamentally interesting. This is our country, Australia. Um, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people share it. This is a really interesting part of our history and culture. And I think the vast majority of Australians want to understand it. They want to understand their country, they want to belong, and they want to preserve country. They want to preserve the globe. And if you've been undertaking care of land for, let's say, 65,000 years, that's the absolute minimum uh, in terms of archaeological science in this country that Aboriginal people conducted th these kinds of activities. It may be 120,000 years, but once again, who cares? You know? Um, what, there's not much difference between 60 and 120,000 years in world terms because even at 65,000 years, we're far in advance of any other uh, group as the oldest uh, continuing civilization on Earth. So these numbers don't mean anything. What, mean, what does mean something 
is Australia's understanding of their country. And um, I want to invite non-Aboriginal Australian people to enjoy the place, to care for the place and to feel at home because Aboriginal people aren't going to go away. Non-Aboriginal people aren't going to go away. Whatever we make of this country, uh, we will do together, not separately. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, uh, yeah, really, really, really powerful words. We're waiting for any uh, questions to, to come in. So, yeah, you're right. I think a lot of the debate about your work, which, you know, I've checked over and I've read and is, is based around semantics, I think is the point that I would, the way that I would put it. And uh, not to, to derail the conversation in, and give too much air to these, the commentary, but the feigned outrage that um, the latest um, critiques have come from about the work being taught in schools, which promoted the uh, this the latest um, opposition to your work, is nothing but but feigned. Like it's uh, where was the outrage of the centuries of misinformation taught through schools and into students and to me and my student my kids about Aboriginal culture, um, that it takes a proactive and positive stance to, to spoon this, uh, this false outrage, which I, I find astounding. And I, I really am amazed that people haven't seen through the, 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 the falsity of that. Anyway, with um, your work, Bruce, what do you think is the capacity? So at the moment, I see the, the way that um, Australia produces its food and you know I don't think we can resist the fact that we need high yield um, for less input especially as climate change kicks in and, and the area of arable land decreases do you see there's an opportunity for alternate crops such as um, some of the grains that you're growing on your property or even the murnong or other other um, types of plants to start to um, supplement some of our our foods, or do you feel, for the, at least for the the immediate term, they're going to be more of a niche um, food source? Look, I I think both will happen. I'm I'm sure that um, they will begin as a niche market um, for the um, you know the modern restaurant who wants to be first with everything. Um, you know, remember some of the, um, the South African pulses and things like that that made the, uh, the chefs excited 20 years ago. Um, well, some of our food will do that too. But I also think they can become a staple. I've been uh, selling a, a vegetable from the farm here. Uh, we don't grow it. It grows on the farm and it grows in salt water. This is an incredible plant uh, for a drying continent uh, because it will grow in saline conditions. And it's a, a salad vegetable. It has a, a slight salt tang, um, but it is a beautiful vegetable. And um, be, beside the traditional uh, uh, lettuce and um, salad greens and tomatoes, you put this in, into a salad and it enhances it. Um, we don't have to convince people. Uh, when I first started taking the salad uh, to the local traders, um, I, I was expecting um, a quizzical response, but they were straight on to it because and it's instant taste, as Ben Shuri said, it tells you that this is going to be a popular vegetable um, and anyone can grow it. Um, and, but it, it is growing in conditions which are going to be really useful for Australia. So I, and we're, we're selling a flower now, which is a blend of commercial wheat and flour or rice flour um, and uh, between 10% and 20% of ours 
uh, our flowers are very dark. Uh, traditional Aboriginal flowers are very dark. Um, and uh, blended, they're uh, more appealing to my grandkids, for instance. You know, we, I trialled them on my grandkids, but they did wake up in the morning. So um, we were satisfied that our food security was okay. Uh, but we have to introduce these things slowly into the market. And, uh, but I'm certain that they will become popular because I'm certain that Australians want to eat Australian food. For so long, you know, our, uh, you know, our talk about our, our, the Australian diet has uh, concentrated on lamingtons and Vegemite. And here we are with our own salad vegetable um, ready to serve. But we've, we've never done it. This is food from old Aboriginal people, but because of Australia's reluctance to accept the history of the country when it came to dispossession, European eyes turned away uh, from these plants because they were black tucker. And so I never use the term bush tucker, for instance, because I think it's a pejorative. Uh, I think it's a diminutive. Uh, trying to give the impression that Aboriginal people were just wandering around picking berries here and berries there um, without any organisation. And our food systems were really well organised. They had a spiritual base and this plant I'm talking to you about has a spiritual story and, um, and we give it a language name. You know, we actually do know the Latin name for it, but we use our name. And that's the way we'd like to introduce it into the Australian market. I'm convinced there's a, um, a market for these things, but I think it's very important to have a series of Aboriginal businesses providing these things so that we maintain our intellectual property in them. I'm really concerned about that uh, because even some people of really good will don't understand when they're uh, profiting from Aboriginal knowledge, but never paying for it. Now, they're, they're people who, once it's pointed out to them, you know, it, uh, the, the light goes on. But um, I think we, you know, have to have uh, businesses like Indigi Grow at La Perouse, Indigi Earth at Mudgee, um, Black Duck here, um, Waminda up at Nara. Places like that where Aboriginal people are growing the food and uh, employing their cousins and brothers and sisters. I think that's really important. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree, Bruce. And um, thanks again for your, as always, humble but very powerful words. We've um, run out of time there and I couldn't agree more. You know, like Latinized names, we, we're convinced into thinking, okay, correct names they're just another attempt to classify the world and i think the more appropriate name in this continent would be would be the local mob's name for the food so i'm looking really really looking forward to seeing that hit the market bruce in the appropriate way so thanks again for your contribution to today it's really enriched it move on to the next um talk which is going to be a conversation again um, we will hear from Professor Marcia Langton and we're going to hear from, and I'm uh, going to struggle, I apologise to pronounce Brian's name, I'll, I'll butcher it no doubt, but I'll give it a go, and um, Rennell's name. But to recap, uh, it wasn't that long ago, so I won't go through Marcia's full bio, and I'm sure she's a, a name that most people know, but Marcia is, is an imam woman, an anthropologist and geographer who has really been engaged in the, in the full gamut of um, Aboriginal issues that um, Australia faces and been really at the coalface of many things for a long time. We have Brian, uh, I'm not even, I apologise, I'm not going to give it a go, mate, um, is a Yongu ceremonial leader. He's a musician um, in the early Arnhem Land popular band Soft Sands. And his visual art is displayed in the Australian National Maritime Museum. 
He has long been engaged in culture, language, heritage research, and holds a Master of Indigenous Knowledges from Charles Darwin University. His recent publications include writings on the long history of Yongu engagements with, engage, with Asian seafarers. And Ronell is a senior Yongu leader of uh, Gulamala clan. She holds a Master of Indigenous Knowledges from Charles Darwin University and is presently a health worker at Muach Health in Yurikala. Hand over to you, Marcia. Thank you, Michael, Sean. Um, so a very warm welcome to Brian Jungarawi Gararicha, um, and not with us today, but very much present because of her contribution to this work, Ranel Gandichawoi Gondara, um, and of course, our very own Professor Aaron Korn, uh, Director of the Indigenous Knowledge Institute. And uh, big thanks to the Mulka Project in Yurikawa, who've assisted us to uh, ensure that this uh, pro project uh, was able to be online today with the very sudden lockdown here in Melbourne, preventing uh, Murray and Ronell from uh, coming to Melbourne to join us. Uh, so uh, Aaron uh, is going to drive the PowerPoint, but uh, <clears throat> I think uh, it's important to say at this point that um, Brian, Ronell, Aaron, uh, Brian's uh, family members and Ronell's as well, uh, have worked together for many years to record, document and interpret uh, the extraordinary uh, music, music traditions of, of uh, Brian's countries that he's associated with. Um, and we'll learn a lot about that today from Brian, from Murray. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm particularly uh, honoured to be uh, involved today. Uh, so many years ago, when I first joined the University of Melbourne, I won a teaching prize. And I dedicated that teaching prize uh, to the now, now late brother of, of uh, of Murray, um, Dr. Gumbler. So Dr. Gumbler joined us uh, often with his wife, Pam, here at the University of Melbourne. He taught, but he, he not only taught our students, he taught us and he established an extraordinary uh, and then to become long lived project looking for the cultural legacy of his people that had been removed to museums. Now, to understand all of these, the cultural implications of these objects, I had to turn to um, my teachers, Joe and Aaron, and now Brian and Ronell, uh, to get, get a sense of how the musical traditions, the song series, the performative traditions tell us about uh, these cultures and a great deal about history. So one of the projects uh, I developed uh, from my time in Arnhem Land was uh, actually uh, to do with uh, something that we're going to talk a little bit about here today. Um, and that is the, uh, <clears throat> the long history of Macassan contact uh, with the, uh, North Australia, and it, it's this uh, history uh, that is embedded in so many songs and which I, I think you will find very interesting. So at this point, allow me please uh, to hand over to, uh, to Muri, um, uh, Brian and uh, Waku, Aaron uh, to speak further about their history together, working on preserving these cultural treasures.
Marcia, if you if you share mine, it's updated since yesterday. Okay. Yeah. I don't have yours. You'll have to share it. <coughs> Maury. Yo, what the? Aaron, yo. Yo. Um, I heard the last part, James, but now we're about that part. Mm. Your true pain. You know, mm. uh, that was, uh, now we, was um, very valued during those times and those eras. So they were like, um, they were really valuable during those eras. And as well as uh, trading materials, the languages, uh, our Bungal as a performance, uh, and time during those eras. So uh, um, um, we we use uh, now in my that it as a value because those times there it was really valuable, they were precious, like like more than rupee. Eh? Mm. Um, um, so there were there were a lot of like other. Other trip now uh, my cousins came with um, with experience of maritime now uh, uh, how to collect now tripping uh, how to basically process and at the same time um, at the same time. Um, negotiating uh, uh, kinship uh, languages um, and the and the time for being um, with with uh, different plans. You know, so uh, yeah. Uh, and other, like other cousins or other um, no explorers that came with different values. Mm -hmm. uh, they came with some, uh, perhaps with uh, um, um, uh, I can only recall some came with some like no like Maria you know like gun you know, you know, uh, or some sort of a powerful married materials or something you know, you know. and um, so I can only uh, recall on the Macassan um, exchanges like uh, during those eras um um you know Buruto as a kinship was very important Buruto kinship was very very was really um, very helpful um, and also languages um and uh um, and we both learn a, a, a behavior. We learn their behaviors. And they learn how how we live our life, you know, and how we related to um, how did we treat the land, the sea, the maritime status. So yeah, you know, but. Uh, Ma, okay, so there are some slides that helps to contextualise some of that for people who aren't familiar with the topic. Um, there are a whole range of historical exchanges that um, Indigenous peoples across North Australia had into 
um, Southeast Asia and beyond that stretch for centuries, um, at least until the 1750s and way beyond. We actually don't know how far they really go back, but Yong will have um, a very strong memory written into um, public ceremonial practice about um, those exchanges and what they mean uh, historically and today. And, um, and we decided when we were planning this yesterday that we'd um, dedicate this presentation to Joe Gumbler, um, who is you know, one of the reasons that we're all working together now. In fact, I wouldn't be talking to you at all without Joe Gumbler. Um, so we thought that was important to mark, um, to mark him. So Marcia was involved in um, an exhibition that um, illustrates this history um, and her work in this space. Marcia, it goes back to the late 90s, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, so I met um, Zhao Ping, Zhu Zhao Ping in, in Darwin when he was studying at the old Northern Territory University. And he'd been ad adopted by the late artist from uh, Ramanginning in that area, uh, like uh, John Bullen-Bullen. And so we worked together for about 12 years to try to bring to life the story of the Macassans coming to North Australia annually. They're very strong, as, as uh, Muri explained, uh, exchange relationships that developed into a deep cultural exchanges over, we think, centuries. Mm -hmm. um, so the tree pangers uh, who came looking for uh, to collect the, the tree pang or beige de mer, a kind of sea slug, came uh, from what is now uh, uh, um, Kalimantan and the Celebes. They were mainly Macassar. Okay, I think you've dropped out there for a bit. Um, and what you're seeing on the front cover of this book that was released as part of the exhibition that Marcy curated, uh, these are these are dried tree pang. Uh, they're still sold throughout Southeast Asia uh, and beyond today. They, they cost a fortune, absolute fortune. And, and created many artworks um, and we found museum works to illustrate uh, the depth of cultural exchange. And just to remember that at the time, almost nobody believed us that this was the case. In fact, our application to the Australia Arts Council was rejected because they thought we were deluded. Um, anyway, uh, so the historians themselves say that the trade probably started somewhere about 1750, but we're pretty sure on the basis of our cultural evidence that the trade goes back much, much further. And uh, we want to talk to you uh, now about that. Um, I, I find it very interesting that so much of these centuries of cultural exchange is still alive today in, in Yolngu traditions, as Mori will explain. So the, the next slide is um, the launch of that exhibition in the Capital Museum, Beijing. Um, and you'll notice Marcia is standing there um, with the yellow flag, Joe Gumbel is with the blue flag and um, Paul Pascoe is with the red flag. And the flags will come back later. Uh -huh. Did you want to say anything about that, that slide, Marcia? Uh, well, Paul, Paul is the son of the late Dr. Bullen Bullen, and mm. he and uh, Bullen Bullen's widow were there in Beijing, um, and that was a wonderful celebration. And I'm so glad that Joe and you were there because um, we would have been very lonely there in Beijing without you. And it was uh, because of uh, Joe that we were able to have, I think, a, a tremendously important ceremony. Um, the likes of which uh, those people in Beijing had never seen before. And also just to say, uh, at least half a million people saw the exhibition in Beijing when mm. we couldn't have it exhibited in Australia because nobody believed us. But of course the Chinese knew 
and they were delighted to meet the people from whom the tree pung had come. Mm. So that's the historical trade route. Um, you can see it stretches all the way from the Port of Makassar, which was a major hub on South Sulawesi. Um, people would come down the trade winds to the Arnhem Land and Kimberley coasts, um, and then there'd be on trade of the dried tree pang all the way up through the Philippines to um, southern China. And uh, this route went for hundreds and hundreds of years, right up until the first decade of the 20th century. When it was shut down by Alfred Searcy, uh, the tax agent, from, uh, customs agent from South Australia, uh, the, the colony of South Australia, um, and so the British were determined to close down uh, the trade, uh, take it over. Uh, of course, they were not able to do that because uh, these relationships with, uh, with Aboriginal people were so strong, but also at the same time, I, I think you have evidence Aaron, that the uh, explosion of the volcano Krakatoa, Krakatoa had uh, had an enormous impact on the trade, and and indeed uh, many historians have noticed that the the trade was declining at around the time that um, Matthew Flinders in 1803 uh, ran into a huge uh, Macassan fleet in the mm. off the coast of Arnhem Land, uh, led by the captain or Bungawa um, Pobasu. Yeah, 60 vessels and about 1,000 men. All armed, mm. yes, that's mm. right. Um, mm. But and, and uh, they soon had to become licensed and, and uh, were harangued by the, by the British to leave. Mm. And uh, over time, uh, the trade did cease, uh, mm. but the, the visitors from uh, our north, uh, had developed such strong relationships, they've never been forgotten. Mm. So this is just a, you know, um, etching from the period of what those boats looked like on the water, uh, traditional prowl. And the, you know, item of um, interest was, you know, this is one of many, many different kinds of um, of Tripang, Bish de Mer, Sea Slug, or Mori, what's its young one name? Daripa. 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 Hmm. And, and of so course, it's you... toxic. And so uh, the Macassans and, and, and their colleagues knew how to uh, treat it. I didn't. Uh, by, by cooking, smoking, drying um, to remove the toxicity. And mm. Aboriginal people worked with them uh, throughout the process. Hmm. Yep, and dried, they're, like I said before, they cost an absolute fortune, even today. And Gato, and Your, the other, this one, that is, uh, which is a bit white, the, the, the black one is uh, Nyon, we call it Nyon. Oh, ah, has Nyon. a different name. Mm -hmm. So different species. Yes, Your, black one, Nyon. Nyon. Nyon, Nyon. So to, to locate where we are, um, the, the pink shaded area is, you know, um, the Yungo homelands. Um, they're, they're people who speak seven or so distinct languages that are all closely related. Um, Brian is sitting at Irakala on the northeastern point at the moment. And um, where did you grow up, Brian? You grew up at Galewinko, right? Uh, on the uh, island up the top? Uh, You're... Oh. Yeah, uh, and that right, yeah. mm, and that's yeah. part of the Arnhem Land Trust. And all, all throughout the islands and coasts of this area are areas where Macassans traded and landed historically. And and there's a lot of archaeological evidence of that that we don't have time to go into today. But some of that archaeological evidence for um, you know uh, you know Asian visitation to these shores goes back to the 1100s. AD, CE rather. So that's a long time. Yes. Uh, I think that rather than tackling this slide word for word, maybe, I don't know if people can read it clearly or not, but what, what are we doing here, Brian, in this photo? 
on this image, um, um, it's uh, now uh, it re represents the first meeting arrivals. And my cousins, uh, we're presenting like if if you can see all the paintings there. That's that's my painting. That's my tribal people uh, coming towards and meeting the arrivals, the Macassans there. Mm. Yeah. And and all these designs that you're wearing that they come they in come the slides from, later they, later on we'll see the place where they come from it's uh, no no long ago no it painting yeah your your and among um, the that brian said earlier in case people missed it was he said that the um the tree paying was very valuable in money terms, in rupee terms, but it was so much more valuable than that. So, uh, and it had a, a, a value beyond money, yeah. very precious culturally. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And so the, this trade is recorded into the ceremonial law of some Yungwal clans and it's performed entirely publicly, which is how we know about it. Um, but the legacy of this trade into Asia, it cuts across the whole of contemporary Yongle society. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of loan words of Macassan and Boogie's origin um, for all kinds of things. And these are things um, Brian has mentioned up until now. Uh, the Yongle word for money is rupia. Yeah. Um, it's not here, but the Yongle word for rice is bidata, which is a Bahasa word. Um, yeah, or bule. Mm -hmm. like it's a, like a jewel, mm. like a jewel, jewel, you know? Mm. You know it? You know, like. Oh, brachi, yeah? You know. Yeah. It's, uh, bulle, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a markup. It's, um, it's a pr really precious, uh, uh, it, it really deeply means uh, 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 I'll tell you now, like ancient token from mm. from the bottom of the heart, mm. you know, from your perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there are words for ngarali, tobacco, um, ngarali, ngarali is a in mark, common use. You know, ngarali is a common use as a cigarette or tobacco. But it also it it's got a lot of value, value made it expensive level of value. Mm -hmm. um, it all it all come contains with markup like all the uh, the values, materials, smoke, uh, food, mm -hmm. uh, uh, tools. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The, um, the word sorry go on yeah and <laughs> the, in 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 my during my when i was growing up i heard my father and and also my father's father had always told that you never uh take these materials or tools or steal from anyone after otherwise you get punishment they they meant to be really valuable like mark up everything so these particular sort of trade yeah. items yeah trade items yeah yeah mm. and you know um people who know about indonesia will notice that the word for flute dueling is very close to Sulin, which is an oh, emblem yeah. Indonesian flute. Uh, and uh, Nganachi is the Yungle word for Iraq, which is a kind of, um, well, it's a, it's a spirit. It's an alcoholic spirit that's common throughout Southeast Asia and all the way west. 
So um, we mentioned the flags before. Mm. Uh, Maury, do you want to do you want to just introduce people to the ideas of the importance of flags yeah. for Yungle clans, please? Yeah. Um, um, the black one belongs to Dolce Manono, Watermere clan. And the red flag belongs to Watermere or JK. JK Watermere, red flag, they are for Dalongo clan. Even though they belong to salt water or fresh water, they belong to the same category, as well as uh, Watermere. The salt water and fresh water, um, watermere. The coastal and coastal watermere, and the and and uh, forest people, forest people, watermere and the um, And the yellow flag categorized now with Gamburinga. Jiggy. So we, we 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 should all have the ending the part. Jiggy, Purumro Jiggy, Kamburinga Jiggy, and the green one. Yeah, sorry, the yellow one belongs to Gumach. There's the uh, both fresh water and salt water Gumach. You know, um, and also now the Mindarapuyongo, Mindarapuyongo, Mindarangora, Wilerangora is a one Guri clan. The the flag color is green. Mindar, and there's two. To save saving the, the fresh water and the salt water people. Minder. Minder Onja is a is a, a, a salt water part where the the Mitian, the boat are ported on the shore of Minder. You know. Mutamu, that's the place called Mutamu. And Yarinya, the white flag. Yeah, belongs to Yarinya, which is Monyoko, as is a uh, other Watermere clan from um, from the other Watermere comes from uh, north north side, and the other Watermere comes from which is uh, the southern part, north and south. Um, Yarinya white flag is Monyoko. They come from a south, southern way. Just giving you a picture of directions. Mm. And then we come to your flag, the Berkeley Gupapangal so, flag, Yalakun, which is blue. Yalakun, blue flag, that's Berkeley Gupapangal. And it also, it's, it's also for Daigoruguru. Mm. And you'll notice after Marapaga Mangalili, um, which is Baniala, which is a white over blue flag. No, white, white over blue. Yellow. Oh, sorry, blue over white, not wrong yeah. way around. Um, but at the bottom, you'll notice white, that white, there's a white, white over blue. Oh, white over blue. Because sorry white, about that. White is the one beneath the cloud formation, ah. and the blue part is the sea, the motor. Ma, ma. Yeah. Mm. And the, the the last the last flag you'll notice is actually okay, that's the black and white. The mm. the bit on the north, not far north from where Dolce Manonu is. Mm. The, the, the horizon now is that yeah. my my upper name after yes more area. But this flag is for a group of. Historical visitors. Historical. It's 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 not a Yungle clan. It's a group. It's a foreign group that's been incorporated in the system. Mm -hmm. And you have here 
um, a whole port system that was historically managed on land owned by your clans in a confederation of interrelated and intermarrying, well, rather interrelated um, clan yeah. groups. And we have the same benefit in, in, in Manica category. We have the same benefits, some land. Mm. Mm. We categorize all in the same, particularly Manica items on subjects. So we have a song queued up next. Well, well Marcia, do you want to say Darren, something? Yeah. yeah, Darren, please. Uh, yeah. Michael, uh, so just uh, for practical purposes, for the audience's sake, I think I should point out that the the flags are the emblems of of, of quite a number of things. But uh, as uh, Muri has explained it, clan relationships with the different fleets of prow. Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, the sea craft of, of the Makassaris and, and others. And the flags are also uh, flown on the prow and at the beachheads at these ports, or wanga. Uh, mm. wanga. And the, uh, the flags, or garlic, uh belong not just to the Yunga group, but also to the fleet of prow. So, Macassans were uh, or, or other uh, seafaring folk coming to our, our shores were only allowed to come to these places uh, under these rules. They had to fly mm. the flag uh, of the port where they were welcome and where they uh, had been, you know, uh, given permission, if you like. But I'll leave that to Murray to explain. Oh. Um, but, but flying from the mast of the ship uh, and, and, you know, that, that indicated to everybody that they had permission to land at the port where the flag was flown, belonging to a particular clan. Um, and so, you know, this is a language of flags and symbolism across northeast Arnhem Land and indeed uh, wider, wider than that as well, all the way down to uh, Groot Island and all the way over to Western Australia. Um, so having gone through the uh, flag colours, uh, uh, I noticed Muri was just about to explain that uh, there are song lines um, and, uh, and, of course, other symbols associated with each flag and port. Um, and, and so these, uh, you know, other symbols, you know, might include, for instance, the anchor or the sword, uh, uh, depending on uh, the people involved, the mala or group involved. Um, and so it was definitely a system yeah. um, a across a vast seascape, uh, coastal region. Um, so I'll just leave it there, but just, just to explain that the, this yes. is uh, indeed a system. I was going to uh, include also... Um, each clan or tribe or the colors have also have a um, uh, like a kinship. Mm. Say, for instance, the Dolce, the black flag, if I see black flag uh, and I say, this is my putara, my grand sons, my grandsons and my granddaughters. Now color, I treat them in, 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 a, in a kinship way. Uh, red flag is, I, I call them as a yappa. Yappa or red and blue are we both um, like, um, like we, I should put it, sisters, red and blue, red and blue, sisters. Yep, yep, my Because we, we are Mari, red and blue are Mari, Mari Pulo for black flag and for white flag. 
and for green flag. We are mindful. We are great, great parents of land. That's how we also relate the um, colors and now the flags. You know, mm. indicate that you know. Yeah. So, Maury, the next slide is a embedded song uh, mm. for Richon Dada. This, this is a song that you directed and sung lead for back in 2005. I recorded it. Mm. And if you want to know where we record, we record in places like mm. this uh, back when we both looked a lot, lot younger. Mm. Um, what does it how would you interpret that for people before we Rit hear it, please? You mean Ritjun? Your Ritjun Dara is, means uh, standing attention in, in Balada terms there, eh? standing attention, or Dara, standing formation, and looking to the horizon. Mm. Mm. And it's the, the, the blue flag standing upright as well, Muka? Mm. Yo. 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 Okay. Shall we hear that? Yo. Ma. Yo. Main ma. <coughs> Is that all? Is that all? We're we're running over time actually, so why don't I skip ahead to? Well, I, I was just going to explain your, the songs. Your, your. Your. The song was when you heard, heard the song singing. The, the song is saying that I am standing in a on a shore with my firm foot um, and holding this ancient ground. And I'm looking across the horizon where the skies are white 
and black and where the sea is uh, coming with waves or or just sitting on the, the edge of the edge of the of the of the sea and and also it says I am like I am Birkili and I am Kubapuru and I and my foot is local my foot is called Durandura Hill. I'm standing in firms uh, holding this ground for my forefathers ground you know, and mm. my arms are saying oh, hands open and telling whoever comes in has to come through my arm wing you know you know, mm. you know come and Mark up. You know, Mark up. I'm going to skip ahead to the bit where we can close out. Um, there's still a little more to go. And we had many performances um, with uh, McCasson uh, artists who came to Australia through things like the Gama Festival, but we'll need to skip that for another time. Um, basically, all of this is about enabling trade with these seafarers while also retaining autonomy from them. And um, the specific homeland where Brian is uh, talking about is Lunkwitcher, which is in the top corner of that slide. And wherever um, there are these flag systems in place, there are designated beaches where the boats are allowed to land, the foreign boats are allowed to land, and there are places where they're not. And, um, you know, there were Macassans who were allowed to land on the westward facing coast of Lunkutja on the <coughs> peninsula there, yeah. but they couldn't go to the eastern side of the peninsula or the island. Um, I found and, this on the web. And when they did, um, Maury, what, what happened to boats when they landed uh, at Lunkutja in the wrong place? Well, Monopole, where that, um, where that, um, you can you can clearly see that um, uh, that white now in a, a sandbar. They actually anchored there, you know, there, mm. and that was forbidden. You can't, you can't throw anchor or you can't do fishing around there for such a long time, isn't it? Um, if you throw an anchor, your anchor would caught up by a monopole bapi snake, where, where that would, which in those, back, back in those, um, my dream, uh, my, back in the dream times there, when they try to anchor boat there, um, all of a sudden the boat was the, the anchor was caught up by Mundapur Bapi, and all, the whole boat went sunk under, and everybody was eaten, mm. was swallowed up <coughs> by Mundapur. So Mundo called the water python <laughs> water re rears up out of the sea yeah. as a lightning and thunderstorm mm. and devours the boat because they went to yeah. this place. Yeah. So and they weren't allowed to. Yeah. And on the beach, uh, the Mundo called spat no woman mm. and the one, one of the lady uh, meal woman was dropped into an area, the beach side, the beach, 
and it's really strange. You, you, um, that we usually have, you know, those, uh, those psycho palm tree. They they don't usually grow in the beach. The cycad palm, yeah. Cycad palm, you know, but in that Nunguja beach, the cycad palm, no, grew up from the beach. Mm. You know, it's, mm. it's a mis mystery. Uh, it turned into a Uratila Pumiyak woman, the cycad palm there. Mm. Squirrel there. Mm. Usually, the, it, usually the cycle yeah, they grow in a dry, not a place, not not near the salt or the environment. Mm. Yeah. So it's a really mystery story, you know. Mm. Yeah. You you can't find uh, those cycle palm grow in the beach. They normally grow inland, in, in forests, land. yeah, what? in groves, don't they? Yeah, where there's good soil, yeah. Yo. but in that longer jab, it should shoot up from the beach, from the white beach, shoot mm. up, and there's a no cycle palm tree there. Mm. Yeah. But it, it, you can't get uh, nuts to, to make it in the daily bread to buy them. Because it's uh, ancient now, it's forbidden. You can't eat from that tree. Mm. Because it's Mako mm. uh, it's the spirit of a woman. Mm. How how should we close this Moriga Nandi? Uh, Manika. Uh, you want to. Yeah. So, so the next manake is Gunbilk, and you, you'll notice in this photograph that all the water called Munguru yeah. is calm and glassy. Yeah. And that, that's what this next song is about. And yeah. as we were preparing yesterday, it's also a song that um, mothers sing to their babies yeah. to rock them to sleep. Yeah. And it close, closes the curtain. Mm. Yeah. Did did you want to say anything about this recording before we play it, please, Maury? Yeah, you know, it's uh, I'm singing on the Manite, that song. It's basically uh, when when the when the child goes comes in from all those when it, when the child goes out, yeah, it all does a lot of activity. But when the child goes in there, yeah, that's when we start to complete our journey and uh, that's where that's when we uh, all our babies are cradle and to the rest from all those work cradle so that they sleep calmly like the water Kunbil Maraoro Moro. Now the Moro had completed his uh, journey and all his activities and now he's coming in shore and now he's resting and when the sea starts to get real glassy and you can see the reflect uh, of the cloud formation in far distance you can see the, the reflect from from a, if you see uh, something like uh, from island, other side island, you can see the images from mm. the, the glass. And it's, Reflected in the water. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and after my, I sing, then my sister will uh, um, conclude that finalize with by like morning, you know, morning, uh, crying and sing, singing the same 
Um, so what I have, what I what I, what I was singing, and she used used that word step in in a different form of uh, mourning. But it's it's a really emotional thing for crying, going you know? Scouts like this. <clears throat> Oh, <laughs> 
I think Joe would have liked that. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Ma, yo, Kato. Yo. Yo. Okay. Uh, that was amazing. Thanks, all of you, for, for sharing that and sharing the, the stories that you have, Brian. Uh, you know, what I took out of it, a whole lot of things. Um, one of the things that resonated with me or really shook my head was, you know, over your, the Yongu area, there was such diversity, sophistication, complexity. And I wonder, uh, well, not wonder, I, I would assume that, that all, if not uh, large parts of the rest of Australia had the same kind of complexity and diversity across the landscapes. And the other thing that really struck me, and <clears throat> if we had more time to unpack it, it, would be great to understand, was the deep connections you have with Macassans and, and neighbours and how um, modern borders and, and other uh, restrictions uh, limit some relationships that really need to be nourished and, and uh, developed and continued. Um, but uh, as I said, we're, we're 10 minutes over time, so we probably should wind up. So thank you very, very much. Um, I'll hand over now briefly um, to Aaron, Professor Aaron Korn, who I uh, neglected to run through his bio. I know I gave him a bit of a bio before, but he's going to sum, sum up and talk about some exciting opportunities that uh, the Indigenous Knowledge Institute have. Um, in the, in the offering at the moment and shortly to be released. But Aaron holds a background um, in music and collections and has collaborated closely, as you can see, very, very close and deep relationship with um, Indigenous communities and colleagues in, in dis, interdisciplinary initiatives since the 1990s. He's currently the inaugural, inaugural director of the Indigenous Knowledge Institute here at the University of Melbourne and serves as a director of the National Recording Project for Indigenous Performance Australia. His research engages with the durability of Indigenous knowledge and new strategies for strengthening human cultural diversity in the digital age. Um, I welcome Aaron to, to give some closing remarks and, and some thank yous uh, before I sign off and say goodbye. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Look, I'm mainly here to thank people and I'm going to speed read what I prepared because um, we're over time. But look, it's with deep gratitude that I thank everybody who's joined us today. Um, I think our presenters have been wonderfully generous and I feel we've been very fortunate for the expertise and wisdom that they've all shared. Uh, the idea to mark this important international day originated with Associate Professor Michael Sean Fletcher, Deputy Director of Research Capability, sorry, Director of Research Capability at the IKI. And so thanks, Michael, for that idea and for chairing today so brilliantly. Um, the other colleague behind the scenes who's been intrinsic to today's success is the IKI's rather brilliant project officer, Brittany Kartner. She has uh, tirelessly programmed and reprogrammed this event several times over as Melbourne went in and out of various stages of lockdown. And Brittany, thank you very much. We seriously could not have done any of this without you. Uh, I also thank IKI's manager, Kirsten Clark, and my research associate, Dr. Anthea Skinner, for their invaluable guidance and support through the process of planning this event. I feel deeply grateful for the depth and breadth of insights and expertise that have been shared here today, and also for the vision of the University of Melbourne in supporting the Indigenous Knowledge Institute to make this important exchange of ideas and approaches possible. Uh, in my immediate experience, this kind of support is unparalleled. And if you're internal to the University of Melbourne, you may know that we presently have seed funding round open for application. And also very soon we'll be launching a research team network round as well. 
So hopefully you'll see that on our comms. I also think executive leaders of this university, uh, some of whom have joined us today uh, for the investment in the IKI, including our distinguished associate provost, um, Professor Marcia Langton. We have really great university partners at Melbourne Connect, which sponsored our planned venue on their new superfloor, had we been able to go in person. And we look forward to getting there as soon as we possibly can. And finally, um, thank you to our wonderful industry partners at Ostage Events, who's done the um, tech production for this, Emma and Gabriel from Echo Interpreting, and also Joseph at the Mooka Project, where um, Brian was speaking from for contributing so much to today's success. Uh, I should say that all the songs that Brian and I have recorded with um, family up in Arnhem Land are uh, held and archived in the Mooka Project for, for family, and um, they're about... 20,000 digital files there and counting of the work that we've been undertaking over the past uh, two decades or so. I look forward to all of us being able to meet again, bigger, better, and in person this day next year. I pay respect to the old people wherever we are or wherever we are from, and I wish you all the very best to come. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. And yeah, I like you. Thank Echo. Thank you to all the people who presented. Thank you for all the people who hung around and joined through the day and participated and provided questions and all of those um, contributions. The couple of main things, and Echo, Aaron, that really came out of it for me was the diversity, which we already knew about of Indigenous knowledge, but also the the depth of what we're doing at this institution. It wasn't an intended thing to have such a heavily University of Melbourne focused uh, symposium. Next year, when we are fingers crossed out of the current situation we are and borders are more uh, liberated, we will hope to expand the network, the networks that we have, the networks that we will make to have a, a broader cast. But I think what it really has served to the purpose of highlighting the amazing things that we're doing in this university, from law to arts to science to education, all of these areas that the University of Melbourne has committed to in a very serious way. And I'm really proud to actually be a part of this institution and, and the work that it's doing. So thank you all so very much. Um, and we'll see you in the interim for various events, but hopefully, definitely for the uh, the next um, symposium that we have on this very special day. Thank you very, very much.